New Hire by Dave Dreyfus. This is a LibriVox recording. Now all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Harvey. New Hire by Dave Dreyfus. Very admirable rule. Never do tomorrow what you can put off until after the age of 40. One thing about an electronic awakener. No matter how elaborate its hookup, melodious its music, and important its announced reminders, when it goes on in the morning, you can always turn it off again. Boswell W. Budge always did exactly that. But there's no turning off one's kids. And thus, on the most important morning of his life, February 30th, 2054, Bozzy arose, much against his will, promptly at 0800. His Sophie, eight and ladylike, merely shook the bed with a disdainful gesture. But Howard, six, masculine and athletic, climbed right up and sat on Bozzy's stomach. Baby Ralph, of the golden smile, gave Bozzy a big kiss. And Bozzy thus shared the gold, which was egg. Did your mother send you in here? Bozzy demanded, gazing suspiciously around with one eye open. We came because we love you, Sophie answered. That opened Bozzy's other eye. Thank you, dear, he said. You're very sweet or very clever. Now if you'll coax Howard off my stomach. I don't have to be coaxed. Howard announced, sliding to the floor with all the covers. From now on, you just order me, Daddy, because you'll be a senior citizen tomorrow. Bozzy didn't want to think of that just then. Tell your mother I'm up, he said, and get out so I can bathe and dress. Sophie minced. Howard ran. Ralph toddled. Bozzy rose, a pudgy man, slightly under average height, at six feet two, with blue eyes and thinning brown hair. He was exactly 39 years, 11 months, and 29 days old. And that was the point. At 40, he would have to go to work. This was his day for job taking. He dreaded it. He put the coming ceremonies out of his mind and concentrated on his supersonic bath, the depilatory cream, the color of his outer clothing, it took time to achieve the right shade of purple in the bathroom plastic dispenser, but no time at all to pour, solidify, and cut the sheet-like robe required for the occasion. In it, he was the sensation of the breakfast room, handsome as a male bird in spring plumage. Kate, his slender wife, who had been up and at work for an hour, looked moth-eaten by comparison as if their nest had been lined with her plucked-out down. "'You look very attractive this morning, Kate,' Bozzy told her. He gave her an extra warm kiss. "'Well,' she said, "'quite the gallant today, aren't we? "'Just be sure you're on time today, darling. "'Remember what Mr. Froon had to say about promptness.' "'Froon, that overinflated windbag, the obesity,' who was about to become his boss. Without having worked a day in his life, Bozzy found he hated the idea of having a boss. Let's think of something pleasant, he grunted and thought of breakfast. He took his place at the table. Kate and the kids had already eaten, so Kate served while the kids, attracted by his finery, stood off and watched him swallow a vitamin pill, a thyroid pill, and a dexedrine pill. Solemnly, he opened the three eggs Kate brought. Each was guaranteed by her to have been irradiated for exactly two minutes and 55 seconds, and guaranteed by the grocer to have been enriched by feeding the hens three kinds of mold. His mouth was full of the third and last one when Sophie asked, Why do you have to go to work, Daddy? The reminder choked him, gulping, he said, To support us all, honey. My pension stops tomorrow. Yes, but I read in a book where people used to go to work when they were young. He was tempted to say, I am young, but thought better of it. That was long ago, dear. Were people different then? 
No, but society was. Our senior citizens used to be pensioned off while younger people worked. But when science improved the seniors' health, they got tired of sitting in corners on pensions. And besides, a lot of them died soon after they stopped working. When it got so that more than half of all voters were between 40 and 70 years old, the seniors voted their pensions to the young to get educated and raise families on, and nobody's allowed to work till he's 40. Now do you see? 40 is awful old, said Sophie. Howard had meanwhile taken his mother's hand. You're not going to work, are you, Mommy? he asked. Not for 10 years, dear. I'll be here when you want me, so why don't you go play on the balcony? I've got to get Daddy off and give Ralph his bath. I'll bathe him, Sophie volunteered. You help Howie. We can make like we were young. Don't drop him, Kate warned. Clean up the bathroom afterward, added Bozzy. Yes, sir, said Howard, for the first time in his life. The children left, and Kate came close to poor... Bozzy his cup of day start. He slipped an arm around her waist and squeezed convulsively. Darling, she said, stroking his bald spot, you're positively trembling. Wouldn't you be if you had to take over from somebody you like as well as I like Mr. Kojak? And for no good reason, except he's 75 and I'll soon be 40. Kate pushed away from him, frowning. Sometimes you're so silly, it scares me. You know perfectly well that if you don't take Mr. Kojak's job, someone else will. He'd rather have it in your hands than in a stranger's, and I'd rather live on his income than on a laborer's. So stop moping and drink your day start while I call a cab. No help in that quarter, Bozzy decided as she left. All Kate could think of was that she'd soon be the wife of a big shot, the manager, that is, control setter, of a furniture factory. Bozzy had never told her how simple the job really was, though he suppose she knew. You first ordered designs, and then you ordered a poll taken on the designs. A computer tabulated the poll's results and pointed out the design most likely to sell. You then fed economic data into the same computer, and found out how many units the market could take. You called in the engineers to set up the machines and the maintenance men to keep them running. In brief, you were errand boy to a bunch of gadgets with nothing to do but look important. He was practicing his important look when Kate bustled in and spoiled it by sitting on his lap. You're going to do fine today, she said, and you're going to get off to a good start. I made them show me your cab. It's one of their brand new battery electric ones, a sort of mauve that will go with your purple robe. You look swell in it. Bozzy was kissing her when the lobby buzzer sounded three long rings. There's your cab, Kate said, rising. He followed her to the living room. Projected on one wall was a picture of the cabman facing the lobby annunciator, 53 stories down. The man was tall fat and in need of a shave, yet he wore purple tights with pink and green trim. Bozzy shuddered. Who in the world concocted that rig? Your wife, sir, the cabman answered. It's beautiful, said Bozzy. I'll be right down. He wasn't, though. Kate told the kids he was leaving, and they trooped out of the bathroom to say goodbye. Bozzy could tell Ralph it was the one being bathed only because he was naked. All three were equally wet and equally anxious to embrace their daddy. He had to make himself a new robe while the cab meter ticked and Kate jittered. But once started, the drive between balconied buildings and intervening plazas went fast enough. Bozzy wasn't over half an hour late in reaching Mr. Kojak's apartment building. The old man waited in the street, looking spare, spruce, and impatient. I do wish, he said, easing himself into the cab, that you had a less antisocial attitude. Now you'll have to claim I delayed you. I'm sorry, sir, Bozzy mumbled. It's kind of you to take the blame. He thought it was also typical. He had understudied Mr. Kojak for the preceding two years, 
and felt there was no one else in the world for whom he could have as much respect. Actually, sir, he explained, I was delayed by the children. An excuse, Boswell. Whether conscious or subconscious, nothing more than an excuse. Distaste for today's ceremonial is smeared over your face like so much bread and jelly. Unconsciously, Bozzy wiped his cheeks. Mr. Kojak laughed. You're guilt-ridden, and that's plain absurd. All young men in your position have to go through exactly the same thing. You must simply make up your mind to do what society requires. All I can think of is your kindness, Bozzy blurted. People should replace those they hate. But the understudy system wouldn't work then, Mr. Kojak pointed out. You can't learn from a man who upsets you. Bozzy nodded miserably. In silence, he let himself be carried toward the furniture factory, till Mr. Kojak asked, Did you bring the stimulants? Oh, yes, sir. Excuse me, I should have offered them sooner. With embarrassed clumsiness, he fished from a pocket in his underwear the pills required by custom. Here you are, sir, he said in ritual form. Big pills make troubles little. Mr. Kojak smiled. I don't need any, he said gently. You do. Take one. That isn't proper. No one will know. Go ahead. He would feel like a fool to take a pill brought only for Mr. Kojak's use. He would feel much more like a fool if he broke down during the ceremony. He might even lose his job. He took the pill, finally, and immediately felt sorry. He was still tense and twitchy when they reached the factory. As custom demanded, everyone was out of sight. Nobody met them at the gate or observed their silent progress up the escalator to the personnel office. Noiselessly, through empty soundproof offices, they walked together to the ceremonial chamber. The door they used was the room's only entrance. It was hooked open invitingly. Within was a small conference table of imitation oak and six chairs of imitation leather. Ceiling, walls, and floor were plastic sheets in soft, sandy shades that harmonized with the furniture's rich browns. On the table were four wristlets, four anklets, and two belts, all made of iron links and stamped with either Bozzy's or Mr. Kojak's name. As he had been told to do, Bozzy picked out and put on his own set, while Mr. Kojak rested in the armchair at the head of the table. Then, breathing noisily, he knelt before Mr. Kojak and fastened the old man's anklets. He rose, grunting. Mr. Kojak held out first the left hand, then the right, while Bozzy put the wristlets on him. Their cheeks accidentally touched while Bozzy fastened the belt. He thought of his father and was irrationally tempted to plant a kiss as if he were four instead of forty. He stifled the impulse and shook hands instead. Good luck, Mr. Kojak said. The procedure did not call for that remark, and so for a second, Bozzy forgot what came next. Then, helped by the stimulant pill, he focused his thoughts, crossed the room, and turned a lighted red switch that glowed by the door. He heard a muffled clank as iron links froze to the magnetized armchair, sounding the signal for his speech. Sir, he intoned, the company takes this opportunity to express its deep and heartfelt appreciation of the 35 years you have devoted to serving the company, the furniture industry generally, and that great public, our customers. Without looking at Mr. Kojak, he bowed, turned, went out, and released the catch holding the door open. It closed automatically and automatically set in motion the rest of the ceremony. From somewhere out of sight, fat Mr. Froon waddled over and briefly shook Bozzy's hand. You've done fine, he wheezed. A little late getting started, but that's to be expected. Everything's fine, just fine. Praise seemed to miscue. Bozzy didn't quite know how to answer. Sir, he asked, mopping his forehead. What about Mr. Kojak? Oh, he's all right, Mr. Froon said. Those fumes are fast. We can leave the rest to the undertaker. 
He slapped Bozzy on the back and pushed him down the corridor. Come on into my office, boy. I'll pour you a drink. Pour us each one, as a matter of fact, and hand over your iron jewelry, son. You won't need that stuff again for 35 years. End of New Hire by Dave Dreyfus. Recording by Paul Harvey. The Telepathic Pickup by Samuel M. Sargent, Jr. From Amazing Stories, December 1925. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. The Telepathic Pickup by Samuel M. Sargent, Jr. There was a strange light in Dr. Spaulding's eyes. His face was immobile, but the lines were set in an expression of jubilance and triumph. Come on, Bryant, he said quietly. I have something interesting to show you. With that remark he wheeled, and strode into the gloom of the hall. I followed, and our footsteps echoed with the hollowness in that spacious, blank space. I had always felt a certain timidity when with Dr. Spaulding. We had been friends for years, and yet strangers. He was a personality which had seemingly been fashioned for dominance over me. I had never been able, in our long acquaintance, to raise my head squarely and hold the gaze of his eyes. My font of conversation dried up beneath the queer influence of him, and I was reserved and stumbling in my speech. I admired, with no malice, his genius, his eccentric and versatile genius that had placed him at the head of his profession, had made him the eminent scientist, had allowed him to conquer the field of electricity. He had performed during his career many marvelous feats of surgery, had made important advances in both astronomy and chemistry, and had given countless electric inventions to the world. Of late years, he had devoted himself entirely to electrical research. I had seen him but once in the last year and a half. At that meeting, he had hinted to me that he was working on a radio apparatus that would startle the world. It won't be called radio, though, Brant, he had told me with a dry, rasping chuckle. It shall have another name. When it is finished, I shall explain it all first to you. So, when I received his phone call, I concluded that he had completed the invention, and I was burning with curiosity as I followed him down the hall. He turned into the living room. That chamber was no darker, no emptier, and no more gloomy than any other room in his house, but I loathed it even more than the other. For always, as I entered, I was brought face to face with the portrait of the doctor's brother and the tragedy was forcibly recalled to me. It had been many years ago, but time had not dulled it in my friend's mind, nor my own. I could well remember that night, and Tom Spaulding's flight, a jump ahead of the law, because he was wanted for embezzlement of fifty thousand dollars. The disgrace of it had crushed the doctor, and because it was his beloved brother, the blow was even greater. It had aged and changed him, and sent him into the life of a recluse. That it was responsible for his many invaluable discoveries was probable, but not any less regrettable, at least to me. As for Tom Spaulding, we had not heard of him since that night, but perhaps that was just as well, for we learned later that he had sunk to the lowest level of the underworld. I gave the picture as fleeting a glance as possible, but the doctor stood for a long while gazing up at it. He seemed lost in reverie. At last he recovered himself with a start, motioned me to a chair, and turned to a huge mahogany table. He bent over a large box-like cabinet of dark wood, like, and yet unlike, the ordinary radio set. He tinkered for a few minutes with the knobs and dials. Then he faced me again. This is the invention, he said. 
Remember the last time I saw you I told you I was working on a super radio? This is it, a telepathic radio. I have succeeded in trapping those elusive emanations, thought waves. I won't bore you with any explanation of the inner workings of the machine. It is enough that I went to the radio and the seismograph to produce it. I called you so that I could give you a demonstration, as I promised. You are the first person to whom I have shown it. Of course, I have given it a number of tests. It seems to be a success. His eyes had lighted with ardor, and his voice had risen to an unusual pitch. But almost simultaneously, this enthusiasm waned, and his face became very grave. You know, Brant, he said slowly, I have never given up hope of finding Tom. I believe he is still living. I am sure of it. I want to find him. That was the incentive for this invention. I can locate him with this apparatus. That is what I am going to try to do tonight. If he lives, his mind will speak through the loudspeaker. You understand the radio. Well, this machine is similar. It must be tuned into the thought wave length of the man you wish to reach. But the machine must broadcast to receive. That is, the tuning consists of the broadcasting of a key thought. If you are seeking a murderer, you would broadcast some thought concerning the crime. Whereupon the receiving section of the machine would draw in every unspoken reflection on it, and convert each into words. If your key thought were something known to many, perhaps published in the papers, the machine would utter a jumble of tones and voices, blurred by one another. It would be a babble, so many thoughts each from a different head. But then the operator would continue his broadcasting, thinking into the machine, with those pseudo-receiving phones, varying reflections on the crime, gradually leading to some clue, some phrase known only to the police and the criminal. A million voices would instantly dwindle to a dozen or so, whereupon it would be easy to vary the wavelength a millionth part of a hair's breadth and so bring in the felon's thoughts, alone and clear. You may see, then, that I have a very dangerous contraption here, the more so since the mind is unaware that it is being trapped. I could accomplish great evil, or great good, with it. But, as I said before, I made it only that I might find Tom, and now I shall make the attempt. There is a key thought that only he can respond to an incident of our boyhood known, I believe, only to us. He seated himself at the apparatus and adjusted the headphones. He became intense, lapsing into a deep study. I sat silent, tense with curiosity and awe. There was a long stillness broken only by the ticking of the hall clock. The methodical sound of its mechanism so frayed my nerves that I got up, and stopped it. Then I tiptoed back to my seat. Dr. Spaulding had not noticed my move. Presently, with an abruptness that made me start, the loudspeaker began to utter sounds. The doctor removed his headpiece, and we leaned forward tautly. The sounds were unintelligible at first. Then they became clear. It's Tom! murmured the doctor, as he recognized the voice, and he looked happy for the first time in years. Dawn is coming, said the machine. The first hint of light. Oh, God! There came a confusion of sounds, a jumble of incoherent words. Then clearly, Here they come. I see the guards and the priest. Oh, God, they are coming, they are coming! They walk so slowly, so solemnly, the guards and the priest. He is in his robes. I see his crucifix. It is swaying on its chain as he walks. The heels are beating so regularly, so perfectly in time. Oh, God! The guards, they look grim, grim as the law. Law! It is the law! There is no escape. Can I beat them down? The window, the door, 
A gun? Rush them when they open the door? They'll kill me. Kill me. The chair. The doctor's face had gone white and drawn. He seemed turned to stone. His fingers were tight. The machine went on with its monotonous monotone. A rat is watching. Its eyes are bright. It is a gray rat. How long its nose is, long and sharp. It is laughing. There, the keys are turning. How slowly it grits. The bolt is drawn. The door is opening, and it is opening slowly, so slowly. How gray everything is. How strange they look. The chair. There is no chance. Is there a chance? A chance? They are in... in a group. The guards have many buttons. One, two, three. The priest, how deep set his eyes are. His face is very grave. He is talking. The rat is watching. Its eyes are bright, so bright. God save me. The sounds became incoherent and jangled. The doctor had not moved. The voice became audible again. Now! Walk, walk, walk. Click, click, click. Guards so grim. I'll run. Useless. There's so much steel. Steel everywhere. I'm caught. I'm caught in the steel. The chair. Death. What will it be? Will it hurt? I must be quiet. I must not tremble. I must be brave. Walk, walk, walk. Now the little door. We're going through. The chamber. How gray it is. Who are these men? There is a crowd. They are grim and sober. Some are white and trembling. I am trembling. I must be brave. I must smile. But I am going to die. How silent it is. Oh, God! They are strapping me into the chair. I am putty. They are strapping me in. It is cold, so cold. I must be brave. I must smile and joke. But I am going to die. How still it is. They have strapped me in. He has his hands on a lever. He is waiting to kill me. The current is going to be shot. God save me. It is cold. It is so dim. His hand is moving the lever. Oh, Christ, Christ, I am bruised. I am burning. I am burning up. Oh, God. Now I am numb. My flesh is sizzling and burning. I can feel it. I am writhing in the chair. But it doesn't hurt now. I can't move. My muscles won't move. I can't close my eyes. My mouth is dropped open. My jaw won't move. Am I paralyzed? Am... am I... dead? Dead? No, everything is the same. I can't be dead. The doctor is examining me. He says, I pronounce this man dead. There was a pause. The doctor had not moved a muscle. His face was the hue of the grave. His eyes were indiscernible, frozen. He had not seized the significance of the last words, apparently, but I had. In spite of the horror I was sunk in, I realized that a theory of Dr. Spaulding's had been proven. It was fully ten years since the doctor had aroused much interest with his attack on the use of the electric chair. It was his theory that in no case did electricity actually kill, that it merely brought on paresis that simulated death striking dormant the entire organism. He had cited instances of men struck by lightning who had recovered after many days of total paralysis during which they retained only sight, hearing, and consciousness. Strange it was, and hideous, that tonight the doctor's own brother was proving the theory. The machine spoke again. The fool! He says I'm dead! The fool! I wish I could talk! I could call him a fool. I would laugh at him. But I can't move. The men are leaving. The guards are unstrapping me. They catch me as I fall. 
They are taking me out through the little door. They are taking me down the long hall. I would like to shout at them. They think I am dead. The numbness has gone. I can feel their hands holding me. I can feel more intensely than before. They are carrying me into a room. What are they going to do? My God, are they going to bury me? No, it is the prison hospital. They are going to bring me to life. Thank the good God. They lay me on a table, the guards. But are they guards? They act differently. Never mind. Ah, the surgeon is preparing to bring me to life. He is getting some instruments. He has a chisel or a saw or something in his hands. He is leaning above. Oh, Christ! Oh, bleeding Christ! He is cutting my head! There sounded a wild scream. Dr. Spaulding leapt upon the machine, gibbering incoherently, and smashed the mechanism into a thousand pieces. The End of The Telepathic Pickup by Samuel M. Sargent, Jr. Say Hello for Me by Frank W. Coggins This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gabriel McDermott Say Hello for Me by Frank W. Coggins this was to be the day, but of course Professor Pettibone had no way of knowing it. He arose, as he had been doing for the previous twenty years, donned the tattered remnants of his spacesuit, and went out into the open. He stood erect, bronzed, magnificent, faced distant earth, and recited. Good morning, bright sunshine. We're glad you are here. You make the world happy and bring us good cheer. It was something he had heard as a child, and isolated here on Mars, he had remembered it and used it to keep from losing his power of speech. The ritual finished, he walked to the edge of the nearest canal and gathered a bushel or so of dried Martian moss. He returned and began polishing the shiny exterior of the wrecked spaceship. It had to really glitter if it was to be an effective beacon in guiding the rescue ship. Professor Pettibone knew, had known for years, that a ship would come. It was just a matter of time, and as the years slipped by, his faith diminished not a whit. With his task half completed, he glanced up at the sun and quickened the polishing. It was a long walk to the place the berry bushes grew, and if he arrived too late, the sun would have dried out the night's crop of fragile berries, and he would have to wait until the morrow for nourishment. But on this day, he was fated to arrive at the bush area, not at all, because an alien sound from above again drew the professor's eyes from his work, and he knew that the day had arrived. The ship was three times as large as any he had ever visualized, and its futuristic design told him sharply how far he had fallen behind in his dreaming. He smiled and said quite calmly, I dare say I am about to be rescued. And he experienced a thrill as the great ship set down and two men emerged therefrom, a thrill tinged with guilt sense because emotional experiences were rare in an isolated life and somehow indecent. The two men held weapons, they advanced upon Professor Pettibone, looked up into his face, reflected a certain wary hostility. That the hostility was tinged with instinctive respect, even awe, made it no less potent. 
one of them asked, Fella, man came in ship, sky boat, long time ago. Him dead? Where? Appropriate gestures accompanied the words. Professor Pettibone smiled down at the little men and bowed. You, you are, of course, uh, referring to me. I, I came in the ship. I am Professor Pettibone. It was nice of you to hunt me up. The eyes of the two Terran spacemen met and locked in startled inquiry. One of them voiced the reaction of both when he said, What the hell? You are in no doubt, are curious as to the fate of the other members of the expedition. They were killed, all save Fletcher, who lasted a week. Professor Pettibone waved a hand there in the graveyard. But their eyes remained on the only survivor of that ill-fated first expedition. It was hard to accept him as the man they sought, but faced with undeniable similarity between what they expected and what they had found, the two spacemen had no alternative. I hope your food supply is ample and varied, Professor Pettibone said. This seemed to bring them out of their bemusement. Of of course, Professor. Would you care to come aboard? The other made a try at congenial levity. You must be pretty hungry after twenty years. Really? Has it been that long? I I tried to keep track at first. We can blast off any time you say. You're probably pretty anxious to get back. Indeed I am. The changes in twenty years must be breathtaking. I wonder if they'll remember me. A short time later, the professor said, It's amazing, a ship of this size, handled by only two men. Then he sat down to a repast laid out by one of the awed spacemen. But after nibbling a bit of this and a forkful of that, he found that satisfaction lay in the anticipation more so than in the eating. We'll look around and see what we can find in the way of clothing for you, Professor, one of the spacemen said. Then the man's bemusement returned. His eyes travelled over the magnificent physique before him, the perfect giant of a man the great Apollo-like head with the calm, clear eyes, the expression of complete contentment and serenity. The spaceman said, Professor, to what do you attribute the changes in your body? What is there about this planet? I really don't know. Professor Pettibone looked down at his torso with an impersonal eye. I think the greenish skin pigmentation is is a result of mineral heavy vapours that occur during certain seasons. The growth as to my body, I really don't know. But the two spacemen, though they didn't refer to it, were not concerned with the body so much as the aura of completeness the radiation of contentment which came from somewhere within. And it was passing strange that nothing more was said about the professor returning to earth. No great revelation suddenly arrived at that he would not go. Rather, they discussed various things that three gentlemen meeting casually would discuss. Then Professor Pettibone rose from his chair and said, It was kind of you to drop off and see me. And one of the spacemen replied, A pleasure, sir, a real pleasure indeed. Then the professor left the ship and watched it lift up by the tail of red fire and go away. He raised an arm and waved. Say hello for me, he called. Then he turned away, and from force of habit he began again to polish the hull 
knowing that he would keep it shining and be proud of it for many years to come. Almost beyond reach of the planet, one of the spacemen flipped the switch and put certain sensitive communication mechanisms to work. So sensitive they could pick up etheric vibrations far away and make them audible. But only faintly came the pleasant voice of a contented man. Good morning, bright sunshine. We are glad you are here. You make the world. The end. That was the end of Say Hello For Me by Frank W. Coggins. Recording by Gabriel McDermott. The Old Goat by Charles L. Fontenay This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman It's been said that the soul is the form that makes the body, which may just possibly explain what happened on that fatal day at Ivy College. THE OLD GOAT by Charles L. Fontenay Dr. Angstrom was known to his students and many of his colleagues on the faculty as the Old Goat. Very appropriate, that name. He had the disposition of a goat with dyspepsia. He had the cold blue eyes of a goat. He had the waggling whiskers of a goat. Perhaps it's in memory of Dr. Angstrom that Ivy College has a goat for its mascot now. Dr. Angstrom was even more goatish than usual that day last summer when half a dozen top scientists in the field gathered to see his preview experiment on matter transmission of a live animal. He had been working hard for weeks on the transmitter and keeping up classes at the same time, which did not improve his disposition. Besides, he had a real goat for an experimental animal, and goats are notoriously hard on the nervous system. This particular animal, at the moment the scientist entered, was straining at his rope, trying to get a mouthful of a tablecloth, which graced a nearby table full of jars and retorts. Failing this, the goat exhibited that typical lack of discrimination in matters edible, and began to chew on his rope. I felt a little out of place among all these giant brains. My reason for being there was that I had been serving during my college career as a sort of factotum and fetch and carry man for Dr. Angstrom, and I was taking notes for him. I had acquired considerable affection for the old goat. Maybe that's the reason I hate to see his great scientific work kept under wraps, because people still insist it's dangerous. I have proved to my own satisfaction that the matter transmitter works, Dr. Angstrom told the assembled scientists. I have made a number of transmissions of inanimate matter. In theory, it should work just as well for animate objects, and I have invited you to be present at the first test of this theory. I need not go into detail with you about the basic theory of matter transmission. The transmitter itself picks up the atomic and electronic image of the object inside it, much as a television scanner picks up a scene, except that it is done in three dimensions instead of two. This is made possible by the four-dimensional element, which is the heart of the apparatus, and was made available to us through recent interatomic research. The receiver picks up the image as a television receiver does, except again in three dimensions. The matter is not duplicated because the transmitter strips down the object within it as it transmits. Now the question that has been raised by some scientists about the transmission of animate objects is whether the soul or life force can be transmitted. 
I consider this question ridiculous, and will prove it so. It is my contention that such life force is not a thing apart from the physical shell. The matter transmitter was a large closed cylinder on one side of the room. The receiver was a similar cylinder on the other. Both were raised slightly from the floor. As sort of hors d'oeuvres, Dr. Angstrom transmitted a large chunk of lead across the room, then a glass jar. In each case, the object was placed in the transmitter, and a moment later removed from the receiver across the room. There was no possible way for it to have been moved across the intervening space, except by broadcast transmission. As you see, said Dr. Angstrom, I have eliminated the necessity for a switch by building the switch into the door of the transmitter. As soon as the door is closed, transmission occurs. Now we shall send our animate object. He untied the goat and, with some difficulty, hauled the animal by its collar to the transmitter. There the goat balked, and Dr. Angstrom, having got its head through the door, got behind it and shoved heartily, hanging on to the edge of the door so that he could shut it quickly when the goat was inside. As goats will, the goat suddenly changed its mind and leapt into the transmitter. Caught off balance, Dr. Angstrom fell in after it, and the door, given a fast, frantic jerk, slammed on them both. There were gasps of horror and alarm from the scientists, but I held up my hand to calm them. "'There's no danger, gentlemen,' I said. "'It's just as well this way. I happen to know that Dr. Angstrom's next step, after proving to you with the goat that animate objects could be transmitted, was to prove that human beings also could be transmitted. He planned to be his own first subject. With serene confidence, I went to the receiver and threw open the door. Just as I had anticipated, the goat leapt out, unharmed, followed by Dr. Angstrom. I told you animated objects would be transmitted successfully, said the goat triumphantly. Bah! said Dr. Angstrom, and began eating the tablecloth. The End of The Old Goat by Charles L. Fontenay Star Bright by Mark Clifton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barry Howarth Star Bright by Mark Clifton There is no past or future, the children said. It all just is. They had every reason to know. Friday, June 11th at three years of age, a little girl shouldn't have enough functioning intelligence to cut out and paste together a Mobius strip. Or, if she did it by accident, she surely shouldn't have enough reasoning ability to pick up one of her crayons and carefully trace the continuous line to prove it only had one surface. And if by some strange coincidence she did, and it was still just an accident, how can I account for this generally active daughter of mine, and I do mean active, sitting for a solid half hour with her chin cupped in her hand, staring off into space, thinking with such concentration that it was almost painful to watch? I was in my reading chair, going over some work. Star was sitting on the floor, in the circle of my light, with her blunt-nosed scissors and her scraps of paper. Her long silence made me glance down at her as she was taping the two ends of the paper together. At that point I thought it was an accident that she had given a half-twist to the paper strip before joining the circle. I smiled to myself as she picked it up in her chubby fingers. A little child forms the enigma of the ages, I mused. But instead of throwing the strip aside or tearing it apart as any other child would do, she carefully turned it over and around, 
studying it from all sides. Then she picked up one of her crayons and began tracing the line. She did it as though she were substantiating a conclusion already reached. It was a bitter confirmation for me. I had been refusing to face it for a long time, but I could ignore it no longer. Star was a high IQ. For half an hour I watched her while she sat on the floor, one knee bent under her, her chin in her hand, unmoving. Her eyes were wide with wonderment, looking into the potentialities of the phenomenon she had found. It had been a tough struggle, taking care of her since my wife's death. Now this added problem. If only she could have been normally dull like other children. I made up my mind while I watched her. If a child is afflicted, then, let's face it, she's afflicted. A parent must teach her to compensate. At least she could be prepared for the bitterness I'd known. She could learn early to take it in stride. I could use the measurements available, get the degree of intelligence, and in that way grasp the extent of my problem. A 20-point jump in IQ creates an entirely different set of problems. The 140 child lives in a world nothing at all like that of the 100 child, and a world which the 120 child can but vaguely sense. The problems which vex and challenge the 160 pass over the 140 as a bird flies over a field mouse. I must not make the same mistake of posing the problems of one if she is the other. I must know. In the meantime, I must treat it casually. That's called the Mobius Strip, Star, I interrupted her thoughts. She came out of her reverie with a start. I didn't like the quick way her eyes sought mine, almost furtively, as though she had been caught doing something bad. Somebody already make it? she disappointingly asked. She knew what she had discovered. Something inside me spilled over with grief, and something else caught at me with dread. I kept my voice casual. A man by the name of Mobius, a long time ago. I'll tell you about him sometime when you're older. Now, while I'm little, she commanded with a frown, and don't tell me, read me. What did she mean by that? Oh, she must be simply paraphrasing me at those times in the past when I'd wanted the facts and not garbled generalizations. It could only be that. Okay, young lady. I lifted an eyebrow and glared at her in mock ferociousness, which usually sent her into gales of laughter. I'll slow you down. She remained completely sober. I turned to the subject in a physics book. It's not in simple language by any means, and I read it as rapidly as I could speak. My thought was to make her admit she didn't understand it, so I could translate it into basic language. Her reaction? You read too slow, Daddy she complained. She was childishly irritable about it. You say a word, then I think a long time, then you say another word. I knew what she meant. I remember when I was a child, my thoughts used to dart in and out among the slowly droning words of any adult. Whole patterns of universes would appear and disappear in those brief moments. So? I asked. So? she mocked me impishly. You teach me to read, then I can think quick as I want. Quickly, I corrected in a weak voice. The word is quickly, an adverb. She looked at me impatiently, as if she saw through this allegedly adult device to show up a younger's ignorance. I felt like the dope. September 1st. A great deal has happened the past few months. I have tried, a number of times, to bring the conversation around to discuss Star's affliction with her. But she is amazingly adroit at heading me off, as though she already knows what I'm trying to say and isn't concerned. Perhaps, in spite of her brilliance, she is too young to realise the hostility of the world towards intelligence. Some of the visiting neighbours have been amused to see her sit on the floor with an encyclopaedia as big as she is, rapidly turning the pages. Only Star and I know she is reading the pages as rapidly as she can turn them. I've brushed away the neighbour's comments with, She likes to look at the pictures. They talk to her in baby talk. And she answers in baby talk. 
How does she know enough to do that? I have spent the month taking an exhaustive record of her IQ measurements, aptitude speeds, reaction, tables, all the recommended paraphernalia for measuring something we know nothing about. The tables are screwy, or star is beyond all measurement. All right, Peter Holmes, how are you going to pose those problems and combat them for her when you have no conception of what they might be? But I must have a conception. I've got to be able to comprehend at least a little of what she may face. I couldn't simply stand by and do nothing. Easy, though. Nobody knows better than you the futility of trying to compete out of your class. How many students, workers and employers have tried to compete with you? You've watched them and pitied them, comparing them to a donkey trying to win the Kentucky Derby. How does it feel to be in the place of the donkey for a change? You've always blamed them for not realising they shouldn't try to compete. But this is my own daughter. I must understand. October 1st. Star is now four years old, and according to state law, her mind has now developed enough so that she may attend nursery school. Again, I try to prepare her for what she might face. She listened through about two sentences and changed the subject. I can't tell about Star. Does she already know the answers? Or does she not even realise there is a problem? I was in a sweat of worry when I took her to her first day at school yesterday morning. Last night I was sitting in my chair, reading. After she had put her dolls away, she went to the bookshelves and brought down a book of fairy tales. That is another peculiarity of hers. She has an unmeasurably quick perception, yet she has all the normal reactions of a little girl. She likes her dolls, fairy stories, playing grown-up. No, she's not a monster. She brought the book of fairy tales over to me. Daddy, read me a story, she asked quite seriously. I looked at her in amazement. Since when? Go read your own story. She lifted an eyebrow in imitation of my own characteristic gesture. Children of my age do not read, she instructed pedantically. I can't learn to read until I'm in the first grade. It is very hard to do and I am much too little. She had found the answer to her affliction. Conformity. She had already learned to conceal her intelligence. So many of us break our hearts before we learn that. But you don't have to conceal it from me, Star. Not from me. Oh well, I could go along with the gag if that was what she wanted. Do you like nursery school? I asked the standard question. Oh yes, she exclaimed enthusiastically. It was fun. And what did you learn today, little girl? She played it straight back to me. Not much. I tried to cut out paper dolls, but the scissors kept slipping. Was there an elfin deviltry back of her sober expression? Now look, I cautioned, don't overdo it. That's as bad as being too quick. The idea is that everybody has to be just about standard average. That's the only thing we will tolerate. It is expected that a little girl of four should know how to cut out paper dolls properly. Oh, she questioned and looked thoughtful. I guess that's the hard part, isn't it, Daddy? To know how much you ought to know? Yes, that's the hard part, I agreed fervently. But it's all right, she reassured me. One of the stupids showed me how to cut them out, so now the little girl likes me. She just took charge of me then and told the other kids they should like me too. So of course they did because she's leader. I think I did right after all. Oh no, I breathed to myself. She knew how to manipulate other people already. Then my thought whirled around another concept. It was the first time she had verbally classified normal people as stupids. But it had slipped out so easily that I knew she'd been thinking it to herself for a long time. Then my whirling thoughts hit a third implication. Yes, maybe it was the right thing, I conceded. Where the little girl was concerned, that is. But don't forget you were being observed by a grown-up teacher in the room. And she's smarter. You mean she's older, Daddy, Star corrected me. Smarter too, maybe. You can't tell. 
I can, she sighed. She's just older. I think it was growing fear which made me defensive. That's good, I said emphatically. That's very good. You can learn a lot from her then. It takes an awful lot of study to learn how to be stupid. My own troublesome business life came to mind and I thought to myself, I sometimes think I'll never learn it. I swear I didn't say it aloud, but Star patted me consolingly and answered as though I'd spoken. That's because you're only fairly bright, Daddy. You're a tween, and that's harder than being really bright. A tween? What's a tween? I was bumbling to hide my confusion. That's what I mean, Daddy, she answered in exasperation. You don't grasp quickly, and in between, of course. The other people are stupids. I'm a bright, and you're a tween. I made those names up when I was little. Good God, besides being unmeasurably bright, she's a telepath. All right, Pete, there you are. On reasoning processes, you might stand a chance, but not telepathy. Star, I said on impulse, can you read people's minds? Of course, Daddy, she answered, as if I'd asked a foolishly obvious question. Can you teach me? She looked at me impishly. You're already learning it a little, but you're so slow. You see, you didn't even know you were learning. Her voice took on a wistful note, a tone of loneliness. I wish, she said, and paused. What do you wish? You see what I mean, Daddy? You try, but you're so slow. All the same, I knew. I knew she was already longing for a companion whose mind could match her own. A father is prepared to lose his daughter eventually, Star, but not so soon. Not so soon. June again. Some new people have moved in next door. Star says their name is Howell. Bill and Ruth Howell. They have a son, Robert, who looks maybe a year older than Star, who will soon be five. Star seems to have taken up with Robert right away. He is a well-mannered boy and good company for Star. I'm worried, though. Star had something to do with their moving in next door. I'm convinced of that. I'm also convinced, even from the little I've seen of him, that Robert is a bright and a telepath. Could it be that, failing to find quick accord with my mind, Star has reached out and out until she made contact with a telepath companion? No, that's too fantastic. Even if it were so, how could she shape circumstances so she could bring Robert to live next door to her? The Howells come from another city. It just happened that the people who lived next door moved out and the house was put up for sale. Just happened? How frequently do we find such abnormal brights? What are the chances of one just happening to move in next door to another? I know he is a telepath because, as I write this, I sense him reading it. I even catch his thought. Oh, pardon me, Mr. Holmes. I didn't intend to peek. Really, I didn't. Did I imagine that? Or is Star building a skill in my mind? It isn't nice to look into another person's mind unless you're asked, Robert, I thought back rather severely. It was purely an experiment. I know it, Mr. Holmes. I apologise. He's in his bed in his house across the driveway. No, Daddy, he really didn't mean to. And Star is in her bed in this house. It is impossible to write how I feel. There comes a time when words are empty husks. But mixed with my expectant dread is the thread of gratitude for having been taught to be even stumblingly telepathic. Saturday, August 11th. I thought of a gag. I haven't seen Jim Petrie in a month of Sundays, not since he was awarded that research fellowship with the museum. It will be good to pull him out of his hole, and this little piece of advertising junk star dropped should be just the thing. Strange about the gadget. The awful secret talisman of the mystic junior G-men, no doubt. Still, it doesn't have anything about crackles and pops printed on it. Merely an odd-looking coin. Not even true round. Bronze, by the look of it. Crude. 
they must stamp them out by the million without ever changing a die. But it is just the thing to send to Jim to get a rise out of him. He could always appreciate a good practical joke. Wonder how he'd feel to know he was only a tween. Monday, August 13th. Sitting here at my study desk, I've been staring into space for an hour. I don't know what to think. It was about noon today that Jim Petrie called the office on the phone. Now look, Pete, he started out, what kind of gag are you pulling? I chortled to myself and pulled the deadpan on him. What do you mean, boy? I asked back into the phone. Gag? What kind of gag? What are you talking about? A coin. A coin. He was impatient. You remember you sent me a coin in the mail? Oh, yeah, that, I pretended to remember. Look, you're an important research analyst on metals. Too damned important to keep in touch with your old friends, so I thought I'd make a bid for your attention that away. All right, give, he said in a low voice. Where did you get it? He was serious. Come off it, Jim. Are you practising to be a stuffed shirt? I admit it's a rib. Something star dropped the other day. A manufacturer's idea of kid advertising, no doubt. I'm in dead earnest, Peter, he answered. It's no advertising gadget. It means something? In college, Jim could take a practical joke and make six out of it. I don't know what it means. Where did Star get it? He was being pretty crisp about it. Oh, I don't know, I said. I was getting a little fed up. The joke wasn't going according to plan. Never asked her. You know how kids clutter up the place with their things? No father ever tries to keep track of all the junk that can be bought with three box tops and a dime. This was not bought with three box tops and a dime. He spaced his words evenly. This was not bought anywhere for any price. In fact, if you want to be logical about it, this coin doesn't exist at all. I laughed out loud. This was more like the old Jim. OK, so you've turned the gag back on me. Let's call it quits. How about coming over to supper some night soon? I'm coming over, my friend. He remained grim as he said it. And I'm coming over tonight, as soon as you will be home. It's no gag I'm pulling. Can you get that through your stubborn head? You say you got it from Star, and of course I believe you. But it's no toy. It's the real thing. Then, as if in profound puzzlement, only it isn't. A feeling of dread was settling upon me. Once you cried uncle to Jim, he always let up. Suppose you tell me what you mean, I answered soberly. That's more like it, Pete. Here's what we know about the coin so far. It's apparently pre-Egyptian. It's hand cast. It's made out of one of the lost bronzes. We fix it around 4,000 years old. That ought to be easy to solve, I argued. Probably some coin collector is screaming all over the place for it. No doubt lost it and Star found it. Must be lots of old coins like that in museums and private collections. I was rationalising more for my own benefit than for Jim. He would know all these things without my mentioning them. He waited until I was finished. Step two, he went on. We've got one of the top coin men in the world here at the museum. As soon as I saw what the metal was, I took it to him. Now hold on to your chair, Pete. He says there is no coin like it in the world, either museum or private collection. You museum boys get beside yourselves at times. Come down to earth. Sometime, somewhere, some collector picked it up in some exotic place and kept it quiet. I don't have to tell you how some collectors are. Sitting in a dark room, gloating over some worthless bauble, not telling a soul about it. All right, wise guy, he interrupted. Step three. That coin is at least 4,000 years old, and it's also brand new. Let's hear you explain that away. New? I asked weakly. I don't get it. Old coins show wear. The edges get rounded with handling. The surface oxidises. The molecular structure changes, crystallises. This coin shows no wear, no oxidation, no molecular change. This coin might have been struck yesterday. Where did Star get it? Hold it a minute, I pleaded. I began to think back. Saturday morning, Star and Robert had been playing a game. 
Come to think of it, that was a peculiar game. Mighty peculiar. Star would run into the house and stand in front of the encyclopedia shelf. I could hear Robert counting loudly at the base tree outside in the backyard. She would stare at the encyclopedia for a moment. Once I heard her mumble, That's a good place. Or maybe she merely thought it, and I caught the thought. I'm doing that quite a bit of late. Then she would run outside again. A moment later, Robert would run in and stand in front of the same shelf. Then he also would run outside again. There would be silence for several minutes. The silence would rupture with a burst of laughter and shouting. Soon, Star would come in again. How does he find me? I heard her think once. I can't reason it and I can't esp it out of him. It was during one of their silences that Ruth called over to me. Hey Pete, do you know where the kids are? Time for their milk and cookies. The howls are awfully good to Star, bless them. I got up and went over to the window. I don't know, Ruth, I called back. They were in and out only a few minutes ago. Well, I'm not worried, she said. She came through the kitchen door and stood on the back steps. They know better than to cross the street by themselves. They're too little for that. So I guess they're over at Marilee's. When they come back, tell them to come and get it. OK, Ruth, I answered. She opened the screen door again and went back into her kitchen. I left the window and returned to my work. A little later, both the kids came running into the house. I managed to capture them long enough to tell them about the cookies and milk. Beat you there, Robert shouted to Star. There was a scuffle and they ran out the front door. I noticed then that Star had dropped the coin and I picked it up and sent it to Jim Petrie. Hello, Jim, I said into the phone. Are you still there? Yep, still waiting for an answer, he said. Jim, I think you'd better come over to the house right away. I'll leave my office now and meet you there. Can you get away? Can I get away? He exclaimed. Boss says to trace this coin down and do nothing else. See you in 15 minutes. He hung up. Thoughtfully, I replaced the receiver and went out to my car. I was pulling into my block from one arterial when I saw Jim's car pulling in from a block away. I stopped at the curb and waited for him. I didn't see the kids anywhere out front. Jim climbed out of his car, and I never saw such an eager look of anticipation on a man's face before. I didn't realise I was showing my dread, but when he saw my face he became serious. What is it, Pete? What on earth is it? he almost whispered. I don't know. At least I'm not sure. Come on inside the house. We let ourselves in the front, and I took Jim into the study. It has a large window opening on the back garden, and the scene was very clear. At first, it was an innocent scene, so innocent and peaceful, just three little children in the backyard playing hide-and-seek. Marily, a neighbour's child, was stepping up to the base tree. Now look, you kids, she was saying, you hide where I can find you or I won't play. But where can we go, Marily? Robert was arguing loudly. Like all little boys, he seemed to carry on conversation to the top of his lungs. There's the garage and there's those trees and bushes. You have to look everywhere, Marily. And there's going to be other buildings and trees and bushes there afterward, Star called out with glee. You've got to look behind them too. Yeah, Robert took up the teasing refrain. And there's been lots and lots of buildings of trees here before, especially trees. You've got to look behind them too. Marily tossed her head petulantly. I don't know what you're talking about and I don't care. Just hide where I can find you, that's all. She hid her face at the tree and started counting. If I had been alone, I would have been sure my eyesight had failed me or that I was the victim of hallucinations. But Jim was standing there and saw it too. Marily started counting. Yet the other two didn't run away. Star reached out and took Robert's hand and they merely stood there. For an instant they seemed to shimmer and they disappeared without moving a step. Marily finished her counting and ran around to the few possible hiding places in the yard. When she couldn't find them, she started to blubber and pushed through the hedge to Ruth's back door. They ran away from me again, she whined through the screen at Ruth. Jim and I stood staring at the window. I glanced at him. 
His face was set and pale, but probably no worse than my own. We saw the instant shimmer again. Star, and then immediately Robert, materialised from the air and ran up to the tree shouting, Safe! Safe! Marily let out a ball and ran home to her mother. I called Star and Robert into the house. They came, still holding hands, a little shamefaced, a little defiant. How to begin? What in hell could I say? It's not exactly fair, I told them. Merrily can't follow you there. I was shooting in the dark, but I had at least a glimmering to go by. Star turned pale enough for the freckles on her little nose to stand out under her tan. Robert blushed and turned to her fiercely. I told you so, Star. I told you so. I said it wasn't sporting, he accused. He turned to me. Merrily can't play good hide and seek anyway. She's only a stupid. Let's forget that for a minute, Robert. I turned to her. Star, just where do you go? Oh, it's nothing, Daddy. She spoke defensively, belittling the whole thing. We just go a little ways where we can play with her. She ought to be able to find us a little ways. That's evading the issue. Where do you go and how do you go? Jim stepped forward and showed her the bronze coin I'd sent him. You see, Star he said quietly. We found this. I shouldn't have to tell you my game. She was almost in tears. You're both just twins. You couldn't understand. Then, struck with contrition, she turned to me. Daddy, I've tried and tried to esp you. Truly I did. But you don't esp worth anything. She slipped her hand through Robert's arm. Robert does it very nicely, she said primly, as though she were complimenting him on using his fork the right way. He must be better than I am because I don't know how he finds me. I'll tell you how I do it, Star, Robert explained eagerly. It was as if he was trying to make amends now that grown-ups had caught on. You don't use any imagination. I never saw anybody with so little imagination. I do too have imagination, she countered loudly. I thought up the game, didn't I? I told you how to do it, didn't I? Yeah, yeah, he shouted back. But you always have to look at a book to esp what's in it, so you leave an esp smudge. I just go to the encyclopedia and esp where you did, and I go to that place, and there you are. It's simple. Star's mouth dropped open in consternation. I never thought of that, she said. Jim and I stood there letting the meaning of what they were saying penetrate slowly into our incredulous minds. Anyway, Robert was saying, you haven't any imagination. He sank down cross-legged on the floor. You can't teleport yourself to any place that's never been. She went over to squat down beside him. I can too. What about the moon people? They haven't been yet. He looked at her with childish disgust. Oh, Star, they have so been. You know that. He spread his hands out as though he were a baseball referee. That time hasn't been yet for your daddy here, for instance, but it's already been for someone like, well, like those things from Arcturus. Well, neither have you teleported yourself to some place that never was, Star was arguing. So there. Waving Jim to one chair, I sank down shakily into another. At least the arms of the chair felt solid beneath my hands. Now look, kids, I interrupted their evasive tactics. Let's start from the beginning. I gather you've figured a way to travel to places in the past or future. Well, of course, Daddy, Star shrugged the statement aside nonchalantly. We just TP ourselves by ESP anywhere we want to. It doesn't do any harm. And these were the children who were too little to cross the street. I have been through times of shock before. This was the same. Somehow the mind becomes too stunned to react beyond the point. One simply ploughs through the rest, the best he can, almost normally. OK, OK, I said, and was surprised to hear the same tone I would have used over an argument about the biggest piece of cake. I don't know whether it's harmful or not. I'll have to think it over. Right now, just tell me how you do it. It would be so much easier if I could esp it to you, Star said doubtfully. Well, pretend I'm a stupid and tell me in words. 
You remember the Mobius Strip? she asked, very slowly and carefully, starting with the first and most basic point in almost the way one explains to an ordinary child. Yes, I remembered it, and I remembered how long ago it was that she had discovered it, over a year, and her busy, brilliant mind had been exploring its possibilities ever since, and I thought she had forgotten it. That's where you join the ends of a strip of paper together with a half twist to make one surface, she went on, as though jogging my undependable, slow memory. Yes, I answered. We all know the Mobius strip. Jim looked startled. I had never told him about the incident. Next, you take a sheet and you give it a half twist and join the edge to itself all over to make a funny kind of holder. Klein's bottle, Jim supplied. She looked at him in relief. Oh, you know about that, she said. That makes it easier. Well, then, the next step. You take a cube. Her face clouded with doubt again, and she explained, You can't do this with your hands. You've got a S bit done, because it's an imaginary cube anyway. She looked at us questioningly. I nodded for her to continue. And you esp the twisted cube all together, the same way you did Klein's bottle. Now, if you do that big enough, all around you, so you're sort of half twisted in the middle, then you can TP yourself anywhere you want to go. And that's all there is to it, she finished hurriedly. Where have you gone? I asked her quietly. The technique of doing it would take some thinking. I knew enough physics to know that was the way the dimensions were built up. The line, the plane, the cube, Euclidean physics. The Mobius strip, the Klein bottle, the unnamed twisted cube, Einsteinian physics. Yes, it was possible. Oh, we've gone all over, Star answered vaguely. The Romans and the Egyptians, places like that. You picked up a coin in one of those places, Jim asked. He was doing a good job of keeping his voice casual. I knew the excitement he must be feeling, the vision of the wealth of knowledge that must be opening before his eyes. I found it, Daddy, Star answered Jim's question. She was about to cry. I found it in the dirt, and Robert was about to catch me. I forgot I had it when I went away from there so fast. She looked at me pleadingly. I didn't mean to steal it, Daddy. I never stole anything, anywhere, and I was going to take it back and put it right where I found it. Truly I was, but I dropped it again, and then I asked that you had it. I guess it was awful naughty. I brushed my hand across my forehead. Let's skip the question of good and bad for a minute, I said, my head throbbing. What about this business of going into the future? Robert spoke up, his eyes shining. There isn't any future, Mr. Holmes. That's what I keep telling Star, but she can't reason. She's just a girl. It'll all pass. Everything is always past. Jim stared at him as though thunderstruck and opened his mouth in protest. I shook my head warningly. Suppose you tell me about that, Robert, I said. Well, he began on a rising note, frowning. It's kind of hard to explain at that. Stars are bright, and even she doesn't understand it exactly. But you see, I'm older. He looked at her with superiority. Then, with a change of mood, he defended her. But when she gets as old as I am, she'll understand it okay. He patted her shoulder consolingly. He was all of six years old. You go back into the past, back past Egypt and Atlantis. That's recent he said with scorn, and on back and on back and all of a sudden it's future. That isn't the way I did it, Star tossed her head contrarily. I reasoned the future. I reasoned what would come next, and I went there, and then I reasoned again, and on and on. I can too reason. It's the same future, Robert told us dogmatically. It has to be, because that's all that ever happened. He turned to Star. The reason you could never find any Garden of Eden is that there wasn't any Adam and Eve. Then to me, and man didn't come from the apes either. Man started himself. Jim almost strangled as he leaned forward, his face red and his eyes bulging. How? he choked out. Robert sent his gaze into the far distance. Well, he said, a long time from now, 
you know what I mean, as a stupid would think of time from now, men got into a mess, quite a mess. There were some people in that time who figured out the same kind of travelling star and I do. So when the world was about to blow up and form a new star, a lot of them teleported themselves back to when the Earth was young, and they started over again. Jim just stared at Robert, unable to speak. I don't get it, I said. Not everybody could do it, Robert explained patiently. Just a few brights, but they enclosed a lot of other people and took them along. He became a little vague at this point. I guess later on the brights lost interest in the stupid or something. Anyway, the stupid sank down lower and lower and became like animals. He held his nose briefly. They smelled worse. They worshipped the brights as gods. Robert looked at me and shrugged. I don't know all that happened. I've only been there a few times. It's not very interesting. Anyway, he finished, the brights finally disappeared. I'd sure like to know where they went, Star sighed. It was a lonely sigh. I helplessly took her hand and gave my attention back to Robert. I still don't understand, I said. He grabbed up some scissors, a piece of cellophane tape, a sheet of paper. Quickly he cut a strip, gave it a half twist and taped it together. Then rapidly on the Mobius strip he wrote, Cavemen, this men, that men, Mew men, Atlantis men, Egyptians, history men, us now men, atom men, moon men, planet men, star men. There, he said, that's all the room there is on the strip. I've written it clear round it. Right after star men comes cavemen. It's all one thing joined together. It isn't future and it isn't past either. It just plain is, don't you see? I'd sure like to know how the brights got off the strip, Star said wistfully. I had all I could take. Look, kids, I pleaded. I don't know whether this game's dangerous or not. Maybe you'll wind up in a lion's mouth or something. Oh no, Daddy, Star shrilled in glee. We just teepee ourselves right out of there. But fast, Robert chortled in agreement. Anyway, I've got to think it over, I said stubbornly. I'm only a tween, but Star, I'm your daddy, and you're just a little girl, so you have to mind me. I always mind you, she said virtuously. You do, eh? I asked. What about going off the block? Visiting the Greeks and star men isn't my idea of staying on the block. But you didn't say that, daddy. You said not to cross the street. And I never did cross the street. Did we, Robert? Did we? We didn't cross a single street, Mr. Holmes, he insisted. My God, said Jim, and he went on trying to light a cigarette. All right, all right. No more leaving this time, then, I warned. Wait, it was a cry of anguish from Jim. He broke the cigarette in sudden frustration and threw it in an ashtray. The museum, Pete, he pleaded. Think what it would mean. Pictures, specimens, voice recordings, and not only from historical places, but star men, Pete, star men. Wouldn't it be all right for them to go to places they know are safe? I wouldn't ask them to take risks, but... No, Jim, I said regretfully. It's your museum, but this is my daughter. Sure, he breathed. I guess I'd feel the same way. I turned back to the youngsters. Star, Robert... I said to them both, I want you to promise that you will not leave this time until I let you. Now, I couldn't punish you if you broke that promise because I couldn't follow you. But I want your promise on your word of honour that you won't leave this time. We promise. They each held up a hand as if swearing in court. No more leaving this time. I let the kids go back outside into the yard. Jim and I looked at one another for a long while breathing hard enough to have been running. I'm sorry, I said at last. I know, he answered. So am I. But I don't blame you. I simply forgot for a moment how much a daughter could mean to a man. He was silent and then added, with the humorous quirk back at the corner of his lips, I can just see myself reporting this interview to the museum. You don't intend to, do you? I asked. 
alarmed, and get myself canned or laughed at, I'm not that stupid. September 10th. Am I actually getting it? I had a flash for an instant. I was concentrating on Caesar's triumphant march into Rome. For the briefest of instants, there it was. I was standing on the roadway, watching. But most peculiar, it was still a picture. I was the only thing moving. And then, just as abruptly, I lost it. Was it only a hallucination? Something brought about by intense concentration and wishful thinking? Now, let's see. You visualise a cube. Then you esp it a half twist and seal the edges together. No, when it has the half twist, there's only one surface. You seal that surface all around you. Sometimes I think I have it. Sometimes I despair. If only I were a bright instead of a tween. October 23rd. I don't see how I managed to make so much work of teleporting myself. It's the simplest thing in the world. No effort at all. Why, a child could do it. That sounds like a gag, considering that it was two children who showed me how. But I mean, the whole thing is easy enough for even almost any kid to learn. The problem is understanding the steps. No, not understanding, because I can't say I do, but working out the steps in the process. There's no danger either. No wonder it felt like a still picture at first, for the speeding up is incredible. That bullet I got out of the way of, for instance. I was able to go and meet it and walk along beside it while it travelled through the air. To the men who were duelling, I was no more than an instantaneous streak of movement. That's why the youngsters laughed at the suggestion of danger. Even if they materialised right in the middle of an atomic blast, it is so slow by comparison that they could TP right out again before they got hurt. The blast can't travel any faster than the speed of light, you see, while well, there is no limit to the speed of thought. But I still haven't given them permission to teleport themselves out of this time yet. I want to go over the ages pretty carefully before I do. I'm not taking any chances, even though I don't see how they could wind up in any trouble. Still, Robert claimed the Brights went from the future back to the beginning, which means they could be going through time and overtake any of the three of us, and one of them might be hostile. I felt like a louse not taking Jim's cameras, specimen boxes and recorders along, but there's time for that. Plenty of time, once I get the feel of history without being encumbered by all that stuff to carry. Speaking of time and history, <laughs> what a rotten job historians have done. For instance, George III of England was neither crazy nor a moron. He wasn't a particularly nice guy, I'll admit. I don't see how anyone could be with the amount of flattery I saw. But he was the victim of empire expansion and the ferment of the Industrial Revolution. So were all the other European rulers at the time, though. He certainly did better than Louis of France. At least George kept his job and his head. On the other hand, John Wilkes Booth was definitely psychotic. He could have been cured if they'd had our methods of psychotherapy then, and Lincoln, of course, wouldn't have been assassinated. It was almost a compulsion to prevent the killing, but I didn't dare. God knows what effects that would have had on history. Strange thing, Lincoln looked less surprised than anyone else when he was shot. Sad, yes, and hurt emotionally, at least as much as physically, yet you'd swear he was expecting it. Chops was plenty worried about the number of slaves who died while the pyramid was being built. They weren't easy to replace. He gave them four hours off in the hottest part of the day, and I don't think any slaves in the country were fed or housed better. I never found any signs of Atlantis or Lemuria, just tales of lands far off. A few hundred miles was a big distance then, remember, that had sunk beneath the sea. With the ancients' exaggerated notion of geography, a big island was the same as a continent. Some islands did disappear, naturally, drowning a few thousand villagers and herdsmen. That must have been the source of the legends. Columbus was a stubborn cuss. He was thinking of turning back when the sailors mutinied, which made him obstinate. I still can't see what was eating Genghis Khan and Alexander the Great. It would have been a big help to know the languages, because their big campaigns started off more like vacation or exploration trips. 
Helen of Troy was attractive enough, considering, but she was just an excuse to fight. There were several attempts to federate the Indian tribes before the white men and the five nations, but going after wives and slaves ruined the movement every time. I think they could have kept America if they had been united, and, it goes without saying, knew the deal they were going to get. At any rate, they might have traded for weapons and tools and industrialised the country somewhat the way the Japanese did, I admit that's only speculation, but this would certainly have been a different world if they'd succeeded. One day I'll put it all in a comprehensive and corrected history of mankind, complete with photographs, and then let the experts argue themselves into nervous breakdowns about it. I didn't get very far into the future. Nowhere near the star men, or for that matter back to the beginning that Robert told us about. It's a matter of reasoning out the path, and I'm not a bright. I'll take Robert and Star along as guides, when and if. What I did see of the future wasn't so good, but it wasn't so bad either. The real mess obviously doesn't happen until the Star Men show up, very far ahead in history if Robert is right, and I think he is. I can't guess what the trouble will be, but it must be something ghastly if they won't be able to get out of it, even with the enormously advanced technology they'll have. Or maybe that's the answer. It's almost true as of now. November, Friday 14th. The Howells have gone for a weekend trip and left Robert in my care. He's a good kid and no trouble. He and Star have kept their promise, but they're up to something else. I can sense it, and that feeling of expectant dread is back with me. They've been secretive of late, I catch them concentrating intensely, sighing with vexation, and then breaking out into unexplained giggles. Remember your promise, I warned Star while Robert was in the room. We're not going to break it, Daddy, she answered seriously. They both chorused, no more leaving this time. But they both broke into giggles. I'll have to watch them. What good it would do, I don't know. They're up to something, yet how can I stop them? Shut them in their rooms? Tan their hides? I wonder what someone else would recommend. Sunday night. The kids are gone. I've been waiting an hour for them. I know they wouldn't stay away so long if they could get back. There must be something they've run into. Bright as they are, they're still only children. I have some clues. They promised me they wouldn't go out of this present time. With all her mischievousness, Star has never broken a promise to me, as her typically feminine mind interprets it, that is. So I know they are in our own time. On several occasions, Star has brought it up, wondering where the old ones, the bright ones, have gone, how they got off the Mobius Strip. That's the clue. How can I get off the Mobius Strip and remain in the present? A cube won't do it. There we have a mere journey along the single surface. We have a line, we have a plane, we have a cube, and then we have a supercube, a tesseract. That is the logical progression of mathematics. The bright ones must have pursued that line of reasoning. Now I've got to do the same, but without the advantage of being a bright. Still, it's not the same as expecting a normally intelligent person to produce a work of genius. Genius by our standards, of course, which I suppose Robert and Star would classify as tween. Anyone with a pretty fair IQ and proper education and training can follow a genius's logic, provided the steps are there, and especially if it has a practical application. What he can't do is initiate and complete that structure of logic. I don't have to either. That was done for me by a pair of brights, and I simply have to apply their findings. Now, let's see if I can. By reducing the present past future of man to a Mobius strip, we have sheared away a dimension. It is a two-dimensional strip because it has no depth. Naturally, it would be impossible for a Mobius strip to have depth. It has only one surface. Reducing it to two dimensions makes it possible to travel anywhere you want to go on it via the third dimension and you're in the third dimension when you enfold yourself in the twisted cube. 
Let's go a step higher into one more dimension. In short, the Tesseract. To get the equivalent of a Mobius strip with depth, you have to go into the fourth dimension, which, it seems to me, is the only way the Bright Ones could get off this closed cycle of past, present, future, past. They must have reasoned that one more notch up in the dimensions was all they needed. It is equally obvious that Starr and Robert have followed the same line of reasoning. They wouldn't break their promise not to leave the present, and getting off the Mobius strip into another present would, in a sort of devious way, be keeping that promise. I'm putting all this speculation down for you, Jim Petrie, knowing first that you're a tween like myself, and second that you're sure to have done a lot of thinking about what happened after I sent you the coin star dropped. I'm hoping you can explain all this to Bill and Ruth Howell, or enough, in any case, to let them understand the truth about their son Robert and my daughter Star, and where the children may have gone. I'm leaving these notes where you will find them, when you and Bill and Ruth search the house and grounds for us. If you read this, it will be because I have failed in my search for the youngsters. There is also the possibility that I'll find them, and that we won't be able to get back onto this Mobius strip. Perhaps time has a different value there, or doesn't exist at all. What it's like off the strip is anybody's guess. Bill and Ruth, I wish I might give you hope that I will bring Robert back to you. But all I can do is wish. It may be no more than wishing upon a star. My star. I'm trying now to take six cubes and fold them in on one another, so that every angle is a right angle. It's not easy, but I can do it using every bit of concentration I've learned from the kids. All right, I have the six cubes and I have every angle a right angle. Now if, in the folding, I esp the tesseract a half twist around myself and... End of Star Bright by Mark Clifton Read by Barry Howarth, Brisbane, Australia. Accidental Death by Peter Bailey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Accidental Death by Peter Bailey The most dangerous of weapons is the one you don't know is loaded. The wind howled out of the northwest, blind with snow and barbed with ice crystals. All the way up the half-mile precipice, it fingered and wrenched away at groaning ice slabs. It screamed over the top, whirled snow in a dervish dance around the hollow there, piled snow into the long furrow, ploughed ruler straight through streamlined hummocks of snow. The sun glinted on black rock glazed by ice, chasms and ridges and bridges of ice. It lit the snow slope to a frozen glare, penciled black shadow down the long furrow, and flashed at the furrow's end on a thing of metal and plastics, an artifact thrown down in the dead wilderness. Nothing grew, nothing flew, nothing walked, nothing talked, but the thing in the hollow was stirring in stiff jerks, like a snake with its back broken or a clockwork toy running down. When the movement stopped, there was a click and a strange sound began, thin, scratchy, inaudible, more than a yard away, weary but still cocky. There leaked from the shape in the hollow the sound of a human voice. I've tried my hands and arms and they seem to work, it began. I've 
wiggled my toes with entire success. It's well on the cards that I'm all in one piece and not broken up at all, though I, I don't see how it could happen. Right now, I don't feel like struggling up and finding out. I'm fine where I am. I'll just lie here for a while and relax and get some of the story on tape. This suit's got a built-in recorder. I might as well use it. That way, if I'm not as well as I feel, I'll leave a message. You probably know we're back and wonder what went wrong. I suppose I'm in a state of shock. That's why I can't seem to get up. Who wouldn't be shocked after luck like that? I've always been lucky, I guess. Luck got me a place in the whale. Sure, I'm a good astronomer, but so are lots of other guys. If I were ten years older, it would have been an honour being picked for the first long jump in the first starship ever. At my age, it was luck. You'll want to know if the ship worked. Well, she did. Went like a bomb. We got lined up between Earth and Mars, you'll remember. And James pushed the button marked jump, took his finger off the button, and there we were, Alpha Centauri, two months later your time, one second later by us. We covered our whole survey assignment like that, smooth as a pint of old and mild, which right now I could certainly use. Better yet would be a pint of hot black coffee with sugar in. Failing that, I could even go for a long drink of cold water. There was never anything wrong with the whale till right at the end. And even then, I doubt if it was the ship itself that fouled things up. That was some survey assignment. We astronomers really lived. Wait till you see. But of course, you won't. I could weep when I think of those miles of lovely colour film, all gone up in smoke. I'm shocked, all right. I never said who I was. Matt Hennessy, from Farside Observatory, back of the moon, just back from a proving flight come astronomical survey in the starship whale. Whoever you are who finds this tape, you're made. Take it to any radio station or newspaper office. You'll find you can name your price and don't take any wooden nickels. Where'd I got to? I told you how we happened to find Chang, hadn't I? That's what the natives called it. Walking, talking natives on a blue sky planet with a 1.1 g gravity and a 20% oxygen atmosphere at 15 psi. <laughs> the odds against finding Chang on a six-sun survey on the first star jump ever must be up in the Googles. Now, we certainly were lucky. The Chang natives aren't very technical, haven't got space travel, for instance. They're good astronomers, though, we were able to show them our sun in their telescopes. In their way, they're a highly civilized people. Look more like cats than people, but they're people all right. If you doubt it, chew these facts over. 1. They learn our language in four weeks. When I say, I mean a ten-man team of them. 2. They brew a near beer that's a lot nearer than the canned stuff we had aboard the whale. Three, they've got a great sense of humour. Ran rather to silly practical jokes, but still, can't say I care for that hot foot and belly laugh stuff myself, but tastes differ. Four, the ten-man language team also learned chess and table tennis. But why go on? People who talk English, drink beer, like jokes, and beat me at chess or table tennis are people for my money, even if they look like tigers in trousers. It was funny the way they won all the time at table tennis. 
they certainly weren't so hot at it. Maybe that 10% extra gravity put us off our strokes. As for chess, Svendlov was our champion. He won sometimes. The rest of us seemed to lose whichever Chingsi we played. There again, it wasn't so much that they were good. How could they be in the time? It was more that we all seemed to make silly mistakes when we played them. And that's fatal in chess. Of course, it's a screwy situation. Playing chess with something that grows its own fur coat, has yellow eyes an inch and a half long, and long white whiskers. Could you have kept your mind on the game? And don't think I fell victim to their feline charm. The children were pets, but you didn't feel like patting the adults on their big grinning heads. Personally, I didn't like the one I knew best. He was called, well, we called him Charlie, and he was an ethnologist, ambassador, contact man, or whatever you like to call him, who came back with us. Why I disliked him was because he was always trying to get a nedge on you. All the time he had to be top. Great sense of humour, of course. I nearly broke my neck on that butter slide he fixed up in the metal alleyway to the whale's engine room. Charlie laughed fit to bust. Everyone laughed. I even laughed myself, though doing it hurt me more than the tumble had. Yes, life and soul at the party, old Charlie. My last sight of the minnow was a cabin full of dead and dying men. The sweetish stink of burned flesh and the choking reek of scorching insulation. The boat jolting and shuddering and beginning to break up and in the middle of the flames still unhurt was Charlie. He was laughing. My God, it's dark out here. Wonder how high I am. Must be all of 50 miles and doing 800 miles an hour at least. I'll be doing more than that when I land. What's final velocity for a 50 mile fall? Same as a 50,000 mile fall, I suppose. Same as escape. 24,000 miles an hour. I'll make a mess. That's better. Why didn't I close my eyes before? Those star streaks made me dizzy. I'll make a nice shooting star when I hit air. Come to think of it, I must be deep in air now. Let's take a look. It's getting lighter. Look at those peaks down there, like great knives. I don't seem to be falling as fast as I expected, though. Almost seem to be floating. Let's switch on the radio and tell the world hello. Hello, Earth. Hello again. And goodbye. Sorry about that. I passed out. I don't know what I said if anything, and the suit recorder has no playback or eraser. What must have happened is that the suit ran out of oxygen, and I lost consciousness due to anoxia. I dreamed I switched on the radio, but I actually switched on the emergency tank. Thank the Lord, and that brought me around. Come to think of it, why not crack the suit and breathe fresh air instead of bottled? No. I'd have to get up to do that. I think I'll just lie here a little bit longer and get properly rested up before I try anything big like standing up. I was telling about the return journey, wasn't I? The long jump back home, which should have dumped us between the orbits of Earth and Mars. Instead of which, when James took his finger off the button, the mass detector showed nothing except the noise level of the universe. We were out in that no place for a day. We astronomers had to establish our exact position relative to the solar system. The crew had to find out exactly what went wrong. The physicists had to make mystic passes in front of meters and mutter about residual folds and stress-free space. Our task was easy, because we were about 
half a light year from the sun. The crew's job was also easy. They found what went wrong in less than half an hour. It still seems incredible. To program the ship for a star jump, you merely told it where you were and where you wanted to go. In practical terms, that entailed first a series of exact measurements which had to be translated into the somewhat abstruse coordinate system we used based on the topological order of mass points in the galaxy. Then you cut a tape on the computer and hit the button. Nothing was wrong with the computer. Nothing was wrong with the engines. We'd hit the right button and we'd gone to the place we ate aim for. All we'd done was aim for the wrong place. It hurts me to tell you this. And I'm just attached personnel with no space flight tradition. In practical terms, one highly trained crew member had punched a wrong pattern of holes in the tape. Another, equally skilled, had failed to notice this when reading back, childish error, highly improbable, twice repeated, thus squaring the improbability. Incredible. But that's what happened. Anyway, we took good care with the next lot of measurements. That's why we were out there so long. They were cross-checked about five times. I got sick. So I climbed into a spacesuit and went outside and took some photographs of the sun, which I hoped would help to determine hydrogen density in the outer regions. When I got back, everything was ready. We disposed ourselves about the control room and relaxed for all we were worth. We were all praying that this time nothing would go wrong and all looking forward to seeing Earth again after four months subjective time away. Except for Charlie, who was still chuckling and shaking his head. And Captain James, who was glaring at Charlie and obviously wishing human dignity permitted him to tear Charlie limb from limb. Then James pressed the button. Everything twanged like a bowstring. I felt myself turned inside out, passed through a small sieve and poured back into shape. The entire bow wall screen was full of earth. Something was wrong all right, and this time it was much worse. We'd come out of the jump about 200 miles above the Pacific, pointed straight down, traveling at a relative speed of about 2,000 miles an hour. It was a fantastic situation. Here was the whale, the most powerful ship ever built, which could cover 50 light years in a subjective time of one second, and it was helpless. For as, of course, you know, the star drive couldn't be used again for at least two hours. The whale also had ion rockets, of course, the standard deuterium fusion thing with direct conversion. As again you know, this is good for interplanetary flight because you can run it continuously and it has extremely high exhaust velocity. But in our situation it was no good because it has rather a low thrust. It would have taken more time than we had to deflect us enough to avoid a smash. We had five minutes to abandon ship. James got us all into the minnow at a dead run. There was no time to take anything at all, except the clothes we stood in. The minnow was meant for short, heavy hops to planets or asteroids. In addition to the ion drive, it had emergency atomic rockets using steam for reaction mass. We thanked God for that when Kazamian cancelled our downward velocity with them in a few seconds. We curved away up over China and from about 50 miles high we saw the whale hit the Pacific. 600 tons of mass at well over 2,000 miles an hour makes an almighty splash. By now you'll have divers down. 
but I doubt they'll salvage much you can use. I wonder why James went down with the ship, as the saying is. Not that it made any difference. It must have broken his heart to know that his lovely ship was getting the chopper. Or did he suspect another human error? We didn't have time to think about that, or even get the radio working. The steam rockets blew up. Poor Gazamian was burned to a crisp. Only thing that saved me was the spacesuit I was still wearing. I snapped the faceplate down because the cabin was filling with fumes. I saw Charlie coming out of the toilet. That's how he'd escaped. And I saw him beginning to laugh. Then the port side collapsed and I fell out. I saw the launch spinning away, glowing red against a purplish black sky. I tumbled head over heels towards the huge curved shield of earth fifty miles below. I shut my eyes, and that's about all I remember. I don't see how any of us could have survived. I think we're all dead. I'll have to get up and crack this suit and let some air in, but I can't. I fell fifty miles without a parachute. I'm dead so I can't stand up. There was silence for a while, except for the vicious howl of the wind. Then snow began to shift on the ledge. A man crawled stiffly out and came shakily to his feet. He moved slowly around for some time. After about two hours, he returned to the hollow, squatted down and switched on the recorder. The voice began again, considerably wearier. Hello there. I'm in the bleakest wilderness I've ever seen. This place makes the moon look cosy. There's a precipice around me every way but one, and that's up. So it's up I'll have to go till I find a way to go down. I've been chewing snow to quench my thirst, but I could eat a horse. I picked up a shortwave broadcast on my suit, but couldn't understand a word. Not English, not French, and there I stick. Listen to it for 15 minutes just to hear a human voice again. I haven't much hope of reaching anyone with my 5 milliwatt suit transmitter, but I'll keep trying. Just before I start the climb, there are two things I want to get on tape. The first is how I got here. I've remembered something from my military training when I did some parachute jumps. Terminal velocity for a human body falling through air is about 120 miles per hour. Falling 50 miles is no worse than falling 500 feet. You'd be lucky to live through a 500 foot fall. True, but I've been lucky. The suit is bulky, but light, and probably slowed my fall. I hit a 60 mile an hour updraft this side of the mountain, skidded downhill through about half a mile of snow and fetched up in a drift. The suit is part worn but still operational. I'm fine. The second thing I want to say is about the Chingsi, and here it is. Watch out for them. Those jokers are dangerous. I'm not telling you how, because I've got a scientific reputation to watch. You'll have to figure it out for yourselves. Here are the clues. 1. The Chingsies talk and laugh, but after all, they aren't human. On an alien world, a hundred light years away, why shouldn't alien talents develop? A talent that's so un certain and rudimentary here that most people don't believe it might be highly developed out there. 2. The whale expedition did fine till it found Chang. Then it hit a seam of bad luck, real stinking bad luck that went on and on till it looks fishy. We lost the ship. We lost the launch. All but one of us lost our lives. We couldn't even win a game of ping pong. 
So what is luck, good or bad? Scientifically speaking, future chance events are by definition chance. They can turn out favourable or not. When a preponderance of chance events has occurred unfavourably, you've got bad luck. It's a fancy name for a lot of chance results that didn't go your way. But the gambler defines it differently. For him, luck refers to the future. And you've got bad luck when future chance events won't go your way. Scientific investigations into this have been inconclusive, but everyone knows that some people are lucky and others aren't. All we've got are hints and glimmers, the fumbling touch of a rudimentary talent. There's the evil eye legend, and the Jonah, bad luck bringers. Superstition? Maybe. But ask the insurance companies about accident prones. What's in a name? Call a man unlucky and you're superstitious. Call him accident prone. And that's sound business sense. I've said enough. All the same, search the space flight records, talk to the actuaries. When a ship is working perfectly and is operated by a hand-picked crew of highly trained men in perfect condition, how often is it wrecked by a series of silly errors happening one after another in defiance of probability? I'll sign off with two thoughts, one depressing and one cheering. A single Qingzi wrecked our ship and our launch. What could a whole planet full of them do? On the other hand, a talent that manipulates chance events is bound to be chancy. No matter how highly developed, it can't be surefire. The proof is that I've survived to tell the tale. At 20 below zero and 50 miles an hour, the wind ravaged the mountain. Peering through his polarized visor at the white waste and the snow-filled air howling over it, sliding and stumbling with every step on a slope that got gradually steeper and seemed to go on forever. Matt Hennessy began to inch his way up the north face of Mount Everest. The End End of Accidental Death by Peter Bailey Recording by Gabriel McDermott The Unthinking Destroyer by Rog Phillips This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barry Howarth The Unthinking Destroyer by Rog Phillips Gordon and Harold both admitted the possibility of thinking entities other than human, but would they ever recognise the physical form of some of these beings? Hey, Gordon! Gordon Marlowe, PhD, straightened up and turned in the direction of the voice, the garden trowel dangling in his dirt-stained white canvas glove. His wide mouth broke into a smile that revealed even white teeth. It was Harold Harper an undergraduate student who had called. Hop over the fence and come in, Gordon invited. He dropped the trowel and, taking off his work gloves, reached into his pocket and extracted an old pipe. He filled it, the welcoming smile remaining on his lips, while Harold Harper approached, stepping carefully between the rows of carrots, cabbages and cauliflower. Harold held the newspaper in his hand. When he reached Gordon Marlowe, he held it open and pointed to the headline, Robot Rocket Ship to Mars. Gordon took the paper and read the item, puffing slowly and contentedly on his old pipe. His eyes took on an interested look when he came to the reporter's speculations on the possibility of intelligent life on Mars. 
Finally, he handed the newspaper back to Harold. You know, Harold, he said, I wonder if they would recognise intelligent life if they saw it on other planets. Of course they would, Harold replied. Regardless of its form, there would be artefacts that only intelligent life could create. Would there? Gordon snorted. I wonder. He squatted down, picking up the trowel and lazily poking it into the rich soil at his feet. That's why I wonder, he continued. We are so prone to set up tests on what intelligent life is that we are likely to miss it entirely if it doesn't conform exactly to our preconceived notions. We assume that if a being is intelligent, it must get the urge to build artefacts of some kind. Pots and vases, houses, idols, machinery, metal objects. But must it? In order to do so, it must have hands and perhaps legs. Suppose it doesn't have such things. Suppose that no matter how intelligent it might be, it could not do those things. Then it wouldn't be intelligent, would it? Harold asked, puzzled. We are assuming it is, Gordon said patiently. There are other outlets for intelligence than making clay pots. As a last resort for an intelligent being, there is always thinking. He chuckled at his joke. I've often wondered what it would be like to be a thinking, reasoning being with no powers of movement whatsoever. With bodily energy provided automatically by environment, say, and all the days of life with nothing to do but think. What a chance for a philosopher. What depths of thought he might explore. What heights of intellectual perception he might attain. And if there were some means of contact with others of his kind so that all could pool their thoughts and guide the younger generation, what progress such a race might make. And so we see, Aunt telepathed, that there must be a whole of which each of us is a part only. The old process which says, I think, therefore I am, has its fallacy in the statement, I think. It assumes that this assertion is axiomatic and basic, when in reality it is the conclusion derived from a long process of mental introspection. It is a theory rather than an axiom. But don't you think, Aunt, Umpt replied, that you are confusing the noumenon with the phenomenon? What I mean is, the fact of thinking is there from the very start, or the conclusion couldn't be reached. And the theoretical conclusion, as you call it, is merely the final recognition of something basic and axiomatic that was there all the time. True, Aunt replied, but still, to the thinking mind, it is a theory and not an axiom. All noumena are there before we arrive at an understanding of them. Thought, if it exists as such, is also there. But the theoretical conclusion, I think, has no more degree of certainty than any other thing the mind can deal with. To say, I think, is to assert the truth of a hypothesis which may be true, but not necessarily so. And then to conclude, therefore I am, is to advance one of the most shaky conclusions of all time. Underneath that so-called logical conclusion lies a metaphysics of being, a theory of differentiation, and, in short, the most irrational hodgepodge of contradictory conclusions the thinking mind can conceive. This precognition that enables one to arrive at the tenuous statement, I think, therefore I am, is nicely thrown out by tagging it with another metaphysical intangible called illusion, as if the mind can separate illusion from reality by some absolute standard. I believe you're right, Aunt, Aunt replied slowly, his telepathed thoughts subdued with respect. It is possible that the concept I think is the illusion, while the so-called illusions are the reality. Even without the benefit of past thoughts, Gordon was saying, whacking off a weed a yard away and nearly upsetting himself, a mind with nothing to do but think could accomplish miracles. Suppose it was not aware of any other thinking entity, though it might be surrounded by such similar entities. It would be born or come into existence some way, arrive at self-awareness, and certain other awarenesses to base its thinking on, depending on its structure, and... He looked up at Harold, startled by his own conclusion. It might even arrive at the ultimate solution to all reality and comprehend the foundations of the universe. And eventually be destroyed without any other entity having the benefit of it all, Harold commented dryly. 
What a pity that would be, Gordon murmured, for the human race to struggle for hundreds of years and have some unguessable entity on Mars do all of that in one lifetime, and it all go to waste while some blundering ass lands on Mars and passes it by looking for artefacts. But that is only the start of the blunders contained in that most profound philosophical revelation of old, Ant stated. After arriving at a precarious conclusion about existence, the ancients were not satisfied. They had to say, if I am, I must have been created. Then they go on and say, if I was created, there must be a creator. And thus they saw from their precarious perch in existence, soar on non-existent wings and perch on the essence of evanescence. They do not recognise the alternative, that to exist does not necessarily imply a beginning. They do not recognise it because they have derived all their tools from reality around them, and then denied the reality while accepting the validity of the tools of thought that derived from it. And in this way they arrive at an absolute existence of something they have never sensed or felt in any way, while denying all that they have felt and sensed, and give it attributes which their sense of idealism dictates it must have, and call it God. Then, Umpt said thoughtfully, I take it you are an atheist? Certainly not, Aunt growled telepathically. But you implied that in your comments on the conclusions of the ancients, Umpt insisted. But if there are no artefacts, Harold said, and no signs of intelligence whatever, how could we ever know there was intelligence someplace? There must be some way, Gordon said. I've taught logic at the U for 15 years now, and I've done a lot of thinking on the subject. If we ever reach Mars, I think we should be very careful what we touch. We could be clumsy bulls in a china shop, not knowing the true worth of what we found, destroying what might be found to be priceless by later and more careful explorers. Mars is older than Earth, and I can't help being convinced that some form of intelligence is there. I implied no such thing as atheism. Aunt insisted. I merely said that the reasoning used by the ancients to arrive at the Creator was the most slipshod and illogical possible. There was another line used long ago that was more solid, but still very weak. It started out with the statement, I can be aware of nothing but thought. External stimuli, if such there are, must be transformed into thought before I can be aware of them. Since I can never be aware of anything other than thought, why assume anything except thought exists? You and all other things exist as thoughts in my mind. There is nothing except what exists in my mind. Therefore, by that token, I am God. <laughs> but, Umpt chuckled, by the same token, I can insist that I am God, and you are just a product of my own creation. Yes, Aunt agreed. So it presents a dilemma. To resolve it, it is necessary to postulate a supreme mind, and to say that all things are just thoughts in God's mind. That makes us both the same, then, and there is no argument about who is God. Harold kicked a lump of moist earth absently. It seems to me, Gordon, he said cautiously, that you are biting the air with your teeth. If there are intelligent beings on Mars, they will be aware of us and make themselves known. If for no other reason, they will do that to keep us from destroying them. Gordon stood up and arched his back. He placed the garden trowel and gloves in the hip pocket of his coveralls and tapped his pipe on the heel of his shoe. You are assuming, he said, that such beings can find a way to communicate with us. But have you thought of the possibility that if their abilities to reason are undetectable to us, by the same token they might not be aware that we are intelligent? A mad bull in a pasture can think after a fashion, but would we try to reason with him? You would run if he charged you, and if he caught up with you and mauled you, it would never occur to you to say, Look here, old boy, let's talk this thing over first. Both men laughed. Gordon sat walking along the row he had been standing in, toward the house. Harold kept pace. I see your point, he agreed. There are so many things we assume unconsciously when we speculate on the possibilities of intelligent life on Mars, Gordon went on, stooping over to pull a weed he had missed in his earlier weeding. Rate of thinking is most probably a function of the material organism. 
some other thinking creature might think faster or slower, perhaps so much so that we couldn't follow them even if we could tune in on their thoughts directly. Imagine a mind so ponderous that it takes a year for it to think as much as we do in a minute. Speed wouldn't necessarily have to be a function of size either. Something incredibly small might take ages to think a simple thought. Have you heard the German tale called The Three Sleepers, Harold? No, I haven't, Harold replied. Well, in a small town in Germany, there were three men so fat they could barely walk. They spent nearly all their time sleeping. The only trouble was that every day or so, someone would disturb them by singing or walking by or some other trivial thing that was always happening in a small town, no matter how dead it is. One time, they were disturbed three days running. They got mad and decided to go to the hills. They looked in the hills until they found a nice, dry cave. There, they relaxed with deep sighs of contentment and went to sleep. Day after day, week after week, they slept undisturbed. Then one day, a dog wandered into the cave, saw the three breathing mountains of flesh and heard the din of their deep snoring and, scared half to death, let out a shrill yip and skedaddled. A week later, one of the three sleepers stirred, opened his eyes briefly and muttered, What was that noise? Then he promptly went back to sleep. Ten days later, the second sleeper stirred, muttered, Damn if I know, and went back to sleep. Nearly a month later, the third sleeper opened his eyes suddenly, stared at the roof of the cave for a moment and said, I think it was a dog. Then he went back to sleep. The way the story goes, nothing ever came near the cave again, so they are still there, fast asleep. Still fat, too, I suppose. I see what you're driving at, Harold said, chuckling over the story. We assume that any intelligent being, whatever, if it exists, thinks at the same rate we do, but it might not. That's right, Gordon admitted. And there are even more subtle assumptions we make unconsciously. For one, we assume that a thinking creature must think in the same way we do. We might not even be able to recognise thinking when we meet it on another planet. No, he held up his hand to silence the question on Harold's lips. I don't know exactly what I mean. I'll put it this way. We have steam engines and gasoline engines. We also have electric motors. Suppose we have steam engine thought. How would we recognise electric motor thinking? Or perhaps a little closer to what I'm trying to express, we have arithmetic and algebra. Suppose, with our arithmetic minds, with no slightest inkling of the existence of a variable, we run into an algebra mind. We might mistake it for something far removed from thinking or intelligence. We go on the assumption that anything that doesn't stomp us, give a salute, and solemnly announce how, is unintelligent. It might just be more interested in its own thoughts than in the visitors from Earth, Harold suggested. It might, Gordon said, or it might be intensely curious and studying the Earthmen very closely with senses other than sight and hearing. But, Aunt added thoughtfully, although the conclusion that we are all thoughts in the minds of the Creator is logically unshakable, it isn't very satisfying from a logical point, because it makes God nothing more than the compromising of acute dilemma. It places the Creator in the same light as the final decision to locate the capital of the United States at Washington. Where's that? Aunt asked quickly. I don't know, Aunt said testily. That's just something I picked up out of the blue, so to speak. Inspirational thought. For all I know, it's just a figment of my imagination. I've had inspirational thoughts too, Umpter said excitedly. I haven't spoken of them to you because I was afraid you might think I was becoming disorganised in my thoughts. I've done a lot of thinking about the inspirational stuff I get now and then, Aunt said matter-of-factly. If it came all the time, I would be inclined to think it was the voice of the supreme being itself. But it doesn't come that way. Neither does mine, Aunt said. I often think there must be angels that hover over us at times and bless us with their wise thoughts, perhaps looking into us to see if we are ready yet. When I seem to sense these powerful thoughts about me, I try to feel humble and worshipful. I hope in that way one of them will see fit to reveal himself to me some day. 
They might, Aunt said hopefully. I wouldn't mind actually talking to one of them myself. But speaking of that, we don't know for sure that these inspirational thoughts aren't actually our own. They seem different, but that might be because they arrive in some part of our deep subconscious thought processes. I've been trying to extend my sense of awareness in order to reach into my subconscious mind and actually plumb it to its depths. One thing I've found is that most of my real thinking goes on there and only rises to the surface of consciousness when it is completed. That lends probability to the theory that all such voices of inspiration are merely my own subconscious mind, giving me the end products of carefully thought out trains of reasoning it has dreamt up. I think I'll try that line of development myself, Umpter said. I'd never thought of it. Maybe inspiration is only subconscious thought rising to the surface of consciousness. Maybe it is. But if so, I'll be very disappointed. I'd hoped sometime to be able to commune with some intelligence infinitely superior to mine and really learn the true nature of things. I sincerely hope I'm wrong about it, Aunt said. I too would like to believe that there is more in reality than just us. I wonder if other kinds of entities are possible. I mean, thinking beings with different forms, different senses, perhaps different types of thinking. It may be they exist and we aren't equipped to detect them. They may be around us all the time, aware of us and our puerile thoughts, but so superior to us in every way that they don't think it worthwhile even to consider our feeble cognitions. I wouldn't call your cognitions feeble, Aunt, Aunt exclaimed admiringly. That is a point of relativity, Aunt said, somewhat flattered. It does seem vain, though. We spend our existence in solving the problems of reality, and when we have solved them, we have no need of the solution. It gives us a feeling of satisfaction to gain the theoretical basis of reality from our point of view. But I, for one, would feel much better if we could be of service to some entity who was unable to accomplish that himself, but might be able to comprehend it if we taught him. All very noble, Umpt said sceptically, but I can't even imagine a thinking creature different from us in any way. That's why it's so difficult, Aunt said. In our own minds, we tend to become absolute rather than relative in our conceptions. Some other entity might, for example, think much more slowly than we, or with incredible rapidity, so that our thoughts would be sluggish to him, or so swift he would never be able to grasp them until long after we were gone. Also, we tend to think that thought, as we experience it, is the only possible type of thought. In reality, there may be others. Different mental principles, different material structure, perhaps concepts outside our ability to grasp, while others might be outside the ability of such creatures to grasp also. I don't believe I grasp what you're trying to say, Umpt hesitated. Well, put it this way, Aunt said patiently. All things are relative. Why not thought? It might be possible to have two thinking minds that are relatively non-thinking. Each, from every standard of the other, being totally thoughtless and without intelligence or mind. Now you're going too far, Umpt said. Thought is thought, I think, and it's real. If any other entity thinks, its thinking must be real too. Of course... Aunt murmured, you miss the point entirely. If from every possible angle some entity to you can't think and doesn't, it is non-thinking and unintelligent, right? Gordon and Harold paused at the edge of the garden. Nice crop of vegetables you have there, Gordon, Harold said appreciatively. Thanks, Gordon said. Say, wouldn't your wife like some fresh vegetables? Without waiting for an answer, he stepped back into the garden, taking a knife from his pocket. These are nice now, he said, bending over and cutting. Won't be much longer, though. Brown spots developing already. I'll scrape off the brown stuff for you, but tell your wife to cook them right away. In a couple of days, they'll spoil. Umpt, Aunt exclaimed, exasperated. Why don't you answer me, Umpt? Umpt? Where are you, Umpt? Why don't you answer? There you are, Gordon said, smiling, as he handed Harold the head of cauliflower. Thanks, Harold said, accepting the white, fresh head and balancing it in his palm. The two men continued up the walk to the house. 
As I was saying, Gordon took up their conversation. When men get to Mars, if they aren't careful, they may destroy a civilization, or even thousands of intelligent beings without knowing it. End of The Unthinking Destroyer by Rog Phillips Read by Barry Howarth of Brisbane, Australia And stop. The Skull by Philip K. Dick. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anonymous. The Skull by Philip K. Dick. Conger agreed to kill a stranger he had never seen, but he would make no mistakes because he had the stranger's skull under his arm. What is this opportunity? Conger asked. Go on, I'm interested. The room was silent. All faces were fixed on Conger, still in the drab prison uniform. The speaker leaned forward slowly. Before you went to prison, your trading business was paying well, all illegal, all very profitable. Now you have nothing except the prospect of another six years in a cell. Conger scowled. There is a certain situation, very important to this council, that requires your peculiar abilities. Also, it is a situation you might find interesting. You were a hunter, were you not? You've done a great deal of trapping, hiding in the bushes, waiting at night for the game. I imagine hunting must be a source of satisfaction to you, the chase, the stalking. Conger sighed, his lips twisted. All right, he said. Leave that out. Get to the point. Who do you want me to kill? The speaker smiled. All in proper sequence, he said softly. The car slid to a stop. It was night. There was no light anywhere along the street. Conger looked out. Where are we? What is this place? The hand of the guard pressed into his arm. Come, through that door. Conger stepped down onto the damp sidewalk. The guard came swiftly after him and then the speaker. Conger took a deep breath of cold air. He studied the dim outline of the building rising up before them. I know this place. I've seen it before. He squinted, his eyes growing accustomed to the dark. Suddenly he became alert. This is... Yes, the first church. The speaker walked toward the steps. We're expected. Expected here? Yes, the speaker mounted the stairs. You know we're not allowed in their churches, especially with guns. He stopped. Two armed soldiers loomed up ahead, one on each side. All right? The speaker looked up at them. They nodded. The door of the church was open. Conquer could see other soldiers inside, standing about, Young soldiers with large eyes, gazing at the icons and holy images. I see, he said. It was necessary, the speaker said. As you know, we have been singularly unfortunate in the past with our relations with the First Church. This won't help. But it's worth it. You will see. They passed through the hall and into the main chamber where the altarpiece was and the kneeling places. The speaker scarcely glanced at the altars as they passed by. He pushed open a small side door and beckoned Conger through. In here, we have to hurry. The faithful will be flocking in soon. Conger entered, blinking. They were in a small chamber, low-ceilinged, with dark panels of old wood. There was a smell of ashes and smoldering spices in the room. He sniffed. What's that? That smell? Cups on the wall, I don't know. The speaker crossed impatiently to the far side. According to our information, it is hidden here by this. Conger looked around the room. He saw books and papers, holy signs and images. A strange low shiver went through him. Does my job involve anyone of the church? If it does... 
The speaker turned, astonished. Can it be that you believe in the founder? Is it possible a hunter, a killer? No, of course not. All their business about resignation to death and nonviolence. What is it then? Conger shrugged. I've been taught not to mix with such as these. They have strange abilities, and you can't reason with them. The speaker studied Conger thoughtfully. You have the wrong idea. It is no one here that we have in mind. We found that killing them only tends to increase their numbers. And why come here? Let's leave. No, we came for something important. Something you will need to identify your man. Without it, you won't be able to find him. A trace of a smile crossed the speaker's face. We don't want you to kill the wrong person. It's too important. I don't make mistakes. Conger's chest rose. Listen, speaker. This is an unusual situation, the speaker said. You see, the person you are after, the person we are sending you to find, is known only by certain objects here. They are the only traces, the only means of identification. Without them, what are they? He came toward the speaker. The speaker moved to one side. Look, he said. He drew a sliding wall away, showing a dark square hole. In there. Conker squatted down, staring in. He frowned. A skull? A skeleton? The man you are after has been dead for two centuries, the speaker said. This is all that remains of him, and this is all you will have with which to find him. For a long time, Conger said nothing. He stared down at the bones, dimly visible in the recess of the wall. How could a man dead centuries be killed? How could it he be stalked, brought down? Conger was a hunter, a man who had lived as he pleased, where he pleased. He had kept himself alive by trading, bringing furs and pelts from the provinces in his own ship, riding at high speed, slipping through the customs line around Earth. He had hunted in the great mountains of the moon. He had stalked through empty Martian cities. He had explored, the speaker said, Soldier, take these objects and have them carried to the car. Don't lose any part of them. The soldier went into the cupboard, reaching gingerly, squatting on his heels. It is my hope, the speaker continued softly to Conger, that you will demonstrate your loyalty to us now. There are always ways for citizens to restore themselves, to show their devotion to their society. For you, I think this would be a very good chance. I seriously doubt that a better one will come. And for your efforts, there will be quite a restitution, of course. The two men looked at each other. Conger, thin, unkempt, the speaker immaculate in his uniform. I understand you, Conger said. I mean, I understand this part, about the chance. But how can a man who has been dead two centuries be... I'll explain later, the speaker said. Right now, we have to hurry. The soldier had gone out with the bones, wrapped in a blanket held carefully in his arms. The speaker walked to the door. Come, they've already discovered that we've broken in here, and they'll be coming at any moment. They hurried down the damp steps to the waiting car. A second later, the driver lifted the car up into the air above the housetops. The speaker settled back in the seat. The first church has an interesting past, he said. I suppose you are familiar with it, but I'd like to speak of a few points that are of relevancy to us. It was the 20th century that the movement began, during one of the periodic wars. The movement developed rapidly, feeding on the general sense of futility, the realization that war was breeding greater war with no end in sight. The movement posed a simple answer to the problem. Without military preparations, weapons, there could be no war, and without machinery and complex scientific technocracy, there could be no weapons. The movement preached that you couldn't stop war by planning for it. They preached that man was losing to his machinery and science, that it was getting away from him, pushing him into greater and greater wars. Down with society, they shouted. Down with factories and science. 
A few more wars, and there wouldn't be much left of the world. The founder was an obscure person from a small town in the American Middle West. We don't even know his name. All we know is that one day he appeared, preaching a doctrine of nonviolence, non-resistance, no fighting, no paying taxes for guns, no research except for medicine, live out your life quietly, tending your garden, staying out of public affairs, mind your own business. Be obscure, unknown, poor. Give away most of your possessions. Leave the city. At least that was what developed from what he told people. The car dropped down and landed on a roof. The founder preached this doctrine, or the germ of it. There's no telling how much the faithful have added themselves. The local authorities picked him up at once, of course. Apparently they were convinced that he meant it. He was never released. He was put to death and his body buried secretly. It seemed that the cult was finished. The speaker smiled. Unfortunately, some of his disciples reported seeing him after the date of his death. The rumor spread. He had conquered death. He was divine. It took hold, grew. And here we are today with the first church, obstructing all social progress, destroying society, sowing the seeds of anarchy. But the wars, Conger said, about them. The wars? Well, there was no more war. <laughs> it must be acknowledged that the elimination of war was the direct result of nonviolence practiced on a general scale. But we can take a more objective view of war today. What was so terrible about it? War had a profound selective value, perfectly in accord with the teachings of Darwin and Mendel and others. Without war, the mass of useless and competent mankind, without training or intelligence, is permitted to grow and expand unchecked. War acted to reduce their numbers. Like storms and earthquakes and droughts, it was nature's way of eliminating the unfit. Without war, the lower elements of mankind have increased all out of proportion. They threaten the educated few, those with scientific knowledge and training, the ones equipped to direct society. They have no regard for science or scientific society based on reason, and this movement seeks to aid and abet them. Only when scientists are in full control can the... He looked at his watch and kicked the door open. I'll tell you the rest as we walk. They crossed the dark roof. Doubtless you know now whom these bones belong to, who it is we are after. He has been dead just two centuries now, this ignorant man from the Middle West, this founder... The tragedy is that the authorities of the time acted too slowly. They allowed him to speak, to get his message across. He was allowed to preach, to start his cult. And once such a thing is underway, there's no stopping it. But what if he had died before he preached? What if none of his doctrines had ever been spoken? It took only a moment for him to utter them, that we know. They say he spoke just once just one time. Then the authorities came, taking him away. He offered no resistance. The incident was small. The speaker turned to Conger. Small, but we're reaping the consequences of it today. They went inside the building. Inside, the soldiers had already laid out the skeleton on a table. The soldiers stood around it, their young faces intense. Conger went over to the table, pushing past them. He bent down, staring at the bones. So these are his remains, he murmured, the founder. The church has hidden them for two centuries. Quite so, the speaker said. But now we have them. Come along down the hall. They went across the room to a door. The speaker pushed it open. Technicians looked up. Conger saw machinery, whirring and turring, benches and retorts. In the center of the room was a gleaming crystal cage. The speaker handed a slim gun to Conger. The important thing to remember is that the skull be saved and brought back, for comparison and proof. Aim low, at the chest. Conger weighed the gun in his hands. It feels good, he said. I know this gun. That is, I've seen them before but I never used one. The speaker nodded. You will be instructed on the use of the gun and the operation of the cage. 
you will be given all data we have on the time and the location. The exact spot was a place called Hudson's Field, about 1960 in a small community outside Denver, Colorado. And don't forget, the only means of identification you will have is the skull. There are visible characteristics of the front teeth, especially the left incisor. Conger listened absently. He was watching two men in white carefully wrapping the skull in a plastic bag. They tied it and carried it to the crystal cage. And if I should make a mistake? Pick the wrong man? Then go find the right one. Don't come back until you succeed in reaching this founder. And you can't wait for him to start speaking. That is what we must avoid. You must act in advance. Take chances. Shoot as soon as you think you've found him. He'll be someone unusual, probably a stranger in the area. Apparently he wasn't known. Conger listened dimly. Do you think you have it all now? The speaker asked. Yes, I think so. Conger entered the crystal cage and sat down, placing his hands on the wheel. Good luck, the speaker said. We'll be awaiting the outcome. There's some philosophical doubt as to whether one can alter the past. This should answer the question once and for all. Conger fingered the controls of the cage. By the way, the speaker said, don't try to use this cage for purposes not anticipated in your job. We have a constant trace on it. If we want it back, we can get it back. Good luck. Conger said nothing. The cage was sealed. He raised his finger and touched the wheel control. He turned the wheel carefully. He was still staring at the plastic bag when the room outside vanished. For a long time, there was nothing at all. Nothing beyond the crystal mesh of the cage. Thoughts rushed through Conger's mind, helter-skelter. How would he know the man? How could he be certain in advance? What had he looked like? What was his name? How had he acted before he spoke? Would he be an ordinary person or some strange outlandish crank? Conger picked up the slum gun and held it against his chest. The metal of the gun was cool and smooth. He practiced moving the sight. It was a beautiful gun, the kind of gun he could fall in love with. If he had owned such a gun in the Martian desert, on the long nights when he had lain cramped and numbed with cold, waiting for things that moved through the darkness. He put the gun down and adjusted the meter readings of the cage. The spiraling mist was beginning to condense and settle. All at once, forms wavered and fluttered around him. Colors, sounds, movements filtered through the crystal wire. He clamped the controls off and stood up. He was on a ridge overlooking a small town. It was high noon. The air was crisp and bright. A few automobiles moved along a road. Off in the distance were some level fields. Conger went to the door and stepped outside. He sniffed the air. Then he went back into the cage. He stood before the mirror over the shelf, examining his features. He had trimmed his beard. They had not got him to cut it off. And his hair was neat. He was dressed in the clothing of the middle 20th century, the odd collar and coat, the shoes of animal hide. In his pocket was money of the times. That was important. And nothing more was needed. Nothing except his ability, his special cunning but he had never used it in such a way before. He walked down the road toward the town. The first things he noticed were the newspapers on the stands. April 5th, 1961. He was not too far off. He looked around him. There was a filling station, a garage, some taverns, and a 10-cent store. Down the street was a grocery store and some public buildings. A few minutes later, he mounted the stairs of the little public library and passed through the doors into the warm interior. The librarian stood up, smiling. Good afternoon, she said. He smiled, not speaking because his words would not be correct, accented and strange, probably. He went over to a table and sat down by a heap of magazines. For a moment, he glanced through them. Then he was on his feet again. He crossed the room to a wide rack against the wall. His heart began to beat heavily. Newspapers, weeks on end. 
He took a roll of them over to the table and began to scan them quickly. The print was odd, the letters strange. Some of the words were unfamiliar. He sat the papers aside and searched further. At last he found what he wanted. He carried the Cherrywood Gazette to the table and opened it to the first page. He found what he wanted. Prisoner hangs self. An unidentified man held by the county sheriff's office for suspicion of criminal syndicalism was found dead this morning by... He finished the item. It was vague, uninforming. He needed more. He carried the gazette back to the racks and then, after a moment's hesitation, approached the librarian. More, he asked. More papers. Old ones? She frowned. How old? Which papers? Months old. And before. Of the gazette? This is all we have. What did you want? What are you looking for? Maybe I can help you. He was silent. You might find older issues at the Gazette office, the woman said, taking off her glasses. Why don't you try there? But if you'd tell me, maybe I can help you. He went out. The Gazette office was down a side street. The sidewalk was broken and cracked. He went inside. A heater glowed in the corner of the small office. A heavy-set man stood up and came slowly over to the counter. "'What did you want, mister?' he said. "'Old papers. A month or more. "'To buy? You, you want to buy them?' "'Yes.' He held out some of the money he had. The man stared. "'Sure,' he said. "'Sure, wait a minute.' He went quickly out of the room. When he came back, he was staggering under the weight of his armload, his face red. Here are some, he grunted. Took what I could find. Covers the whole year. And if you want more... Conger carried the papers outside. He sat down by the road and began to go through them. What he wanted was four months back, in December. It was a tiny item, so small that he almost missed it. His hands trembled as he scanned it using the small dictionary for some of the archaic terms. Man arrested for unlicensed demonstration. An unidentified man who refused to give his name was picked up in Cooper Creek by special agents of the sheriff's office, according to Sheriff Duff. It was said that the man was recently noticed in the area and had been watched continually. It was Cooper Creek, December 1960. His heart pounded. That was all he needed to know. He stood up, shaking himself, stamping his feet on the cold ground. The sun had moved across the sky to the very edge of the hills. He smiled. Already he had discovered the exact time and place. Now he needed only to go back, perhaps to November, to Cooper Creek. He walked through the main section of town, past the library, past the grocery store. It would not be hard. The hard part was over. He would go there, rent a room, prepare to wait until the man appeared. He turned the corner. A woman was coming out of a doorway, loaded down with packages. Conger stepped aside to let her pass. The woman glanced at him. Suddenly, her face turned white. She stared, her mouth open. Conger hurried on. He looked back. What was wrong with her? The woman was still staring. She had dropped the packages to the ground. He increased his speed. He turned a second corner and went up a side street. When he looked back again, the woman had come to the entrance of the street and was starting after him. A man joined her, and the two of them began to run toward him. He lost them and left the town, striding quickly, easily, up to the hills at the edge of town. When he reached the cage, he stopped. What had happened? Was it something about his clothing? His dress? He pondered. Then as the sun set, he stepped into the cage. Conger sat before the wheel. For a moment he waited, his hands resting lightly on the control. Then he turned the wheel, just a little, following the control readings carefully. The grayness settled down around him, but not for very long. The man looked him over critically. You better come inside, he said, out of the cold. Thanks. 
Conker went gratefully through the open door into the living room. It was warm and close from the heat of the little kerosene heater in the corner. A woman, large and shapeless in her flowered dress, came from the kitchen. She and the man studied him critically. It's a good room, the woman said. I'm Mrs. Appleton. It's got heat. You need that this time of year. Yes, he nodded, looking around. You want to eat with us? What? You want to eat with us? The man's brows knitted. You're not a foreigner, are you, mister? No, he smiled. I was born in this country. Quite far west, though. California? No, he hesitated. In Oregon. What's it like up there? Mrs. Appleton asked. I hear there's lots of trees and green. It's so bare in here. I come from Chicago myself. That's the Middle West, the man said to her. You ain't no foreigner. Oregon isn't foreign either, Conger said. It's part of the United States. The man nodded absently. He was staring at Conger's clothing. That's a funny suit you got on, mister, he said. Where'd you get that? Conger was lost. He shifted uneasily. It's a good suit he said. Maybe I better go some other place, if you don't want me here. They both raised their hands protestingly. The woman smiled at him. We just have to look out for those reds. You know, the government is always warning us about them. The reds? He was puzzled. The government says they're all around. We're supposed to report anything strange or unusual. Anybody doesn't act normal. Like me? They looked embarrassed. Well, he don't look like a red to me, the man said, but we have to be careful. The Tribune says... Conger half listened. It was going to be easier than he had thought. Clearly, he would know as soon as the founder appeared. These people, so suspicious of anything different, would be buzzing and gossiping and spreading the story. All he had to do was lie low and listen, down at the general store perhaps, or even here in Mrs. Appleton's boarding house. Can I see the room? He said. Certainly. Mrs. Appleton went to the stairs. I'll be glad to show it to you. They went upstairs. It was colder upstairs, but not nearly as cold as outside, nor as cold as the nights on the Martian deserts. For that, he was grateful. He was walking slowly around the store, looking at the cans of vegetables, the frozen packages of fish and meats shining and clean in the open refrigerator counters. Ed Davies came toward him. "'Can I help you?' he said. The man was a little oddly dressed, and with a beard. Ed couldn't stop smiling. "'Nothing,' the man said in a funny voice. "'Just looking.' "'Sure,' Ed said. He walked back behind the counter. Mrs. Hackett was wheeling her cart up. "'Who's he?' she whispered, her sharp face turned, her nose moving, as if it were sniffing. I've never seen him before. I don't know. Looks funny to me. Why does he wear a beard? No one else wears a beard. Must be something the matter with him. Maybe he likes to wear a beard. I know an uncle who... Wait, Mrs. Hackett stiffened. Didn't that... What's his name? The Red, that old one. Didn't he have a beard? Marx. He had a beard. Ed laughed. This isn't Karl Marx. I saw a photograph of him once. Mrs. Hackett was staring at him. You did? Sure, he flushed a little. What's the matter with that? I'd sure like to know more about him, Mrs. Hackett said. I think we ought to know more, for our own good. Hey, mister, want a ride? Conger turned quickly, dropping his hand to his belt. He relaxed. Two young kids in a car, a girl and a boy. He smiled at them. A ride? Sure. Conger got into the car and closed the door. Bill Willett pushed the gas and the car roared down the highway. I appreciate a ride, Conger said carefully. I was taking a walk between towns, but it was farther than I thought. 
Where are you from? Laura Hunt asked. She was pretty, small and dark in her yellow sweater and blue skirt. From Cooper Creek. Cooper Creek? Bill said. He frowned. That's funny. I don't remember seeing you before. Why, do you come from there? I was born there. I know everybody there. I just moved in from Oregon. From Oregon? I didn't know Oregon people had accents. Do I have an accent? You use words funny. How? I don't know, doesn't he, Laura? You slur them, Laura said, smiling. Talk some more. I'm interested in dialects. She glanced at him, white teeth. Conker felt his heart constrict. I have a speech impediment. Oh, her eyes widened. I'm sorry. They looked at him curiously as the car purred along. Conger, for his part, was struggling to find some way of asking them questions without seeming curious. I guess people from out of town don't come here much, he said. Strangers? No, Bill shook his head. Not very much. I'll bet I'm the first outsider for a long time. I guess so. Conger hesitated. A friend of mine... Someone I know might be coming through here. Where do you suppose I might? He stopped. Would there be anyone certain to see him? Someone I could ask, maybe make sure I don't miss him if he comes? They were puzzled. Just keep your eyes open. Cooper Creek isn't very big. No, that's right. They drove in silence. Conger studied the outline of the girl. Probably she was the boy's mistress. Perhaps she was his trial wife. Or had they developed trial marriage back so far? He could not remember. But surely such an attractive girl would be someone's mistress by this time. She would be 16 or so by her looks. He might ask her sometime, if they ever meet again. The next day, Conger went walking along the main street of Cooper Creek. He passed the general store, the two filling stations, and then the post office. At the corner was the soda fountain. He stopped. Laura was sitting inside, talking to the clerk. She was laughing, rocking back and forth. Conger pushed the door open. Warm air rushed around him. Laura was drinking hot chocolate with whipped cream. She looked up in surprise as he slid into the seat beside her. I beg your pardon he said. Am I intruding? No, she shook her head. Her eyes were large and dark. Not at all. The clerk came over. What do you want? Conger looked at the chocolate. Same as she has. Laura was watching Conger, her arms folded, elbows on the counter. She smiled at him. By the way, you don't know my name. Laura Hunt. She was holding out her hand. He took it awkwardly, not knowing what to do with it. Conger is my name, he murmured. Conger? Is that your last or first name? Last or first, he hesitated. Last, Omar Conger. Omar, she laughed. That's like the poet, Omar Khayyam. I don't know of him. I know very little of poets. We restored very few works of art. Usually only the church has been interested enough. He broke off. She was staring. He flushed. Where I come from, he finished. The church? Which church do you mean? The church. He was confused. The chocolate came and he began to sip it gratefully. Laura was still watching him. You're an unusual person, she said. Bill didn't like you, but he never likes anything different. He's so, so prosaic. Don't you think when a person gets older, he should become broadened in his outlook? Conger nodded. He says foreign people ought to stay where they belong, not come here. 
but you're not so foreign. He means Orientals, you know. Conger nodded. The screen door opened behind them. Bill came into the room. He stared at them. Well, he said. Conger turned. Hello. Well, Bill sat down. Hello, Laura. He was looking at Conger. I didn't expect to see you here. Conger tensed. He could feel the hostility of the boy. Something wrong with that? No, nothing wrong with it. There was a silence. Suddenly, Bill turned to Laura. Come on, let's go. Go? She was astonished. Why? Just go, he grabbed her hand. Come on, the car's outside. Why, Bill Willett, Laura said. You're jealous. Who is this guy? Bill said. Do you know anything about him? Look at him. His beard? She flared. So what? Just because he doesn't drive a Packard and go to Cooper High? Conger sized the boy up. He was big. Big and strong. Probably he was part of some civil control organization. Sorry, Conger said. I'll go. What is your business in town? Bill asked. What are you doing here? Why are you hanging around Laura? Conger looked at the girl. He shrugged. No reason. I'll see you later. He turned away and froze. Bill had moved. Conker's fingers went to his belt. Half pressure, he whispered to himself. No more. Half pressure. He squeezed. The room leaped around him. He himself was protected by the lining of his clothing, the plastic sheathing inside. My God! Laura put her hands up. Conger cursed. He hadn't meant any of it for her, but it would wear off. There was only a half amp to it. It would tingle. Tingle and paralyze. He walked out the door without looking back. He was almost to the corner when Bill came slowly out, holding onto the wall like a drunken man. Conger went on. As Conger walked, restless in the night, a form loomed in front of him. He stopped, holding his breath. Who is it? A man's voice came. Conger waited, tense. Who is it? The man said again. He clicked something in his hand. A light flashed. Conger moved. It's me, he said. Who is me? Conger is my name. I'm staying at the Appleton's place. Who are you? The man came slowly up to him. He was wearing a leather jacket. There was a gun at his waist. I'm Sheriff Duff. I think you're the person I want to talk to. You were in Bloom's today, about three o'clock? Bloom's? The fountain, where the kids hang out. Duff came up beside him, shining his light into Conger's face. Conger blinked. Turn that thing away, he said. A pause. All right. The light flickered to the ground. You were there. Some trouble broke out between you and the Willet boy. Is that right? You had beef over this girl? We had a discussion, Conger said carefully. Then what happened? Why? I'm just curious. They say you did something. Did something? Did what? I don't know. That's what I'm wondering. They saw a flash and something seemed to happen. They all blacked out, couldn't move. How are they now? All right. There was silence. Well, Duff said, what was it? A bomb? A bomb? Conger laughed. No, my cigarette lighter caught fire. There was a leak, and the fluid ignited. Why did they all pass out? Fumes. Silence. Conger shifted, waiting. His fingers moved slowly toward his belt. The sheriff glanced down. He grunted. If you say so, he said. Anyhow, there wasn't any real harm done. He stepped back from Conger. And that will it is a troublemaker. Good night, then, Conger said. 
he started past the sheriff. One more thing, Mr. Conger, before you go. You don't mind if I look at your identification, do you? No, not at all. Conger reached into his pocket. He held his wallet out. The sheriff took it and shined his flashlight on it. Conger watched, breathing slowly. They had worked hard on the wallet, studying historic documents, relics of the times, all the papers they felt would be relevant. Duff handed it back. Okay, sorry to bother you. The light winked off. When Conger reached the house, he found the Appleton sitting around the television set. They did not look up as he came in. He lingered at the door. Can I ask you something? He said. Mrs. Appleton turned slowly. Can I ask you, what's the date? The date? She studied him. The first of December. December 1st? Why, it was just November. They were all looking at him. Suddenly he remembered. In the 20th century, they still used the old 12-month system. November fed directly into December. There was no quarter timber in between. He gasped. Then it was tomorrow, the 2nd of December, tomorrow. Thanks, he said. Thanks. He went up the stairs. What a fool he was, forgetting. The founder had been taken into captivity on the 2nd of December, according to the newspaper records. Tomorrow, only 12 hours hence, the founder would appear to speak to the people and then be dragged away. The day was warm and bright. Conger's shoes crunched the melting crest of snow. On he went through the trees, heavy with white. He climbed a hill and strolled down to the other side, sliding as he went. He stopped to look around. Everything was silent. There was no one in sight. He brought a thin rod from his waist and turned the handle of it. For a moment, nothing happened. Then there was a shimmering in the air. The crystal cage appeared and settled slowly down. Conger sighed. It was good to see it again. After all, it was his only way back. He walked up on the ridge. He looked around with some satisfaction, his hands on his hips. Hudson's field was spread out, all the way to the beginning of the town. It was bare and flat, covered with a thin layer of snow. Here the founder would come. Here he would speak to them. And here the authorities would take him. Only he would be dead before they came. He would be dead before he even spoke. Conger returned to the crystal globe. He pushed through the door and stepped inside. He took the slim gun from the shelf and screwed the bolt into place. It was ready to go, ready to fire. For a moment he considered. Should he have it with him? No. It might be hours before the founder came, and suppose someone approached him in the meantime. When he saw the founder coming toward the field, then he could go and get the gun. Conger looked toward the shelf. There was the neat plastic package. He took it down and unwrapped it. He held the skull in his hands, turning it over. In spite of himself, a cold feeling rushed through him. This was the man's skull, the skull of the founder, who was still alive, who would come here this day, who would stand on the field not fifty yards away. What if he could see this, his own skull, yellow and eroded, two centuries old? Would he still speak? Would he speak if he could see it, the grinning, aged skull? What would there be for him to say, to tell the people? What message could he bring? What action would not be futile when a man could look upon his own aged, yellow skull? Better they should enjoy their temporary lives while they still had them to enjoy. A man who could hold his own skull in his hands would believe in few causes, few movements. Rather, he would preach the opposite. A sound. Conker dropped the skull back on the shelf and took up the gun. Outside, something was moving. He went quickly to the door, his heart beating. Was it he? Was it the founder wandering by himself in the cold? looking for a place to speak? Was he meditating over his words, choosing his sentences? 
What if he could see what Conger had held? He pushed the door open, the gun raised. Laura. He stared at her. She was dressed in a wool jacket and boots, her hands in her pockets. A cloud of steam came from her mouth and nostrils. Her breast was rising and falling. Silently, they looked at each other. At last, Conger lowered the gun. What is it, he said. What are you doing here? She pointed. She did not seem able to speak. He frowned. What was wrong with her? What is it, he said. What do you want? He looked at the direction she had pointed. I don't see anything. They're coming. They? Who? Who are coming? They are. The police. During the night, the sheriff had the state police send cars. All around. Everywhere. Blocking the roads. There's about 60 of them coming. Some from town, some around behind. She stopped, gasping. They said... They said... What? They said you were some kind of a communist? They said... Conger went to the cage. He put the gun down on the shelf and came back out. He leaped down and went to the girl. Thanks. You came here to tell me. You don't believe it. I don't know. Did you come alone? No, Joe brought me in his truck from town. Joe, who's he? Joe French, the plumber. He's a friend of Dad's. Let's go. They crossed the snow up the ridge and onto the field. The little panel truck was parked halfway across the field. A heavy, short man was sitting behind the wheel, smoking his pipe. He sat up as he saw the two of them coming toward him. Are you the one? He said to Conger. Yes, thanks for warning me. The plumber shrugged. I don't know anything about this. Laura says you're all right. He turned around. It might interest you to know some more of them are coming. Not to warn you, just curious. More of them. Conger looked toward the town. Black shapes were picking their way across the snow. People from town, you can't keep this sort of thing quiet. Not in a small town. We all listened to the police radio. They heard the same way Laura did. Someone tuned in, spread it all around. The shapes were getting closer. Conquer could make out a couple of them. Bill Willett was there with some boys from high school. The Appletons were along, hanging back in the rear. Even Ed Davies. Conger murmured. The storekeeper was toiling onto the field, with three or four other men from around the town. All curious as hell, French said. Well, I guess I'm going back to town. I don't want my truck shot full of holes. Come on, Laura. She was looking up at Conger, wide-eyed. Come on, French said again. Let's go. You sure as hell can't stay here, you know. Why? There may be shooting. That's what they all came to see. You know that, don't you, Conger? Yes. You have a gun? <laughs> or don't you care? French smiled a little. They picked up a lot of people in their time, you know. You won't be lonely. He cared, all right. He had to stay here on the field. He couldn't afford to let them take him away. Any minute the founder would appear, would step onto the field. Would he be one of the townsmen, standing silently at the foot of the field, waiting, watching? Or maybe he was Joe French, or maybe he was one of the cops. Any one of them might find himself moved to speak, and the few words spoken this day are going to be important for a long time. And Conger had to be there, ready when the first word was uttered. I care, he said. You go on back to town. Take the girl with you. Laura got stiffly in beside Joe French. The plumber started up the motor. Look at them standing there, he said, like vultures, waiting to see someone get killed. The truck drove away, Laura sitting stiff and silent, frightened now. Conger watched for a moment, then he dashed back into the woods between the trees toward the ridge. He could get away, of course. Any time he wanted to, he could get away. 
All he had to do was leap into the crystal cage and turn the handles. But he had a job, an important job. He had to be here, here at this place, at this time. He reached the cage and opened the door. He went inside and picked up the gun from the shelf. The slim gun would take care of them. He notched it up to full count. The chain reaction from it would flatten them all. The police, the curious, sadistic people. They wouldn't take him. Before they got him, all of them would be dead. He would get away. He would escape. By the end of the day, they would all be dead if that was what they wanted. And he... He saw the skull. Suddenly, he put the gun down. He picked up the skull. He turned the skull over. He looked at the teeth. And then he went to the mirror. He held the skull up, looking in the mirror. He pressed the skull against his cheek. Beside his own face, the grinning skull leered back at him. Beside his skull, against his living flesh. He bared his teeth, and he knew. It was his own skull that he held. It was... He was the one who would die. He was the founder. After a time, he put the skull down. For a few minutes, he stood at the controls, playing with them idly. He could hear the sound of motors outside, the muffled noise of men. Should he go back to the present, where the speaker waited? He could escape, of course. Escape. He turned toward the skull. There it was, his skull, yellow with age. Escape. Escape when he had held it in his own hands. What did it matter if he put it off a month, a year, ten years, even fifty? Time was nothing. He had sipped chocolate with the girl born 150 years before his time. Escape? For a little while, perhaps. But he could not really escape, no more so than anyone else had ever escaped, or ever would. Only he had held it in his hands, his own bones, his own death's head. They had not. He went out to the door, across the field, empty-handed. There were a lot of them standing around, gathered together, waiting. They expected a good fight. They knew he had something. They had heard about the incident at the fountain. And there were plenty of police police with guns and tear gas creeping across the hills and ridges between the trees closer and closer. It was an old story in this century. One of the men tossed something at him. It fell in the snow by his feet. He looked down. It was a rock. He smiled. Come on, one of them called. Don't you have any bombs? Throw a bomb, you with the beard, throw a bomb. Let him have it. Toss a few bombs. They began to laugh. He smiled. He put his hands to his hips. They suddenly turned silent, seeing that he was going to speak. I'm sorry, he said simply. I don't have any bombs. You're mistaken. There was a flurry of murmuring. I have a gun he went on, a very good one, made by science even more advanced than your own. But I'm not going to use that either. They were puzzled. Why not? Someone called. At the edge of the group, an older woman was watching. He felt a sudden shock. He had seen her before. Where? He remembered. The day at the library. As he turned the corner, he had seen her. She had noticed him and been astonished. At the time, he did not understand why. Conger grinned. So he would escape death. The man who right now was voluntarily accepting it. They were laughing, laughing at a man who had a gun but didn't use it. But by a strange twist of science, he would appear again a few months later after his bones had been buried in the floor of a jail. And so, in a fashion, he would escape death. He would die, but then, after a period of months, he would live again, briefly, for an afternoon. An afternoon, yet long enough for them to see him, to understand that he was still alive, 
to know that somehow he had returned to life. And then, finally, he would appear once more. After 200 years had passed, two centuries later, he would be born again, born, as a matter of fact, in a small trading village on Mars. He would grow up, learning to hunt and trade. A police car came to the edge of the field and stopped. The people retreated a little. Conger raised his hands. I have an odd paradox for you, he said. Those who take lives will lose their own. Those who kill will die. But he who gives his own life away will live again. They laughed, faintly, nervously. The police were coming out, walking toward him. He smiled. He had said everything he intended to say. It was a good little paradox he had coined. They would puzzle over it, remember it. Smiling, Conger awaited a death foreordained. End of The Skull by Philip K. Dick Recording by Anonymous Zero Hour by Alexander Blade This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eric Kim Zero Hour by Alexander Blade Dad had already gone when Bobby got up. This disappointed Bobby a little, but then he remembered. This was the big day. Naturally, Dad would get over to the project early, and at four o'clock, Bobby shivered deliciously at the thought of it. He ate his breakfast in silence, with Mom across the table drinking a cup of coffee and looking at a fashion catalog. He was glad she was occupied because he didn't want to talk. Not today he didn't. Might spill something secret. Might even let out the big secret. That would be terrible. Of course, all things were secret at Buffalo Flats. So secret top scientists like Dad didn't even discuss them with wives like Mom. And wives like Mom never asked. So it was really something to sit there eating breakfast knowing that today, Dad was going to rocket to the moon. And with Mom not even knowing the lunar project was in the works, so naturally not dreaming that he was going with Dad, the thrill was overpowering. Maybe they would have radio communication after they got there, and he would call back and say, Hello, Mom. Guess where I am? On the moon with Dad. And Mom would say, Why, Bobby? Scaring me to death like this. I was looking all over for you. Sounding very angry, but not being really angry after all, because maybe Dad would cut in and say, Yeah, he's right here with me, dear. What do you think of this boy of ours? Bobby gulped the last of his cereal so he could go outside and wiggle for joy. As he got up from his chair, Mom said, And what's your plan for today, young man? Davy Crockett or Buck Rogers? Bobby had a quick thought. A sudden temptation. Why not give Mom a hint? Why, he could even tell her and she wouldn't know. Then, later after he was gone, she would remember back and say, That boy... When he tells you something, he really means it. Bobby smiled and said, I think I'll go to the moon today. Mom smiled too and went back to her fashions. Well, see to it, your fuel mixture is correct. I'll check it, and Mom, I might not be home for lunch. Where will you be? Oh, I don't know. Well, mind your manners and say thank you when you leave. Mrs. Kendall, still smiling, watched Bobby dash out into the yard. Living on a restricted government area had one compensation at least. You didn't have to worry about your children. Four dozen families, all with offspring, trapped behind ten-foot patrolled vents. Here, nobody worried about their children. They came and went, and at noon, a mother fed whatever number happened to be in the house at the time. Mrs. Kendall usually drew six or seven. It would be a relief to don the chore for one Saturday. Out in the backyard, Bobby fussed around his space rocket a little, tightening a screw here, hammering in a nail there, just until he could slip away without Mom noticing his direction. It wasn't a bad rocket at that, he thought. Six feet long with two seats and a keen instrument panel. 
but kid stuff, of course. After he found the way in through the sewer, he hadn't paid any more attention to his own ship. He could see Mom through the window, back in her book, so he went casually out through the back gate and turned left, kicking at pebbles as he sauntered along and trying to look as though he had no place to go. Had to be careful, didn't want to bump into any of the other kids today either. The way in through the sewer was at a place behind Laboratory B. There was a kind of an alley there that nobody ever walked through, and then this round lid you could lift up and look under, and a ladder you could climb down. Bobby hadn't dared go down at first, but after thinking about it overnight, his curiosity won out and he went back and ducked down into the lower level. He called it a sewer because of sewers being underground, but this place was clean and had bunches of wires strung in every direction and faint little lights you could see by. Bobby went further and further every trip he took, never telling anybody because you weren't supposed to talk about things at Buffalo Flats, not even to the other kids. Then he found the big drone where they were building the rocket. It was so sleek and beautiful and shiny that he just stared at it, up through the grating in the floor that was for air circulation or something. He didn't know it was the moon rocket at first. Not until he'd gone back several times to peek up at it, and then one day, two scientists came walking along right in front of his nose. One of them was Dad. Bobby almost called out, but he caught himself and just listened to them talking. This was the first time his conscience bothered him about going underneath the drone. He thought about it a lot, whether it was the right thing to do. And while he was never able to still his conscience completely, he quieted down by saying he really wasn't doing any harm because he never told anybody what he saw. He learned the rocket was going to the moon by listening to Dad and the other scientists talk when they thought that they were alone. And it was funny, because even there they spoke in low voices and didn't give too much away. He had known now for three days that at four o'clock the roof would open and the drone would be turned into a blast pit and the rocket would shoot out through space to the moon. That was all he did know for sure. None of the men had said who was going on the first trip to the moon. Nothing had been said on that subject at all, but Bobby knew Dad would go. He would have to. After all, Dad was the second biggest scientist at Buffalo Flats. Second only to Schleimer himself, and Professor Schleimer was very old and certainly wouldn't make the trip. That left Dad. Dad would just have to go in order to run the rocket. There probably wasn't anybody else smart enough in the whole place. The idea of going himself had been born the previous day, when he found a larger grating in the floor near the rocket and realized if he was very careful, he could climb out of the sewer and duck into the rocket when nobody was looking. Once inside, he was pretty sure he'd find a place to hide until blast off. All the men would probably be strapped in bunks, but if he found a place he could wedge himself in, he didn't think he'd get hurt. Then, halfway to the moon, he would come out and find Dad, and he would be surprised. At first, thinking about it, he'd been scared, but after he realized how proud Dad and Mom would be, he made up his mind. Now, crouched beside the grating near the ship, he waited while two men, technicians in white overalls, walked by. One of them said, Well, whatever happens, she'll make a big splash. You said it. Hope the brains know what they're doing. That made Bobby mad. Who said Dad didn't know what he was doing? Dad was just about the smartest scientist in the world. After the two men left, he waited a long time. He heard voices, but no one came in sight. Taking a deep breath, he opened the grating and got out. It was only four steps to the open port of the rocket. There was a little ramp they'd used to roll things in, and Bobby's feet touched it but lightly as he jumped into the ship. He found himself in some kind of a storeroom. It would be a good place to hide, all right. It was full of aluminum barrels all the same size. He found a space between two rows and sat down and got his breath back. It was very quiet around him, scary quiet, but he set his lips firmly. He was going to the moon with Dad. John Kendall was a little late that night. He kissed his wife and said, Well, did you see the big skyrocket? How could I miss it, darling? Your supper's in the oven. I could use a martini first. Coming right up. 
While Mira fixed the drink, John lay back in his easy chair and closed his eyes. We'd hoped to stage a little ceremony at the launching, but Washington said no. The Russians? The Eastern Coalition. It was a race. That was why it had to be so secret. Washington said, light the fuse and fire the thing. Is it still hush-hush? No, not between us at least. We fired an explosion rocket at the moon. It'll hit in about an hour and telescopes will show a big purple spot where our explosives go off and throw dye all over the place. Mira handed him a dry martini. I see, lots of fun no doubt, but what's the purpose? Fourth of July on the moon? Oh no, if the experiment is a success, the next rocket will carry men instead of a bomb. Mira went to the kitchen to see about supper. John called, Where's Bobby? In bed, I suppose? Mira didn't hear and John set his drink down and moved toward the bedroom. Maybe he was still awake. Bobby rolled over. His eyes popped open. Dad, I thought you went to... John Kendall sat down on the edge of the bed and tussled his son's hair. No, son, it's just the old terra firma for me. Did you see the rocket blast? Uh Uh-huh. It was really something. It went to the moon, didn't it? That's right. Kendall smiled and thought. Try to keep a secret from the kids. It just can't be done. How's your moon rocket coming along, son? Pretty good. Gee, Dad, as long as you didn't go, I'm glad I didn't go either. You were planning to make the trip also? Uh Uh-huh. I got into the rocket and was all set, but I got to thinking about Mom. How one of us should stay and take care of her in case anything happened? Smart thinking, son. Now you get to sleep. I'll have a little time tomorrow. We'll play some ball. That would be keen. John Kendall smiled as he left the bedroom. Kids were wonderful. Give them a few old boards and a steering wheel, and they could build a ship to fly to the moon. What a wonderful dream world they lived in. Too bad they had to grow out of it. End of Zero Hour by Alexander Blade Crash Beam by John Barrett This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. Dan Kearns, sick and shaking, could already hear them talk. Yeah, come in on the Kearns beam. It's a new way to die. Crash Beam by John Barrett It happened so fast that for a minute he just stood there absolutely incapable of taking it in. One instant the big Earth-Venus rocket freighter was sizzling through the fog to a perfect landing on the field below. Then suddenly she dipped, undershot the field, and vanished in a flash and a thundering explosion that shook the observation tower. In the dreamlike quiet that followed, Dan Kearns heard the faint yells of the landing crew. He saw the big searchlight switch on, cutting wide swaths of light through the boiling fog. Tiny white-coated medics crossed the patches of light, running frantically. Dan sat down in the chair feeling sick and very tired. Then the door of the tower room opened, and Rollins, the supervisor, stepped in. All right, Kearns, he said curtly. You're through. And if anybody asks me about your ability as an electronics engineer, I'll write out the blackest recommendation I can think of. Dan got up slowly. How many were killed? Two, Rollins glared. Two of my best pilots. Dan's shoulders stiffened. Listen, Rollins, I'm just as interested as you in breaking Rome's monopoly on Earth-Venus rockets. Get out! I can't get out. Don't forget you have another rocket due in twenty minutes. A passenger rocket. Rollins' face went pale. My God! I'd forgotten! He threw up his hands. Turn him back! he shrieked. Send him back to Earth! 
It's suicide to land on that guide beam. I can't send them back to Earth, Dan said quietly. They haven't enough fuel. Then send them to one of Rome's fields. It's an admission of complete defeat, but we can't kill them. Dan swallowed. You forget that Rome uses invisible light for landing, not ultra short waves. Anyway, do you think Rome would miss such a chance to crash one of our rockets? Rollins sat down with a groan. Where in thunder did I ever get the idea we could bring in ships through the magnetic murk on ultra short waves? Dan lifted his head. There's nothing the matter with my guide beam. It brought in the experimental rocket yesterday, and magnetic conditions were even worse. I see. The smile on Rollins' lined face was cynical. In other words, you're going to pass the buck to Stevens, your control room operator. The door of the observation room swung open, and a wild-eyed mechanic burst in. Mr. Rollins, the control room is still locked. Stevens is sitting in front of the table, and he won't answer us. Dan tore down the steps and across the catwalk, two steps ahead of Rollins. He hammered on the door. Through the thick glass he could see Stevens, hunched over the lighted control table. Stevens! Stevens! he turned to Rollins. We'll have to cut the lock, get a torch, and get a doctor. It took a minute with the high torch before they crashed into the room. He's been dead several minutes, the doctor said as he took his hand from Stephen's forehead. I'm sorry, Kearns, Rollins said. He looked at the doctor. Well, I guess that explains everything. He must have lost control just as she was coming in. What was it? Heart attack? The doctor shook his head. Some sort of convulsion. Muscles violently contracted. Funny he didn't fall to the floor. Must have affected the whole nervous system. Even the eye pupils are down to pinpoints. He looked around at Rollins. I may be sticking my neck out, sir, but offhand I'd say Stevens was killed. Killed? Rollins blinked at the form in the chair. But that's impossible. The door was locked. The room hasn't been disturbed and there aren't any holes in the glass. Nothing could get in except light. Dan walked to the big windows. He examined the ledge and the joints. He came back to the control table and tested the switches. Suddenly, he leaned over Stephen's huddled body and pulled the logbook from under his stiff fingers. Look at this! Scrawled across the pad in big, jerky letters were the words, Purple light bleu. The pencil had torn through the sheet in a violent final contraction. Rollins rubbed his chin. We don't use any purple beams. It doesn't make any sense. Maybe it does, Dan said. He turned to the doctor. Wasn't there some experiments made by Dr. Aaron Linden several years ago on the injurious effects of certain kinds of light on the nervous system? The doctor frowned. Yes, I think there was, but the experiments were never completed. That's right, the Foundation refused to up his salary, so he went to work for Rome. Dan swung around to Rollins. It was Linden who helped work out the invisible light landing system that Rome uses on his Venus rocket ports. Seems to me you've jumped to some pretty wild conclusions, Kearns, Rollins said slowly. Dan looked at him. Suppose Linden has found the exact wavelength of the most potent ray. It would be simple for anyone to climb the framework of one of the buildings and shine that light in here. Rollins straightened up. I'll search every tower on the field. But you haven't time. The passenger rocket will be here in five minutes. The supervisor sucked in his breath. What's your idea? I'll sit at the control table myself. You can do the preliminary locating in the observation tower. He ran to the door. Where's the welder that cut the lock? The doctor and a medic were carrying out Stevens when he came back a few seconds later. Dan was slipping into the welder's helmet. 
Keep everyone away from the control room level, he said to Rollins. And you better have the crash trucks and the flame quenchers standing by on the field. Rollins stared at him. And what happens to you? Dan licked his lips. I... I don't know. I'm going to try something. Rollins smiled, reached out his hand. Good luck, Dan, he said. He clapped him on the shoulder. When they were gone, Dan dropped the helmet over his face. He walked across the room with his hands in front of him like a blind man. Finally, he lifted up across the room with his hands in front of the helmet and knocked out the dark glass in the eye slot. Then he slipped it back on. From one of the drawers in the small desk beside the control table, he lifted out a small rectangular object and slipped it in his pocket. He seated himself before the control table. The dials on the edge of the table glowed dimly. In the center of the flat top was a large circular graph with white lines that pulsed like a network of capillaries. He looked across the table through the big window. Everything except one nearby tower was hidden in swirling mists. The speaker at his side clicked on. He heard Rollins' voice. I'll pick them up, Dan. They're coming in at minimum speed. 70.295 degrees. I didn't mention the freighter. Dan flicked a small switch on the table edge. A straight white line of light shot out across the graph, then swung slowly back and forth through an arc of ten degrees, like a searching feeler. Suddenly it steadied and an orange bead appeared at its terminus. Dan watched the bead travel down the line, across the pulsing capillaries. He reached out and grasped a small lever sticking out of the tabletop. As he pressed the lever to one side, the line moved around the graph like a pointer, carrying the orange bead with it. He watched it until the bead reached the center of the graph, and then glared up through the window. Above the far end of the field, he could discern the dim, orange glow of the rocket's keel jets. Suddenly he jerked back his head. A beam of purple light was playing back and forth across the table. It swung over his gloved hands, across his arms and chest, and moved upward toward his face. He jumped up, keeping hold of the lever and studying the angle of the small beam. The reflection on the dark cloth of his jacket made him dizzy. He reached into his pocket. Suddenly, a beam of purple light. From the observation tower, Rollins watched the rocket sweep toward the field with keel jets blazing. As it reached the strip, it started to falter and dip. Rollins clenched his hands and swore. Then he steadied and slid it to a perfect landing. The intercommunications teleaudio flashed on. He saw Dan Kern's haggard face under the uplifted welder's helmet. Rollins, the roof on Tower 3. Check it right away, I think. Kern's body abruptly went rigid. He fell across the control room table. Dan Kern's came to on the floor of the control room, with the doctor working over him. How do you feel? the doctor asked like I've been sitting in an electric chair. You'll be all right, the doctor said. Compared to Stevens, you got a mild dose. Dan looked around him. He saw Rollins' boots and glanced upward. Did you check the tower? Yep, we found him, dead, just like Stevens. He was one of Rome's men, all right. He had a flashlight. We tried it on one of the dock's white rats. Rollins shook his head. Stevens must have gone through hell. Suddenly, he stared down at Dan. But how? Dan smiled, lifted up his gloved hand. In it was a small, rectangular signaling mirror. I reflected it right back at him. The End of Crash Beam by John Barrett
The Super Opener by Michael Zeroy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Jenkins. The Super Opener by Michael Zeroy. Feech! grated Ogden Pilton, president of the Pilton Opener Company, slamming the drafting board with his hairy fist. I want results! Heads lifted over boards. Calvin Feech shrunk visibly. As chief engineer, you're not carrying the ball, Pilton went on savagely. The Pilton can opener is trailing the competition. Advertising and sales are breaking their necks. It's engineering that's missing the boat. But Mr. Pilton remonstrated Feech unsteadily under his employer's glare. Don't you remember? I tried to. For two years, there hasn't been one lousy improvement in the Pilton can opener, roared Mr. Pilton. Look at our competitors. The International rips apart cans in three and three-tenths seconds. Universal does it in four. But Mr. Pilton... The Minerva Mighty Midget does it in 4.2 and plays home sweet home in chimes. Our own Pilton opener barely manages to open a can in 8.9 without chimes. Is this what I'm paying you for? Feet adjusted his spectacles with shaking hands. But Mr. Pilton, our opener still has stability, solidity. It's built to last. It has dignity. Dignity, pronounced Pilton, is for museums. Four months. Feech, in four months, I want a new can opener that will be faster, lighter, stronger, flashier, and more musical than any other on the market. I want it completely developed, engineered, and tooled up, ready for production. Otherwise, Feech... Feech's body twitched. But, Mr. Pilton, four months is hardly enough time for development, even with adequate staff. I have been trying to tell you for years that we're bound to fall behind because we don't have enough personnel to conduct research. Our men can barely keep up with production and maintenance. If you'd just let me put on a few draftsmen and... Excuses, sneered Pilton. Your staff is more than adequate. I will not allow you to throw out my money. Four months, Feech, no more. Pilton trudged out of the room, leaving behind him an oppressive silence. How could you set a time limit on research and development? The designer had to dream in his board. Investigate, search, build, test, compare, discard. He'd always wanted to devote all his time to research, but Pilton Opener had not given him that opportunity. Twenty-five years, thought Feech. Twenty-five years of close supervision, deadlines, production headaches, inadequate facilities and assistance. What had happened to the proud dream he had once had, the dream of exploring uncharted engineering regions, of unlimited time to investigate and develop. As well, thought Feech, straightening his shoulders. He had managed to design a few good things during the twenty-five years with Pilton. That was some satisfaction. What now? He had to hang on to his job. Technical work was scarce. Since the early 1980s, the schools had been turning out more technicians than the industry could absorb. He was too old to compete in the employment market. He couldn't afford to lose any money. Jenny wasn't well. How to meet this four-month deadline? He'd get right on it. Himself, of course. Hanson, good man, could work with him. He shook his head despairingly. Something would be sure to blow up. Well, he had to start. Chief, said Hanson a few weeks later as they entered the lab. I'm beginning to wonder if the answer is in the hand-mechanical type at all. Got to be answered, Feech, tiredly. We must work along classic can-opener lines. Departures such as thermal or motor-driven types would be too expensive for mass production. Three new models and a group of cans were waiting for them on the bench. They began testing. Hansen operating the openers and Feech clocking. 4.4, 4, announced Feech after the last test. Good, but not good enough. Too bulky. Parents unsatisfactory. Chimes tinny. We've made progress, but we've a long way to go. The problem was tricky. It might seem that the use of the proper gear ratios would give the required velocity. There were too many other factors that neglected this direct approach. The mechanism had to be compact and streamlined. Gear sizes had to be kept down. Can top resistance, internal resistance, cutting tooth performance, handle size and movement, the minimum strength of a woman's hand were some of the variables that had to be balanced within rigid limits. 
sector type cutters traversing several arcs at the same time had seemed to offer the answer for a while but the adjusting mechanism necessary to compensate for variable can sizes had been too complex to be practical then there was the ever-present limit to production cost hansen's eyes were on him chief he said it's a rotten shame twenty-five years of your life put in with pilton and he'd fire you just like that if you don't do the impossible pilton company is built upon your designs and you get handed this deal well well said feech i drew my pay every week so i suppose i have no complaints although a wistful note crept into his voice i would have liked a little recognition pilton is a household word but who has heard of feech well feech blew his nose how do we stand hansen hansen's bulldog features drew into a scowl pilton ought to be rayed he growled okay chief eleven experimental models designed to date two more on the boards nine completed and tested two in work best performance four point four but model otherwise unsatisfactory hello said feech as an aproned machinist entered carrying a glistening mechanism here's another model let's try it the machinist departed and hansen locked the opener on a can i hope he turned the handle and stopped abruptly staring down open mouth a cylinder of close-packed beans rested on the bench under the opener the can itself had disappeared chief said hansen chief yes said feech i see it too try another can vegetable soup or spinach inquired hansen dreamily spinach i think said feech where did the can go do you suppose the spinach can disappeared likewise several corn cans sweet potato cans corned beef hash cans leaving their contents intact it was rather disconcerting dear dear said feech regarding the piles of food on the bench there must be some explanation i designed this opener with sixteen degree twenty two minute pressure angle modified involute gear teeth seven degree nineteen minutes from clearance cutter angle thirty six degree twelve minute back rake angle i expected that such a departure from the norm might achieve unconventional performance but this dear dear where do the cans go i wonder what's the difference don't you see what you've got here it's the answer it's more than the answer we can put this right into work and beat the deadline feet shook his head no hansen we're producing something we don't understand what forces have we uncovered here where do the cans go what makes them disappear are we dealing with a kinetic or a kinematic effect what motions can we plot in the area of disappearance and what are their analytical mathematical formula what masses may be critical here what transformations of energy are involved no hansen we must learn a lot more but chief your job i'll risk that not a word to pilton several days later however pilton himself charged into the drawing room and slapped feech heartily on the back causing him to break a pencil point feech roared pilton is this talk that's going around the plant true why didn't you tell me let's see it after pilton had seen it his eyes took on a feverish glint this he exulted will make can opener history instantaneous opening automatic disposal wait until advertising and sales get a hold of this we'll throttle our competitors the pilton super opener we'll call it mr pilton said feech shakily pilton stared at his chief engineer sharply what's the matter feech the thing can be duplicated can't it yes sir i've just finished checking that but i'm in the midst of further investigation on the effect there's more here than just a new can opener sir a whole new field of physics new principles this is big mr pilton i recommend that we delay production until further research can be completed hire a few top scientists and engineers find out where the cans go put out a scientific paper on the effect feech bit out of pilton his face growing hard stow this hooey i don't give a damn where the cans go may i remind you that under our standard patent agreement all rights to your inventions belong to the company as well as anything you may produce in the field within a year after leaving our employ we have a good thing here and i don't want you holding it back we're going into production immediately close thought feech wearily it had been a man-killing job and it had been close but he'd made it beat the time limit by half a day the first tentative shipment of pilton super openers had gone to distributors along the eastern seaboard the first advertisements blazed in selected media the first reorders came back and then it's a sellout crowed pilton waving a sheaf of telegrams step up production let her rip the super openers rolled out over the country 
in a remarkably short time they appeared in millions of kitchens from coast to coast sales climbed to hundreds of thousands per day pilton opener went into peak production in three shifts but was still unable to keep up with demand construction was beginning on a new plant and additional plants were planned long lines waited in front of houseware stores department stores luckily enough to have super openers on hand limited sales to one to a customer pilton cancelled his advertising program newspapers magazines radio television and word of mouth spread the fame of the opener so that advertising was unnecessary meanwhile of course government scientists research foundations universities and independent investigators began looking into this new phenomenon receiving no satisfactory explanation from pilton they set up their own research far into the night burned the lights of countless laboratories noted physicists probed measured weighed traced x-rayed dissolved spun peered at photographed magnetized exploded shattered and analyzed super openers without achieving the glimmer of a satisfactory explanation competitors found the patent impossible to circumvent for any departure from its exact specifications nullified the effect pilton genial these days with success and acclamation roared at feach i'm putting you in for a raise yes sir to reward you for assisting me with my invention i am raising your pay two hundred dollars a year that's almost four dollars a week man thank you mr pilton and still thought feach wryly he received no recognition his name did not even appear on the patent well well that was the way it went he must find his satisfaction in his work and it had been interesting lately the work he had been doing nights at home investigating what had been named the pilton effect it had been difficult working alone and buying his own equipment the oscillator and the ultra microwave tracking unit had been particularly expensive he was a fool he supposed to try independent research when so many huge scientific organizations were working on it but he could no more keep away from it than he could stop eating he still didn't know where the cans went but somehow he felt that he was close to the answer when he finally found the answer it was too late the bore and chuck incident was only hours away as soon as he could get a hold of pilton feach said trembling sir i think i know where those cans are going i recommend are you still worrying about that pilton roared jovially leave that to the long hairs we're making money that's all that counts eh feach that night at six ten p m the Borenchuk family of Selby, South Dakota, sat down to their evening meal. Just as they started in on the soup, a rain of empty tin cans clattered down, splattered into the soup, raised a welt on the forehead of Borenchuk Sr., settled down to a gentle steady clunk, 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 and inexorably began to pile up on the dining room floor. They seemed to materialize from a plane just below the ceiling. The police called the fire department, and the fire department stared helplessly, and recommended the sanitation department. The incident made headlines in the local papers. The next day, other local papers in widely scattered locations reported similar incidents. The following day, cans began falling in Chicago. St. Louis was next. And then over the entire nation, the cans began to rain down. They fell outdoors and indoors, and usually materializing at heights that were not dangerous. The deluge followed no pattern. Sometimes it would slacken, Sometimes it would stop, sometimes began heavily again. It fell in homes, on the streets, in theaters, trains, ships, universities, and dog food factories. No place was immune. People took to wearing hats indoors and out. The sale of helmets boomed. All activity was seriously curtailed. A state of national emergency was declared. Government investigators went to work and soon confirmed what was generally suspected. These were the same cans that had been opened by the Pilton Super Opener. Statisticians and mathematicians calculated the mean rate of can precipitation and estimated that if all the cans opened by Pilton Openers were to come back, the deluge should be over in 15.29 days. Super Opener sales, of course, immediately plummeted to zero and stayed there. Anti-Pilton editorials appeared in the papers. Commentators accused Pilton of deliberately hoaxing the public for his own gain. A congressional investigation was demanded. Pelton received threats of bodily injury. Lawsuits were filed against him. He barricaded himself in the plant, surrounded by bodyguards. Livid with fury and apprehension, he screamed at Feech. This is your doing, you vandal! I'm a ruined man! A falling can caught him nearly on the tip of his nose. But sir, trembled Feech, dodging three spaghetti cans, I tried to warn you. You're through, Feech, raved Pelton. 
Fired. Get out. Before you go, I want you to know that I've directed the blame where it belongs. I've just released to the press the truth about who created the opener. Now, get out. Yes, sir, said Feech, paling. Then you don't want to hear about my discovery of a way to prevent the cans from coming back? Clunk. A barrage of cans hit the floor, and both men took refuge under Pilton's huge desk. No! yelled Pilton at Feech's face, which was inches away. No! I... What did you say? A small design improvement, sir, and the cans would disappear forever. Clunk. Forever, Feech? Yes, sir. Clunk, clunk, clunk. You're positive, Feech? Pilton's eyes glared into Feech's. Sir, I never make careless claims. That's true, said Pilton. His eyes grew dreamy. It can be done, he mused. The new type super opener. Free exchange for the old. Cash guarantee that empty cans will never bother you. Take a licking at first, but then monopolize the market. All right, Feech, I'll give you another chance. You'll turn over all the details to me. The patent on the improvements will naturally be mine. I'll get credit for rectifying your blunder. Fine, fine. We'll work it out. Hop on production at once, Feech. Feech felt himself sag inwardly. Mr. Pilton, he said, I'm only asking one favor. Let me work full-time on research and development, especially on the Pilton effect. Hire a couple of extra men to help me with production. I assure you the company will benefit in the end. Damn it, no, roared Pilton. How many times must I tell you? You got your job back, didn't you? Prospect of long years of heavy production schedules, restricted engineering, and tight supervision suddenly made Calvin Feech feel very tired. Research, he thought. Development. What he had always wanted. Over the years, he had waited, thinking that there would be opportunities later. But now he was growing older, and he felt that there might not be a later. Somehow he would manage to get along. Perhaps someone would give him a job working in the field he had pioneered. With a sense of relief, he realized that he had made his decision. Mr. Pilton, Feech said, I clunk, resign. Pilton started, extreme astonishment crossing his face. No use, said Feech. Nothing you can say, clunk, 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 will make any difference now. But see here, the new type super opener will remain my secret. Good day. Feech, howled Pilton. I order you to remain. Feech almost submitted from force of habit. He hesitated for a moment, then turned abruptly. Good day, said Feech firmly, sprinting through the falling cans to the door. Money, Feech decided after a while, was a good thing to have. His supply was running pretty low. He was not having any luck finding another job. Although the cans had stopped falling on the 15th day, as predicted by statisticians, industry would not soon forget the inconvenience and losses caused by the deluge. It was not anxious to hire the man it regarded as responsible for the whole thing. Feech, the personal man would read. Calvin Feech? Then looking up, not the Calvin Feech, who... Yes, Feech would admit miserably. I'm sorry, but he did no better with research organizations. Typical was a letter from Van Terrell Foundation. Cannot accept your application, insomuch as we feel that your premature application of your discovery to profit-making denotes a lack of scientific responsibility and ethics not desirable in a member of our organization. Former employer states the decision was yours entirely. Unfavorable references. Pilton, Feech thought, feeling a strange sensation deep within his chest that he had not had the experience to recognize as the beginning of a slow anger. Pilton was hitting low and getting away with it. Of course. If he were to agree to reveal his latest discoveries to a research organization, he would undoubtedly get appointed. But how could he? Everything patentable in his work would automatically revert to Pilton under the one-year clause in the company patent agreement. No, Feech told himself. He was revealing nothing that Pilton might grab. The anger began to mount, but he was beginning to need money desperately. Jenny wasn't getting any better, and medical bills were running high. The phone rang. Feech seized it and said in to the image, Absolutely not. I'll go up another ten dollars, grated the little Pilton image. Do you realize, man, this is the fourteenth raise I've offered you. A total increase of one hundred and twenty-six dollars. Be sensible, Feech. I know you can't find work anywhere else. Thanks to you, Mr. Pilton. I wouldn't work for you if... A barrage of rocks crashed against the heavy steel screening of the window. What's going on? yelled Pilton. Oh, I see. People throwing rocks at your house again. Oh, I know all about that, Feech. I know that you're probably the most unpopular man alive today. I know about the rocks, the tomatoes, the rotten eggs, sneaking out at night, the disguises you've had to use. Why don't you come back to us and change all that, Feech? 
We'll put out the new type super can opener, and the world will soon forget about the old one. No, said Feech. People will forget anyway, I hope. If you won't think of yourself, at least think of your fellow workmen, begged Pilton, his voice going blurry. Do you realize that Pilton Opener will soon be forced to close down, throwing all your former associates out of work? Think of Hanson, Sanchez, Forbes. They have families, too. Think of the men in the shop, the girls in the office, the salesmen on the road, all unemployed because of you. Think of that, Feech. Feech blinked. This had not occurred to him. Pilton eyed him sharply then smiled with a hint of triumph. Think it over, Feech. Feech sat, thinking it over. Was it right to let all those people lose those jobs? Frowning, he dialed Hanson's number. Chief, said Hanson, forget it. The boys are behind you 100%. We'll make out. But that's the trouble. I thought you'd feel like this, and I can't let you. They're beginning to weaken it. Don't. Think, Chief, think. The brain that figured the super opener can solve this. Feech hung up. A glow of anger that had building up in his chest grew warmer. He began pacing the floor. How he hated to do it. Think, Hanson had said. But he had considered every angle, and there was no solution. Feech walked into the kitchen and carefully poured himself a drink of water. He drank the water slowly and placed the glass on the washstand with a tiny click. It was the tiny click that did it. Something about it touched off the growing rage. If Pilton were there, he would have punched him in the nose. Twenty-five years, the tricks, the threats. Think? He'd figured the solution long ago, only he hadn't allowed himself to see it. Not lack of brains, lack of guts. Well, he thought grimly, dialing Pilton's number. He was going to go through with it now. Pilton, he barked. 3 p.m. tomorrow, my place, be there. That's all. He hung up. In the same grim mood, the following morning, he placed a few more calls. In the same mood that afternoon, he stood in the middle of his living room and looked at his visitors. Pelton, Williams, the government man. Billings from the Van Terrell Foundation. Steiner of Westchester University, the members of the press. Gentlemen, he said, I'll make it brief. He waved the papers in his hand. Here is everything I know about what I call the Feech effect, including plans and specifications for the new type super opener. All of you have special reasons for being keenly interested in this information. I'm now going to give a copy to each of you, providing one condition is met by Mr. Pilton. He stared at Pilton. In short, I want 51% of the stock in Pilton Opener. Pilton leaped from his chair. Outrageous, he roared. Ridiculous. 51%, said Feech firmly. Don't bother with any counterproposals, or the interview is at an end. Gentlemen, squawked Pilton. I appeal to you. Stop bluffing, said Feech coldly. There's no other way out for you. Otherwise, you're ruined. Here, sign this agreement. Pilton threw the paper to the floor and screamed, Gentlemen, will you be party to this? Well, murmured the government man. I never did think Feech got a fair shake. This information is important to science, said the Van Terrell man. After Pilton had signed, the papers were distributed. Published in the newspaper the following day, Feech's statement read in part, the motion in space and time of the singular, curvilinear proportions of the original super-opener, combined with a capacitor effect, built up as it increased its frictional electrical static charge in inverse proportion to the cube root of the tolerance between the involute teeth caused an instantaneous disruption of what I call the alpha multidimensional screen. The can, being metallic, dropped through, leaving its non-metallic contents behind. The disruption was instantly repaired by the stable nature of the screen. Beyond the screen is what I call the alpha space, a space apparently quite as extensive as our own universe. Unfortunately, as my investigation indicated, alpha space seems to be thickly inhabited. The inhabitants, the nature of whom I have not yet discerned, obviously resented the intrusion of the cans, developed a method of disrupting the screen from their side, and hurtled the cans back at us. However, I have established the existence of other spaces up to mu space, and suspect that others exist beyond that. Better space, which is also adjacent to our own space, is devoid of any form of life. The new type super opener is designed to pass cans through the better screen. Better space will safely absorb an infinite number of cans. I sincerely and humbly venture the opinion that we are on the threshold of tremendous and mighty discoveries. It is my belief that the possibility of an infinite number of universes exist in a type of laminated block separated by screens. Therefore, might it not be that an infinite number of laminated blocks exist? Mr. Feech, 
said Pilton. Feech looked up from his desk in the newly constructed Feech Dimensional Development Division of the Pilton Opener Company. Pilton, don't bother me about production. Production is your problem. But Mr. Feech... Get out, said Feech. Pilton blanched and laughed. As I was saying, Hanson, continued Feech. End of the Super Opener by Michael Zeroy Recording by James Jenkins The Odyssey of Sam Meacham by Charles E. Fritch This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stacy Dugan Wilcox The Odyssey of Sam Meacham by Charles E. Fritch To look at Sam Meacham, you'd never have dreamed he was a man of decision and potential explorer of the unknown. In fact, there were times when Sam wouldn't either. He was a pink, frail-looking person with a weak chin and shoulders used to stooping, and stereotyped thinking immediately relegated him to the ranks of the meek and mannerly. These, oddly enough, happened to be his characteristics, but that was before he discovered the hyperdrive. In his capacity as an atomic engine inspector, his work was most uncreative. He was a small cog in a large cog-laden machine, a government worker helping to produce engines that would send supplies and emigrants and tourists to the U.S. sector of the moon colony. Day after day, week after week, freshly made engines would come sliding down the conveyor belt, and mechanically, Sam Meacham would attach to each two wires that led from a machine by his side, flip a switch, and if the dial on his machine read at least 50, he could pass the machine on as being adequate for the job of Moon Ferry. He'd been attaching those two wires in place and watching 50s for five years, and it looked as though he'd be doing it for 55 more. Then one day... A defectively wired machine came sliding along, and dutifully Sam hooked it up and flipped the switch. Automatically, his eyes glanced disinterestedly at the dial showing comparative thrust. His eyes bugged. The needle had passed 50, had gone to the 100 mark, never before reached, struck the metal projection, bent, and was whirling in a rapid circle. Sam quickly cut off the motor, then he glanced furtively about to see if anyone had noticed. The room was a flurry of men busy at routine tasks, and none of them seemed particularly interested in anything that was going on at his table. Sam checked his own machine and found the tester in perfect working order. He hesitated a brief moment, then flipped the switch again. He was prepared for the whir of the dial now, but still, it frightened him a little. Well, there must be something wrong. No atomic engine could have that much comparative thrust. Yet, the tester was perfect. Sam Meacham shut off the tester and stood very still for a minute and thought about it. His glance fell on the intricate wiring within the atomic engine, and he saw with a start that it looked different from usual. Wires were where wires had never been before, where wires were not supposed to be. With another quick glance about him, Sam began copying the wiring pattern on a sheet of paper. He thrust the paper into his pocket as the foreman came up to him. Say, Meacham, the foreman said. That last engine okay? Sam Meacham hesitated briefly and then said, The wiring was a little fouled up. Busted the dial on the tester. The foreman shook his head. I was afraid of that. Some wireman on the third floor came in half drunk a few minutes ago. That was only his first machine, so the others ought to be okay. He jabbed a finger at the engine. You better send it back up. When the foreman was gone, Sam checked the wiring with his diagram to make certain he hadn't made any mistakes, and then he disconnected some of the wires, just in case. For the first time in years, Sam Meacham felt a new freedom. He'd always been a dreamer hampered by cold reality, a man with his head in the stars and his feet chained to solid earth. He'd wanted to go to the moon when the government first started colonizing, but Dorothy, his wife, talked him out of it. At various times he had felt that secret longing, that beckoning of the stars, but each time he had shelved the desire and turned to attaching his two wires of the tester to their proper terminals on each atomic engine, and then when his shift was up he turned homeward to face an existence equally uninspiring. The moment he had seen that needle pass into the hundreds, Sam Meacham knew what he was going to do. He had planned it years ago, when he first stood alone in the night and gazed upward at the glittering diamonds that lay beyond reach. 
Even then he had known what he would do if ever the opportunity presented itself. In those moments of self-pity that came too often, however, he had told himself that it was only wishful thinking, and cursed himself for being a weakling and a dreamer who did nothing about his dreams, but he had resolved that some day he would go out among the stars. That day had come, and as Sam Meacham went homeward that evening, he felt his heart beat in time with the pulsing light of the stars overhead. But with this new exultation, he felt a desperate fear, a fear that he might again bypass his opportunity, as he had done so often before. Yet he knew that this was his greatest chance, perhaps his last chance. He must be brave and strong, and above all confident that his intense longing would make his venture successful. "'How'd everything go?' Dorothy asked when he came in. It was a mechanical question, and he answered it mechanically. "'Okay. Everything went as usual.' He didn't want to look at her. She'd grown plump since they'd married eight years ago, and by not looking at her he could somehow pretend she was still slim and attractive. She was lying on a couch wearing a housecoat, and didn't look up from the magazine in front of her. "'Supper's on the table,' she said. For eight years he'd had flat, uninspiring meals— meals that kept one from starving and no more. His complaints had met with more hostility than he cared to cope with, and always, meekly, he had retired from the scene of battle, wishing he had submitted and thus avoided the tongue-lashing before which he felt so helpless. Once more in the surroundings that bred it, a familiar distasteful helplessness rose up to envelop Sam Meacham. It came across him as a feeling of despair and bewilderment, and he wondered sickly if he would ever escape this. Yes, he told himself, clenching his fists determinedly, but he would have to bide his time. Slowly, not really tasting it, he ate the cold, uninviting meal set on the table. Securing the engine was the least of his worries, at least from a commercial standpoint. The factory was turning out atomic engines at almost production line rates, and civilians could easily get them for private use, so long as they operated them at low speeds and within the atmosphere of Earth. That last thought drew a long, secret laugh from Sam Meacham. At low speeds. The government considered anything above a 50 CT as high speed, and here he was with a secret that could enable him to travel at, well, who knows what speeds. He could give it to the government later, but right now he had his own use for it. Dorothy would prove an obstacle, however. She was always an obstacle, and there was no reason to assume she wouldn't be one now. And he was right about that. The following payday, when he took his check and splurged it on an atomic engine, Dorothy was madder than a uranium pile approaching critical mass. "'Here I scrimp and save on that measly paycheck you bring home,' she wailed, "'and you go out and buy luxuries we don't need if we could afford them. Look at this dress. It's old. All my clothes are old. And you know why? You want to know why?' Sam Meacham already knew why. It was because as a manager of his financial affairs, Dorothy was a flop." Often he had wanted to tell her so, but the more times he attempted to open his mouth, the louder she had wailed. It was a lot easier just to let her explode and then fizzle out. Even now, he had the desire to shout at her to see what would happen, but her shrieks made him grow sullen and unsure of himself. Perhaps he had wasted the money. After all, the engine they had in their outdated model rocket was good for a few years more, but for a long trip through space, it would never do. The explosion was over, and she was merely sizzling. She had folded her arms resolutely, determined that he should cancel the order for the engine immediately. Sam Meacham felt a wave of helplessness surge over him. He felt lost and bewildered. Perhaps she was right. Maybe it was foolish. Here he was, Sam Meacham, 35, whose mediocre living was made attaching two wires to two terminals day after day, week after week, a man who suddenly saw a pointer go unexpectedly beyond the fifty mark, and who immediately began having delusions of grandeur. He was a dreamer, but dreams in reality were two different things, and sometimes he confused them. He shook his head, feeling like a fool. Well, Dorothy's face was before him, determined, demanding. Sam said, All right, I'll take it back. She smiled condescendingly, like a mother does when a child admits a wrongdoing. Conditioned responses, Sam thought bitterly. That was the whole trouble. This cravenness, this kowtowing before any idiot with a louder voice, certainly wasn't in his genes. The trouble was in his conditioning, started when he was an adolescent. Give somebody an inch and they'll take two. 
pretty soon they're walking all over you, and you've become so used to it you don't complain. He thought of his job, of the eternal fitting of two wires in place. He was a cog and nothing more, a cog that could be replaced as swiftly, as efficiently, as any part of an assembly line atomic engine could be replaced. He looked up into the blank, smiling, self-satisfied face of his wife. He thought of the stars beckoning overhead. The stars. No, he said suddenly, decisively. The word fell like a sledgehammer blow in the stillness of the room. Dorothy's vacuous smile faded, uncomprehending. What? No. "'Sam said, trying to keep his voice even. "'I've changed my mind. "'I'm keeping the engine whether you like it or not.' "'Dorothy's mouth hung open in surprise, "'and before she could recover enough to launch a fresh tirade, "'Sam Meacham had walked out, slamming the door behind him. "'He paused in the cool evening and gazed upward. "'The government had only gone to the moon. "'Sam Meacham was going to the stars. "'The next day he was given the silent treatment.' It had begun the night before when he returned from his walk. Dorothy was in bed, awake and sniffling over the cruelty inflicted upon her by an unthoughtful husband, and when he came in she turned her back and wouldn't speak. Sam didn't mind that. In fact, it was a welcome relief. But all night long she sniffled into her pillow, trying to win him over. Sam felt an odd mixture of sympathy and anger. "'Oh, shut up,' he said finally, and stuck his head under the pillow." In the morning, the treatment continued, but it was not totally silent, for Dorothy's air of hostility was now accompanied by low, sometimes indistinct, mumblings. Suddenly, Sam said, "'This coffee's cold.' "'If you don't like it,' Dorothy said, and thrust her face near his, "'make some yourself.' Sam half rose and gripped the table. "'Look, my lovely one, I'm the gent who brings home that weekly paycheck you can't get along without. Measly or not?' It's good, honest American dough that lets us live a little decently. And the least you could do is give me warm coffee in the morning. His voice had risen almost to a shout, and Sam himself was surprised at it. Dorothy's eyebrows crept into a bewildered frown, and like one in a trance, she moved to turn on the heat beneath the coffee pot. Sam's heart was beating swiftly as he sat down. Conditioned responses, he thought a little wildly. He'd started it off last night by defying Dorothy, and now, bit by bit, it was becoming easier. All he'd have to do was keep it up, see that he didn't lapse. He sipped the coffee slowly, as if tasting his recent triumph in the black liquid. "'You'd better hurry,' Dorothy said, looking at him a little uneasily. Sam glanced at the wall clock and began gulping the hot liquid. Ten of eight? He'd have to hurry. He paused suddenly, the cup in midair, and wondered. "'Hurry to what?' to those two wires and the tester and the endless stream of untested engines flowing toward him? With an infinite firmness, Sam Meacham placed his cup on the saucer. "'I'm not going in,' he said. Dorothy looked at him as though he were crazy. "'What do you mean you're not going in?' she demanded. "'Just because you've got some mulish notion in your head, do you think we have to starve? You're going in and liking it.' "'The engine I bought is coming today,' he said in a quiet voice. "'I want to install it.' In Sam Meacham's eyes, there was a deadly fire that even his wife had not seen before. She gulped and backed away a little. But... Call up the foreman, Sam said. Tell him I'm sick. No. Wait. He paused, smiling coldly. That would leave him an out. He could always go back to the job if he changed his mind. He said slowly, Tell him I've quit. Sam! Tell him I've quit, Sam insisted. That was the thing. Burn your bridges behind you so you can't turn back, so the only road is ahead. Sam Meacham was going to the stars, and he would never return. The atomic engine came that afternoon, neat and shiny and sleek, with all the wires in their proper places, checked and double-checked by a sober human cog in the prison from which Sam Meacham had just escaped. Sam busied himself in the hangar, lifting out the old engine and replacing it with the new one. Carefully, he settled it into its housing and bolted it down. Then he rearranged the wires into the pattern outlined on the sheet of paper. Dorothy brought him coffee. That surprised him, but he accepted it gratefully. Can... can I help you, Sam? she offered. He looked at her, perhaps a little disappointed that her face was serious. He said, Sure you're not just trying to be nosy? A sharp pain darted into her eyes and she turned away. Wait, he said. 
He called himself a fool. It was another of her tricks, and he was falling for it. He put a restraining hand on her arm and remembered another time eight years ago when the touch would have sent electric thrills coursing through him. Oddly, he felt a small remnant of the pleasure stir within him. All right, he said gruffly. All right, you can help. So he was a fool. He'd been a fool before, and chances were he'd be one again more often than he'd cared to admit. In a short while, hours perhaps, he'd be gone, and he'd never see Dorothy again. Somehow the thought was not as comforting as he had expected, and he tried to work off a lingering doubt that rose to plague him. They worked through the afternoon, testing any weak parts the rocket might have, bracing the struts, checking for leaks. Sam found two spacesuits in the locker. He'd better leave one, he thought. They were expensive, and Dorothy might need one sometime. With him gone, she couldn't afford to throw money around. Yet he might need it more than she ever would. For a minute, he stood undecided, and then he put them both in the locker. Dorothy came into the room and smiled wearily at him. "'It'll go any place now,' she told him proudly. In her eyes, Sam saw an indefinable something, something he might have seen eight years ago, but mixed with it was a sadness he had not known she could possess. Guiltily, he turned his gaze away. "'We... we better go in and eat,' he said, looking at his watch without seeing it. She didn't say anything, and that was odd. Sam wished she would nag and complain as she always had before. He wondered why he wished that, when only a short time before he'd wanted just the opposite. It was with a start that he realized the reason. He was running away. That was it. He was running away, and he wanted to be deathly certain that he had good cause to run. Slowly, the suspicion was creeping over him that the situation had changed slightly, was changing more. He would leave tonight, he told himself, before he weakened enough to shelve his plans for another comfortable rut. Sam's voice was a little hoarse. What are you doing here? What do you want? He'd finished loading enough supplies aboard the rocket to last him months. Dorothy came toward him from the darkness. It's no use, he said. You can't talk me out of it this time. But she only smiled sadly and said, I know that, Sam. I came to say goodbye. Goodbye? You're leaving, aren't you? Yes. He looked at the ground, studying the darkness. I'm sorry, Sam, she said. We started out wrong. Maybe if we tried again. But Sam said quickly, no. I'm sorry, too, but people don't change. The remark startled him. He had used it occasionally to rationalize his position, had been convinced of its undeniable truth, yet suddenly he realized that he himself was its living denial. People could change, just as he had changed, just as Dorothy could change. It had been partly his fault when he first gave in to something he didn't want to, and then to something else, and something else after that. He had helped dig the rut in which he'd found himself, taking it for granted just as Dorothy had taken it for granted. Her hair was soft in the same moonlight that had shone eight years before, and Sam Meacham felt a desire that had been too long unfulfilled. Dorothy, I... He hesitated. The decision came hard to him, for much of his life had been devoted to giving in to decisions of others. This was the moment he'd been waiting for, and now at the last moment, he was uncertain. He said suddenly, Can you pack a few things? Sam? Her voice in the darkness was eager. Her hands touched his. Soft hands. You better hurry, he told her. Sam watched her go to the house, and doubts began to gnaw at him. Was he going to destroy his plans now at a whim? He felt an impulse to get into the rocket and leave without her. Yet he thought of the cold emptiness of space and himself drifting through alien worlds alone, lonely. Perhaps it was wrong, but he couldn't condemn her for something that was partly his fault. He was trying to become the person he once might have been, and it was only fair that she should have the same chance. Dorothy came hurrying back, a suitcase in her hand, and there was an eagerness about her that pleased him. He helped her put the suitcase on board. Dorothy? Her voice was soft and low. Yes, Sam. Starlight danced in her eyes. He pulled her gently to him. He kissed her. And that night, eight years ago, came back. And in his arms was the young, eager bride he had known, the one he loved. Minutes later, they rose on wings of fire in a slow upward spiral that quickened painlessly. Sam had not questioned the hyperdrive. It had worked in the factory, and it would work here. He watched the needle cross the dial in a swift, steady movement. Dorothy placed her hand in his. 
Where are we going, darling? Sam Meacham smiled at her, confident that he'd made the most important decision in his life. He pointed through the forward window. Ahead of them lay the stars. End of The Odyssey of Sam Meacham by Charles E. Fritch Recording by Stacy Dugan Wilcox Morale A Story of the War of 1941 to 1943 by Murray Leinster This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Morale, A Story of the War of 1941 to 1943 by Murray Leinster. Part 1. The profound influence of civil morale upon the course of modern war is nowhere more clearly shown than in the case of that monstrous war engine popularly known as Wobbly. It landed in New Jersey August 16, 1942, and threw the whole eastern coast into a frenzy. In six hours, the population of three states was in a panic. Industry was paralyzed. The military effect was comparable only to a huge modern army landed in our rear. Strategic Lessons of the War of 1941 to 1943, U.S. War College, pages 79 and 78. Sergeant Walpole made his daily report at 2.15. He used a dinky phone that should have been in a museum, and a rural central put him in the area officer's tight beam. The officer listened drearily as the sergeant said in a military manner, Sergeant Walpole, sir, Post 14 reports that he has nothing of importance to report. The area's officer's acknowledgement was curt, embittered, for he was an energetic young man and he loathed his job. He wanted to be in the West where the fighting of a highly unconventional nature was taking place daily. He did not enjoy this business of watching an unthreatened coastline simply for the maintenance of civil confidence and morale. He preferred fighting. Sergeant Walpole, though, exhaled a lungful of smoke at the telephone transmitter and waited. Presently, the, the rural central said, All through? Sure, sweetie, said Sergeant Walpole. How about the walkies tonight? That was at 2.20 p.m. There was a coy conversation while the civilian telephone service suffered. Then Sergeant Walpole went back to his post of duty with a date for the evening. He never kept that date, as it turned out. The rural central was dead an hour after the first and only wobbly landed, and as everybody knows, that happened at 2.45. But Sergeant Walpole had no premonitions as he went back to his hammock on the porch. This was post number 14, 6th Area, Eastern Coast Observation Force. There was a war on, to be sure. There had been war on since the fall of 1941, but it was 2,000 miles away. Even lone wolf bombing planes flying at 40,000 feet up never came this far to drop their eggs upon inviting targets or upon those utterly blank, innocent-seeming places where munitions of war were now manufactured underground. Here was peace and quiet and good rations and a paradise for gold brickers. Here was a summer bungalow taken over for military purposes quartering six men who watched a certain section of coastline for a quite impossible enemy. Three miles to the south, there was another post. Three miles to the north, there was another one still. They stretched all along the Atlantic coast, those observation posts, and the men in them watched the sea, languidly observed the television broadcast, and slept in the sun. That was all they were supposed to do. In doing it, they helped maintain civilian morale, and therefore the Eastern Coast Observation Force was endlessly said to be just attached to the Army for rations. 
by the other services and its members rated with MPs and other low forms of animal life. Sergeant Walpole reclined in his hammock, inhaling comfortably. The ocean glittered blue before him in the sun. There was a plume of smoke out at sea indicating an old-style coal burner, its hull down below the horizon. Anything that would float was being used since the war began, although a coal-burning ship was almost a museum piece. A trim diesel tramp was lazing northward well inshore. A pack of gulls were squabbling noisily over some unpleasantness floating a hundred yards from the beach. The diesel tramp edged closer inshore still. It was all very peaceful and placid. There were few softer jobs on earth than being a member of a force in being for the sake of civilian morale. But at 2.32 p.m., the softness of that job departed, as far as Sergeant Walpole was concerned. At that moment, he heard a thin wailing sound high aloft. It was well known enough nearer the front, but the Eastern Coast Observation Force had no need to become unduly familiar with it. With incredible swiftness, the wailing rose to the shrillest of shrieks descending as lightning might be imagined to descend. Then there was a splattering concussion. It was monstrous. It was ear-splitting. Windows crashed in the cottage and tinkled to the sandy earth outside. There was a pause of seconds duration only, during which Sergeant Walpole stared blankly and gasped, What the hell? Then there was a second thin wailing which rose to a scream. Sergeant Walpole was in motion before the second explosion came. He was diving off to the veranda of post number 14. He saw someone else coming through a window. He had a photographic glimpse of one of his men emerging through a doorway. Then he struck earth and began to run. Like everybody else in America, he knew what the explosions and the screamings meant. But he had covered no more than 50 yards when the third bomb fell from that plane so far aloft that it was not even a moat in the sky. Up there, the sky was not even blue, but a dull leaden gray because of the thinness of the atmosphere yet above it. The men in that high-flight bomber could see the ground only as a mass of vaguely blended colors. They were aiming their bombs by filtered light through telescopes which used infrared rays only, as aerial cameras did back in the 1920s. And they were sighting their eggs with beautifully exact knowledge of their velocity and height. By the time the bombs had dropped eight miles, they were traveling faster than the sound of their coming. The first two had wiped out posts 13 and 15. The third made no sound before it landed, except to an observer at a distance. Sergeant Walpole heard neither the scream of the fall nor the sound of its explosion. He was running madly, and suddenly the earth bucked violently beneath his feet. He had a momentary sensation of things flying madly by over his head, and then he knew nothing at all for a very long time. Then his head ached horribly, and someone was popping at something valorously with a rifle, and he heard the nasty sharp explosion of the hydronite bullets which have remodeled older ideas of warfare. And Sergeant Walpole was aware of an urgent necessity to do something, but he could not at all imagine what it was. Then a shell went off, the earth's concussion banged his nose against the sand, and the rifle fire stopped. For God's sake, said Sergeant Walpole dizzily. He staggered to his feet and looked behind him. Where the cottage had been was a hole, quite a large hole. It was probably a hundred yards across and all of twenty deep, but seawater was seeping in to fill it through the sand. Its edge was forty or fifty feet from where he stood. He had been knocked down by the heaving earth, and the sand and the mud blown out of the crater had gone clean over him. Twenty feet back, the top part of his body would have been cut neatly off by the blast, as it was. He found his nose bleeding and plugged it with his handkerchief. 
He was still rather dazed, and he still had the feeling there was something extremely important that he must do. He stood rocking on his feet, trying to clear his head. When two men came along the sand dunes behind the beach, one of them carried two automatic rifles. The other was trying to bandage a limp and flapping arm as he ran. They saw the sergeant and ran to him. Hell, Sarge, I thought you all were bone to little eggshells. I ain't, said Sergeant Walpole. He looked again at the hole of ground and swore paintedly. Look at that, said the man with the flapping arm. Hell's going to pop around here, Sarge. Sergeant swung around, then his mouth dropped open. Just a half a mile away and hardly more than 200 yards from the shoreline, the diesel tramp was ramming the beach. A wake still foamed behind it. A monstrous bow wave spread out on either hand, overtopping even the combers that came rolling in. It was being deliberately run ashore. It struck, and its foremast crumbled up and fell forward, carrying its derrick booms with it. There was a squeal of crumpled metal plates. Flying a yellow flag just now painted one of the two privates. We started popping hydronite bullets at her, and she flung a shell at us. She's an enemy ship, but what the hell? Smoke spurted up from the beach ship. Her stern broke off and settled in deeper water out from the shore. More smoke spurted out. Her bow split wide. There were deep rumbles of black powder explosions. Sergeant Walpole and his two followers stared blankly. More explosions and the ship was hidden in smoke. When it blew away, her funnel went down and half more of her upper decks was sliding into the sea. She had lifted suddenly. Sergeant Walpole gazed upward. Futilely, of course. There was nothing in sight overhead. But these explosions did look like the hydronite stuff they put in small arm bullets nowadays. A 30 caliber bullet had the explosive effect of an old-style six-pound TNT shell. Only hydronate goes off with a crack instead of a boom. It was an American plane opening up with a machine gun. Then the beach ship seemed to blow up. A mass of thick smoke covered her from stem to stern, and bits of plating flew heavily through the air, and there were a few lurid bursts of flame. Sergeant Walpole suddenly remembered that there ought to be survivors, only he hadn't seen anybody diving overboard to get ashore. He half started forward. Then the sea breeze blew this smoke, too, away from the wreckage, and the tramp was gone. But there was something else in its place so that Sergeant Walpole took one look and swallowed a non-existent something that came up instantly into his throat again and remembered the urgent thing he had to do. Pete, he said calmly, you hunt up the area officer and tell him what you've seen. Here, I'll give you a report that'll keep him from slamming you in the clink for being drunk. Grab a monocycle somewheres. It's faster than a car, the way you'll be traveling. First telephone you come to that's working makes Central put you on the tight beam to headquarters. Then go on and report yourself, see? Pete started and automatically fumbled with his limp and useless arm. Then he carefully tucked the unmanageable hand in the pocket of his uniform blouse. That doesn't matter now, he said absurdly. He was looking at the thing left in place of the tramp as Sergeant Walpole scribbled on one of the regulation report forms of the Eastern Coast Observation Force, and the thing he saw was enough to upset anybody. Where the tramp had been, there was a single bit of bow plating sticking up out of the surf and a bunch of miscellaneous floating wreckage drifting sluggishly towards the beach and there was quite a solid, rounded, metallic shape, apparently quite as long as the original tramp had been. There was a huge armored tube across its upper section, with a vision slits in two bulbous sections at its end. There were gum ports visible here and there, and already a monstrous protuberance was coming into view midway along its back, as if forced into position from within. Where the bow of the tramp had been, there was a colossal treads now visible. There was a sort of conning tower, armored and grim. 
There was a ghastly steel beak. The thing was a war machine of monster size. It emitted a sudden roaring sound as of internal combustion engines operating at full power and lurched heavily. The steel plates of the tramp were still visible above water, crumpled up like paper, and were trodden under. The thing came toward the shore. It slithered through the shallow sea with waves breaking against its bulging sides. It came out upon the beach, its wet sides glittering. It was 200 feet long. It looked somehow like a giant centipede. It was a tank of sorts, but like no tank ever seen on Earth before. It was the great-grandfather of all tanks. It was so monstrous that for its convenience, a ship's hull and superstructure had built about it, and its own engines had been the engines of that ship. It was so huge that it could only be landed by blasting away a beach ship from about itself, so it could run under its own power over the fragments to the shore. Now it stopped smoothly on the sandy beach, in which its eight-foot-wide steel tread sank almost a yard. Men dropped down from the ports in its swelling sides. They made swift, careful inspections of predetermined point. They darted back up the ladders again. The thing roared once more. Then it swung about, headed for the sand dunes, and with extraordinary smoothness and celerity, disappeared inland. Part 2 The wobbly was meant for one purpose, the undermining of civilian morale. To accomplish that purpose, it set systematically about the establishment of a reign of terror. And so complete was its success that half the population of the state was in a headlong flight within two hours. It was, first, mysterious, second, deadly, and within a very few hours it had built up a reputation for invincibility, judged on the basis of its first 12 hours' work alone. It was the most successful experiment of the war. Its effect on civilian morale was incalculable. Strategic Lessons of the War, 1941-1943. to 1943. U.S. War College, pages 80 and 81. Two of the members of the observation post 14 gapped at the retreating monster. Sergeant Walpole scribbled on the official form. Just as the monstrous thing dipped down out of sight, there was a vicious, crashing report from a cinder part. Something shriek. Sergeant Walpole got up, spitting sand. There was blood on the report form in his hand. He folded it painstakingly. Of the two men who had been with him, one was struggling out of the sand as Sergeant Walpole had to do. The other was scattered over a good many yards of sandy beach. Mm, they seen us, said Sergeant Walpole, and they got Pete. You'll have to take this report. I'm going after the damn thing. What for? asked the other man blankly. To keep it in sight, said Sergeant Walpole. That's tactics. If somebody springs something you ain't able to fight, run away, but keep it in sight and report to the nearest commissioned officer. Remember that. Now get on. There's monocycles in the village. Get there and beat that damn wobbly thing with the news. He saw his follower start off sprinting. That particular soldier, by the way, was identified by his dog tags some days later. As nearly as could be discovered, he had died of gas. But Sergeant Walpole picked up one of the two rifles, blew sand out of the breech mechanisms, and started off after the metal monster. He walked in the eight-foot track of one of its treads. As he went, he continued cleaning sand from the rifle in his hands. The rifle was useless against such a monster, of course, but it is quaint to reflect that such an automatic rifle firing hydronite bullets, each equivalent to a six-pounder TNT shell in destructiveness, Sergeant Walpole carried greater firepower than Napoleon ever disposed in battle. The tread of the wobbly made a perfect roadway. 
Presently, Sergeant Walpole looked up to find himself scrutinizing somebody's dining room table set for lunch. The wobbly had crossed the house in his past without swerving. Walls, chimneys, timbers, and planks all gone beneath its treads. But they had been pressed so smoothly flat that until Sergeant Walpole looked down at his footings, he would not have known he was walking on the wreckage of a building. It was half an hour before he reached the village. The wobbly had gone from end to end, backing up and gone over the rest of it again. There was the taint of gas in the air. Sergeant Walpole halted outside the debris. His gas mask had been blown to atoms with the observation post 14. They're trying to beat the news of their coming, he reflected aloud, which is why they smashed up the village. The telephone exchange was there. Tilly's under there somewheres. He fumbled with the rifle, suddenly swearing queerly hate-disoriented oaths. Tilly had not been the great love of Sergeant Walpole's life. She was merely a country telephone operator, reasonably pretty and flattered by his uniform. But she was under a mass of splintered wood and crushed brickwork, killed while trying to connect with tight beam to the area headquarters to report the monster rushing upon the village. That monster had destroyed the little settlement. There was nothing left at all but wreckage and the eight-foot tracks of monster treads. Sometimes those tracks crossed each other. Between them, wreckage survived to a height of as much as four feet, which was the clearance of Wobbly's body. Something roared low overhead. Sergeant Walpole swore bitterly, looked upward, and waited to die. But the small plane was American and old. It was a training plane, useless for front-line work. It dived to the earth. The pilot waved impatiently, and Walpole plunged to a place beside him. Instantly thereafter, the plane took off. What was it, shouted the pilot, sliding off at panic-stricken speeds across the treetops. They heard bombs go off all the way to Philly. Sent me. What in the hell was it? A thin, high wailing sound coming down as lightning might have imagined to descend. The pilot died madly and got behind a pine forest before the explosion and the concussion that followed it. Sergeant Walpole saw the pine trees shiver. The sheer explosion wave of that egg, if it hit an old ship like this in midair, would have stripped the fabrics from its wings. Set me down, said Sergeant Walpole. They're watching us from aloft. I sent the man on a monocycle to report. But he told luridly of the thing that had come to shore and of its destructiveness. Now set me down. Give me a gas mask and clear out. You ain't got a burglar's chance of getting back. The pilot set him down and began ticking away on a code center even as he landed. Then he climbed swiftly away from the sergeant, headed in a weaving crazy line to westward. Then things screamed downward and sergeant clapped his hands over his ears once more. The ground quivered underfoot, though eggs landed a good three quarters of a mile away. The training plane dropped like a plummet. The sharpness of a hydronite explosion carries its effect to quite incredible distances. The fabrics of its wings split to ribbons. The ship landed somewhere and smoke rose from it. You shot and not gone so high, said the Sergeant Walpole. He struck across country for the treads of the Wobbly once more. He saw a schoolhouse. The Wobbly had passed within a hundred yards of it. The schoolhouse seemed deserted. Then the sergeant saw the hole in its roof. Then he caught the infinitely faint taint of gas. Mighty anxious, said Sergeant Walpole woodenly, not to let news get ahead of him. Yeah, if it busts on places without warning, it'll have that much easier work. I hope I'm on the party when we get this damn thing. There was no use in approaching the schoolhouse, though he had a gas mask on now. Sergeant Walpole went on. Part 3. The Wadley made no attempt to do purely military damage. The enemy command realized that the destruction of civilian morale was even more important than the destruction of munitions factories. 
In this, the enemy displayed the same acumen that makes the war a fruitful subject of study to the strategic student. Strategic Lessons of the War, 1941 to 1943. U.S. War College, pages 81 through 82. At nightfall, the monster swerved suddenly and moved with greater speed. It showed no lights. It did not even make very much noise. Then the second flight of home defense planes made their attack. Sergeant Walpole heard them droning overhead. He lit a fire instantly. A little helicopter dropped from the blackness above him, and it began to heap dirt desperately on the blaze. Who's there, demanded a voice. Sergeant Walpole, Pulse 14, Eastern Coast Observation said the sergeant in a military manner. Beg to report, sir, that the dinkus that brought down the other ships is housed inside that big bulge on top of the wobbly. Get in, said the voice. The sergeant obeyed. With a purring noise, the helicopter shot upward. Then something went off in mid-skies miles ahead, where the faint humming noise had announced the flight of attack planes. A lurid, crackling detonation lit up the sky, one of the ships of the night flying squadron. From the helicopter, they could see the rest of the flight lined clearly in the flash of the explosion. Instantly thereafter, there was another such flash, then another. Three, said the voice beside Sergeant Walpole, and another flash. Four, the invisible operator of the screw lift ship was very calm about it. Five, six... The explosions lit the sky. Presently, it said grimly, That's all of them. I better report it. He was silent for a while. Sergeant Walpole saw his hand flickering a key up and down in the faint light of radio bulbs. Now shoot the works, said the helicopter man evenly. All the ships that attacked this afternoon went down. One of them started to report, but didn't get two words through. What did that damn thing use on him? A dink is on top, sir, said Sergeant Walpole formally. I'd found a motorcycle, sir, and it was trailing the thing. It come to a top of a hill and seen it moving through a pine wood, crashing down the trees in front of it like they wasn't there. Then an egg came down from God knows where up aloft. I stopped up my ears thinking it was aiming for me. Then I seen the ships. Two of them were falling. They landed, and I heard a couple of other explosions, little ones, they sounded like. The helicopter's wrist was flicking up and down. Little ones, he said sardonically. Those ships were carrying 500-pound bombs. It was those you heard going off? Maybe, conceded Sergeant Walpole. There were 20 or 30 ships flying in formation, going hell for leather for the wobbly. They were trailing it from the air. They were coming natural for me, because I was between them and it. Then my pants caught on fire. What? My pants caught on fire, said Sergeant Walpole, woodenly. I was sitting on a monocycle, trying to figure out which way to duck, and my pants caught on fire. The bike was getting hot. I climbed off of it and it blew up. My rifle got hot, too, and I chucked it away. Then I saw a ship go down on fire. The wobbly stopped still, and it hadn't fired a shot. I'll swear to that. Just my monocycle got hot and caught on fire. Then a ship busted out in flames and went down. A couple of more eggs come down and three ships dropped. Didn't hit them. The concussions blew the fabric off of them. Another one caught fire and crashed. Then another one. I looked and saw the next one catch. Then the next. It was like a searchlight beam hitting them. The pilot's hand flicked up and down interminably. There was a steady, fierce downbeat of the slipstream from the vertical propters. The helicopter swept forward in a swooping dash. The whole East Coast gone crazy, said the copter man dryly. Crazy fools trying to run away. Roads jammed, work stopped. It leaked out about the planes being wiped out today, and everybody in three states has heard these eggs going off. You're the only living man who's seen that crawling thing and lived to tell about it. I've sent your stuff back. What's that about the thing on top? I hit, said Sergeant Walpole woodenly. The Wobblies sent over gas shells where the ships landed. Then it went on, heading west. It got a crazy-looking dinkins on top like a searchlight. That moved while the ships were catching fire and crashing. Just like a searchlight. 
It moved and the ship went down, but the wobbly didn't fire a shot. The helicopter's man wrist flexed swiftly. God, said Sergeant Walpole in sudden agony, drop, quick. The helicopter went down like a stone. A propter shrieked away into space. Metalwork up aloft glowed dully red. Then there were whipping and lashing branches closing swiftly all around the helicopter. A jerk, a crash, stillness, the smell of growing things all about. Well, said the copter pilot. They turned it on us, whatever it is, said Sergeant Walpole. They near got us, too. A match scratched. A cigarette glowed. The sergeant fumbled for a smoke himself. I'm waiting for the metal to cool off, said the helicopter pilot. Maybe we can take off again. They located us with the loop while they got sending your stuff. Damn! I see what they've got. What? A way of transmitting real power in a radio beam, said the copter man. You've seen eddy current stoves. Everybody cooks with them nowadays. A coil with a high frequency current. You can stick your hand in it, but nothing happens. But if you stick an iron pan down in the coil, and it gets hot and cooks things. Hysteresis. The same thing that used to make transformer cords get hot. The same thing that happens near any beam transmitter. Only you have to measure the heating effect with a thermocouple. The iron absorbs the radio waves and gets hot. The chaps in the wobbly can probably put 10,000 horsepower in a damn beam. We can't. But any iron in the way will get hot. It blows up a ship at once. Your monocycle and your rifle too. Damn. He knocked ash off his cigarette. Scientific, those chaps. I'll see if that metal's cool. Something whined overhead, rising swiftly to a shriek as it descended. Sergeant Walpole cowered with his hands to his ears. But it was not an earth-shaking concussion. It was an explosion, yes, but subtly different from the rendering snap of hydronite. Gas, said the sergeant sully and fumbled for his mask. No good, said the copter man briefly. Visicatory, smell it? I guess they've got us. No sag suits, not even sag paste. The sergeant lit a match. The flame bent a little from vertical. There's a wind. We got a chance. Get going, then, said the copter man. Run up, wind. Sergeant Walpole slid over the side and ran. A hundred yards, two hundred. Pinewoods have little undergrowth. He heard the copter's engine start. The ship tried to lift. He redoubled his speed. Presently, he broke out into open, plowed land. In the starlight, he saw a barn, and he raced towards that. Someone else plunged out of the woods towards him. The helicopter engine was still roaring faintly in the distance. Then a thin whine came down from aloft. When the echoes of the explosion died away, the pilot was grinning queerly. The helicopter's engine was still. I said it could be done. Pack of fatheads at headquarters. Huh? Picking up a ship by its spark plugs with a loop. They're doing that up aloft. There's a ship up there. 40,000 feet or so. Maybe half a dozen ships refueling in air, I guess, and working with the thing you call the wobbly. When I started the copter's engines, they got the spark impulses and sighted on them. We'd better get away from here. Horses in here, said Sergeant Walpole. The wobbly came by. No people left. They brought the animals out. The horses reared and plunged as they were infinitely sharp, deadly explosions of the eggs coming down eight miles through the darkness. Let's go. After the wobbly, said the copter man. Of course, said Sergeant Walpole. Somebody's got to find out how to lick it. They went clattering through the darkness. It was extraordinary what desolation, what utter lack of human life they moved through. They came to a town and there was a taint of gas in the air. No lights burned in that town. It was dead. The wobbly had killed it. Part 4 Which panic was enhanced by the destruction of a second flight of fighting planes. However, the destruction of Bensboro completed civilian demoralization. A newscasting company rebroadcast a private television contact with the town at the moment the wobbly entered it. Practically all the inhabitants of the Atlantic coast heard and saw the annihilation of the town, hearing cries of gas and the screams of the people, 
and hearing the crashings of the wobbly crushed its way inexorably across the city, spreading terror everywhere. Frenzied demands were made upon the government for recall of troops from the front to offer battle to the wobbly. It's considered that at that time, the one wobbly had military effect equal to at least half a million men. Strategic Lessons of War of 1941 to 1943, U.S. War College, pages 83 through 84. They did not enter the town. There was just enough starlight to show that the wobbly had gone through it and then crashed back and forth ruthlessly. There was a great gash the center of buildings nearest the edge, and there were other gashes visible here and there. Everything was crushed down utterly flat in two eight-foot paths. There was a mass of crumbled debris four feet high at its highest in between tread marks. They looked silently and went on. They reached a railroad track, the quadruple track of a branch line from New York to Philadelphia. The wobbly was going along that right-of-way. There was no right-of-way left where it had been. Rails were crushed flat. Culverts were broken through, but the horses raced along the smooth tread trails. Once broken, twisted rail tore at Sergeant Walpole's sleeve. Somehow, the last great plate of a tread had bent it upward. Presently, they saw a mass of something dark off to the left. Flames were licking meditatively at one of the wrecked cars. Then they heard explosions far ahead. Flames lighted the sky. Our men in action, said Sergeant Walpole hungrily. He flogged his mount mercilessly. Then the sky became bright in the distance. The horses going down the crushed smooth trail of the treads gained upon the din. Then they saw the cause of it, miles distance. A train was burning luridly. Its forepart was wreckage, pure and simple. The rest was going up in flames and detonations. Munitions, of course. The wobbly was off at one side, flame-lit and monstrous, sliding smoothly out of sight. Ten miles of railroad, said the copter pilot calmly, smashed out of existence. That's going to scare our people to fits. They can drop eggs till the cows come home, and every egg will smash up a hundred yards of right-of-way, and we can build it back up again in four hours with a mobile track layer. But ten miles to be regraded and laid is different. Half of America will be imagining all our railroads smashed and starvation ahead. A piercing light fell upon them. Shut it off, roared Sergeant Walpole. Do you want to get us killed? He and the copter pilot swerved. There was a car there, a huge two-wheeled car whose driver's scopes hummed softly while the driver tried to extract it from something it was tangled in. I commandeer this car, said the copter pilot. Military necessity. We have to trail that wobbly. Someone grunted. Lights flashed on within. The copter pilot and Sergeant Walpole stiffened to attention. The stars of a major general shone upon the collar of the stout man within. Beg pardon, sir, said the pilot and was still. Hmm, said the major general. There seems to be just four of us alive who've seen the thing clearly. I hit upon it by accident, I'll admit. What do you know about it? It comes from a tramp steamer, began Sergeant Walpole. Hmm, you're Sergeant Walpole. Mention the dispatches tomorrow, Sergeant. You, sir? It's weapons against our plane, sir, said the copter man precisely. Is a radio beam carrying several thousand horsepower of energy. When it hits iron, sir, the energy is absorbed and the iron heats up and blows up the ship. The Waddle is working with a bomber well aloft, sir, which spots planes from below by picking up their spark plug flashes in a directional loop. The bomber aloft, sir, drops eggs when the wobblies attacked. Sergeant Walpole reports several planes disabled by their fabric being blown off their wings. I know, said the Major General. Damn it, the front takes every ship that'll fit to go aloft. We have only wrecks back here. You sure about that spark plug affair? Yes, sir, said the copter pilot. My ship crashed, sir. I started the motors again trying to take off. Eggs began to drop about me instantly. Nasty, said the Major General. I was going to join my men. 
we flung a line of artillery ahead of the thing. Motor-driven, of course, but they can pick up motors by the spark waves. The bomber knows all about it. Nasty. He lit a cigar calmly. The gyro car shifted suddenly and backed away from the thing it had been tangled in. Why ain't the bombers been shot down, demanded Sergeant Walpole angrily. Damn it, sir, if it wasn't for the bombers. Up to an hour ago, said the Major General. We had lost 68 planes trying to get those bombers. You see, it works both ways. The bombers drop eggs to help the Wobbly defend itself, and the Wobbly uses that power beam you spoke of to wipe the sky clean about the bombers. I wonder how it was done. Before you explain, sir, do you men want to come with me? Get on the running board if you like. We shall probably be killed. The gyro car purred softly away with two horses left wandering and the two men clinging fast in a sweep of wind. They found a ribbon of concrete road, and the wind sang as the car picked up speed. Then suddenly it bucked madly and went out of control, and as suddenly was passing along the road again. The wobbly had passed over the roadway here. Then they heard gunfire ahead. Honest, malevolent gunfire. Flashes lit the horizon. The gyro car sped up until it fairly hummed and the wind rushed into the nostrils and the mouth of the men on the running boards. The cannonade increased. It reached really respectable proportions until it became a titanic din. As the road rose up along the incline, a shell burst in midair in plain view, and the driver of the gyro car jammed on the brakes and looked down upon the strangest sights below. There were other hills yet ahead, and from behind them came that faint, indefinite glow which is the glow of the lights of the city at the bottom of the valley a mile and a half distant there was the wobbly star shells flared near it casting it into intolerable brightness and clear relief and other shells were breaking upon it and all about it from beyond the rim of the hills came flashes of guns the air was full of screaming and many crashes the wobbly was motionless it looked more than ever like a monstrous, deadly centipede. It was under a rain of fire that would have shattered a dreadnought of the 1920s. Its monstrous treads were motionless. It seemed queerly quiescent, abstract. It seemed less defiant of the shell fire that broke upon it like hail of hell than indifferent to it. Yes, it seemed indifferent. Only the queer excrescence on its top moved, and that stirred vaguely. Star shells floated overhead and bathed it in pitless light, and it remained motionless. Sergeant Walpole had a vague impression of a colossal detonation taking place miles above his head, but the sound was lost in the drum fire of artillery nearer at hand. Then a gun on the wobbly moved. It spouted a flash of bluish flame then another and another. It seemed to fire gas shells into the town at this moment, ignoring the batteries playing upon it. It was still again, where the queer esquiescence on its back moved vaguely and its shell burst about it in a very inferno. Then the treads moved, and with a swift celebrity, the wobbly moved smoothly forward and up the incline toward the cannonade guns, it went over the top of the incline, and those in the gyro car saw its reception. Guns opened upon it at point-blank range. Now the wobbly itself went into action. In the light of the star shells and explosions, they saw its guns begin to bellow. It went swiftly and malevolently forward, moving with centipedean smoothness. It dipped out of sight. The cannonade lessened. Two guns stopped. Three... Half the guns were out of action. A dozen guns ceased to fire. One last weapon boomed desperately at its maximum rate of fire. That stopped. The night became strangely, terribly still. The Major General put aside his radiovision receiver. Although neither the helicopter pilot nor Sergeant Walpole had noticed it, he had opened communication the instant the gyro car came to a stop. Now the Major General was desperately, terribly white. 
The artillery is wiped out, he observed detachedly. The wobbly, it seems, is going on into the town. They did not want to listen. Those men who waited futilely by the gyro car, which had witnessed the invulnerability of the wobbly to all attack, they did not want to listen at all. But they heard the noises as the wobbly crashed across the town, back and forth. Moral effect, said the Major General, through stiff lips. That's what it's for, to break down the morale behind the lines. Good God, what hellish things mere words can mean. Part 5 The only weak spot in the Wobbly's design, apparently, was the necessity of using its entire engine power in the power beam with which it protected itself and its attendant bombers from aerial attack. For a time, before New Brunswick, it was forced to remain still under fire, while it fought off and destroyed an attacking fleet eight miles above it. With sufficiently powerful artillery, it might have been destroyed at that moment, but it was invulnerable to the artillery available. Deliberately false statements were broadcast to reassure the public, but the public was already skeptical as it later became incredulous of official reports of victories. The destruction of New Brunswick became known despite official denials, and the colossal riots broke out among the inhabitants of the larger cities, intent upon escape from defenseless towns. Orders were actually issued withdrawing a quarter of a million men from the front-line reserve with artillery in proportion to their forces. Strategic Lessons of War 1941 to 1943, U.S. War College, page 42. The Major General left them at the town, now quite still and silent. Sergeant Walpole said detachedly, We'll probably find a portable reader, sir, and trail the wobbly. That's about all we can do, sir. It looks, said the Major General rather desperately, as if that is all anybody can do. I'm going on to take command ahead. The copter pilot said politely, Sir, if you're going to sow mines for the wobbly, of course. That power beam can explode them, sir, before the wobbly gets to them. May I suggest, sir, that the mine cases with no metal in them at all would be worth trying? Thank you, said the Major General grimly. I'll have concrete ones made. Sergeant Walpole grunted suddenly. Look here, sir. That wobbly stops when it uses that dinkus on top. This guy here says it uses a lot of power, four or five thousand horsepower. More likely ten or twenty, said the copter pilot. Maybe, said Sergeant Walpole profoundly. It takes all the power they got to work that dinkus. They were working it just now when the artillery was slamming them. So next time you want to tackle it, stick a flock of bombs around and attack the bombers too. If they're kept busy down below, maybe the planes can get the bombers, or otherwise they'll get a chance to use a big gun on the wobbly. The Major General nodded. We four, he observed, we are the only living men who've actually seen the wobbly and gotten away. I shall use both your suggestions, and I shall not send those orders by radio, not even type beam radio. I'll carry them myself. Good luck. A non-commissioned officer of the Eastern Coast Observation Fort and a yet uncommissioned flying cadet waved a cheerful goodbye to the major general in charge of home defense in three states. Then he went on into the town. Monocycles first, said Sergeant Walpole, and a sender. The copter man nodded. The streetlights of the town dimmed and brightened. The wobbly had paused only to create havoc. Not to produce utter chaos, it had gone back and forth over the town two or three times, spewing out gas as it went. But most of the town was still standing, and the powerhouse had not been touched. Only its untended diesels had checked before a fuel pump cleared. They found the cycle shop, its back wall bulged in by a wreckage against it. Sergeant Walpole inspected its wares expertly. A voice began to speak suddenly. A television set had somehow been turned on by the crash that bulged the back wall. 
The monster tank has been held in check, said a smug voice encouragingly, encountered by home defense troops and artillery. It proved unable to face shell fire. Liars, said the copter man calmly. He picked up the nearest loose object and flung it into the bland face of the official news announcer. The television set went dead, but there were hissings and sputtering in its interior. He had flung a Bissell battery at it. One of a display group and its high-tension terminals had hissed and sparked among the stray wires in the cabinet. That makes me mad, said the copter man grimly. Lying for morale. The other side murders our civilians to break down morale, and our side lies about it to build morale back up again. To hell with morale. Sergeant Walpole reached in and pulled out the battery. Bissell batteries turn out 600 volts these days, and they make a fat spark when short circuited For God's sake, said Sergeant Walpole, if they can pick up sparks from a motor, can't they pick them up from this? What the hell are you doing? You want them dropping eggs on us? Say! He stopped short, his eyes burning. He began to talk, suddenly groping for words while he waved a high-powered small battery in his hand. The helicopter man listened, at first skeptically, and then with equally hungry enthusiasm. Sergeant, he said evenly, that's a great idea, a whale of an idea, a hell of a fine idea. Let's get some rockets. Why rockets, demanded Sergeant Walpole in his turn. What you going to do, celebrate the 4th of July? The copter man explained this time, and Sergeant Walpole seized upon the addition. Then they began a hunt. They roved the town over, and it was not pleasant. When the Wobbly had gone into that town, there had been very many living human beings in it. Some of them had believed in the ability of the artillery to defend the town against a single monster. Some had no means of getting away, but all of them had tried to get away when the Wobbly went lurching among the houses. For them, the Wobbly had spewed out deadly gases. It also had simply forged ahead, and the two living men in their gas masks paid as little attention as possible to the bodies in the streets. Most of them in flimsy night clothing struck down into a frenzy flight, but they could not help seeing too much. In the end, they went back to the artillery positions and found signal rockets there. Two full cases of them, marvelously unexploded. A little later, Two monocycles purred madly in the beaten-down pass of the monstrous treads. Sergeant Walpole bore very many Bissell batteries, which will deliver 600 volts even on short circuits for half an hour at a time. The copter man carried some of them, too, and both men were loaded down. When dawn came, they were hollow-eyed and gaunt and weary. It had started to rain, too, and both of them were drenched. They could see no more than a couple of hundred yards in every direction, and they were hungry. They had seen things that no man should have looked upon in the way of destruction. They came upon a wrecked artillery train just as the world lightened to a pallid gray. Guns twisted and burst. Caissons, no more than shattered scraps of metal. Because of the explosions of the shells within, and the tread tracks of the wobbly led across the mess. Steam still rose, hissing softly from the bent and twisted guns which had burst when they were heated to redness by the power beam. And there was a staff gyro car crumpled against a tree where it had been flung by some explosion or other. There were neither sound nor wounded men about, only dead ones. The wobbly had been here. Hello, said the copter man in a dreary levity. There's a portable vision set in this car. Let's call up the general and see how he is. Sergeant Walpole spat, then held up his hand. He was listening. Far off in the drumming downpour of the rain, there was a rumbling sound. He had heard it before. It was partly made up of the noise of internal combustion engines of unthinkable power and partly of grumbling treads forcing a way through reluctant trees. It was a long way off now, but it was coming nearer. The wobbly, said Sergeant Walpole, coming back? Why hell's bells? Why is it coming back? I don't know, said the copter man, but let's get some rockets 
fixed up. The two of them work almost lackadaisically. They were tired out, but they took the tiny pistol batteries and twisted the attached wires about the rocket heads. They had 20 or 30 of them fixed by the time the noise of the wobbly was very near. There was the noise of felt trees pushed down by the wobbly in its progress. Great crackling crashes, then crunching sounds, and above them, thunderous smooth purring rumble of the monster. The copter man climbed into the upside-down staff car. He turned the vision set on and fiddled absurdly with the controls. The bomber up aloft is sending its stuff down a beam, a tight beam to the wobbly. Listen to it. The uncouth, crackling syllables of the enemy tongue came from the vision set. Someone was speaking crisply and precisely somewhere. Blurred, indistinct flashes appeared upon the vision set screen. They ought to be worried, said the copter man wearily. Even an infrared telescope can't pick up a damn thing through the clouds like this, and the wobbly's in a mess without a bomber to help. Sergeant Walpole did not reply. He was exhausted. He sat looking tiredly off through the rain in the direction of the approaching noise. Somehow, it did not occur to him to run away. He sat quite still, smoking a soggy cigarette. Something big and huge appeared behind a monstrous oak tree. It came on. The oak tree crackled, crashed, and went down. It was ground under by the monstrous war engine that went over it. The wobbly was unbelievably impersonal and horrible in its progress. There had been a filling station for driver cars close by the place where the artillery train had been wrecked. One of the eight-foot treads loomed over that station, descended upon it, and the filling station was no more. The wobbly was then not more than a hundred yards from Sergeant Walpole, less than a city block. He looked at it in weary detachment. It was as high as a four-story house, and it was 200 feet long and 40 feet wide at the treads with the monstrous gum bulges reaching out an extra 10 or 15 feet on either side above, and it came grumbling on toward him. Part 6 Considered as a strategic move, the wobbly was a triumph. Eighteen hours after its landing, the orders for troops called for half a million men to be withdrawn from the forces at the front and in reserve, and munitions factories were being diverted from the supply of the front to the manufacture of devices designed to cope with it. This, in turn, entailed changes in the frontline activities of the command. Altogether, it may be said that the wobbly 18 hours after its landing, was exerting the military pressure of an army of not less than a half a million men upon the most vulnerable spot in our defenses, the rear. And when its effect upon the civilian morale is concerned, the wobbly, as of force in being, constituted the most formidable military unit in history. Strategic Lessons of the War, 1941-1943. U.S. War College, page 43. As Sergeant Walpole saw the wobbly, there was no sign of humanity anywhere about the thing. It was a monstrous mass of metal, powder stained now where shells had burst upon it, and it seemed metallically alive, impersonally living. The armored tube with its vision slits at its ends must have been the counterpart of a ship's bridge but it looked like an eye ridge of an insect's face. The bulbous control rooms at the ends looked like a gigantic insect's multifaceted eyes. And the huge treads, so thick as to constitute armor for its own protection, were so cunningly joined and sprung that they too seemed like part of a living thing. It came within 20 yards of the staff car with the copter man in it and Sergeant Walpole smoking outside. It ignored them. It had destroyed all life at this place. The Sergeant Walpole alone was visible. He sat motionless and detached, unemotionally waiting to be killed. The wobbly clanked and rubbled and roared oblivious past them. 
Sergeant Walpole saw the flexing springs in the tread joints, and there were hundreds of them, of a size to support a freight car. He saw a refuge tube casually ejecting a gush of malorious stuff in which the garbage of a mess table was plainly identifiable. A drop or two of the stuff splashed upon him, and he smelled coffee. And then the treads lifted, and he saw the monstrous gas-spreading tubes at the stern and the exhaust pipes into which he could have ridden monocycle and all. Then he saw a man in the wobbly. There were ventilation ports open at the pointed stern, and a man was looking out, some 15 feet above the ground, smoking placidly and looking out at the terrain the wobbly left behind it. He was wearing an enemy uniform cap. The monster went on. The roar of its passing diminished a little, and the copter man came suddenly out of the staff car, struggling with the portable vision set. I think we can do it, he said shortly. It's in constant beam communication with a bomber up aloft, and I think they're worried up there because they can't see a damn thing. But it's a good team. With the Wobbly's beam, which takes so much power no bomber could possibly carry it, the bombers are safe, and the bombers can locate any mortar-driven thing that might attack the Wobbly and blow it to hell. But right now they can't see it. So I think we can do it. Coming? Sergeant Walpole threw away his cigarette and rose stiffly. Even those few moments of rest had intensified his weariness. He flung a leg over the monocycle seat and pointed tirely to the trail of the Wobbly. It neared parallel here, a ribbon of country road which once had been a reasonably important feeder highway. Let's go. They went off through the rain along the road, nearly parallel to the route the Wobbly was taking. Rain beat at them. Off in the woods to their right, the Wobbly noise grew louder as they overtook it. They passed it and came abruptly out of the wooded area upon cultivated fields, rolling and beautifully cared for. There had been a farm headquarters off to one side and a huge central station for all the agricultural work on which once could have been a half a country, but there were jagged walls where the buildings had been and smoke still rose from the place. Then the wobbly came out of the woods, a dim gray monstrous shape in the rain. The helicopter man pulled at the ignition cord and a rocket began to sputter. He made a single wipe with his knife blade along the twisted insulated wires of the Bissell battery and a wavering blue spark leaped into being. The rocket shot upward, curved down, and landed with enough force to bury its head in a muddy, plowed earth and concealed the signal flare that must have been ignited. That ought to do it, said the copter man. Let's send some more. Sergeant Walpole got exhaustedly off his monocycle and duplicated the copter man's efforts. A second rocket, a third, or a dozen or more rockets went off each one bearing a wavering, uncertain blue spark at its tip. And that spark would continue for a half an hour or more. In a loop aerial, eight miles up, it might sound like a spark plug, or it might sound like something else. But it would not sound like the sort of thing that ought to spring up suddenly in front of the wobbly, and it would sound like something that had better be bombed for safety's sake. The wobbly was moving across the plowed fields with deceptive smoothness, it was drawing nearer and nearer to the spot where the rockets had plunged to earth. It stopped. Another rocket left the weary pair of men. It's nearly flashless exhaust, invisible in the daytime anyway. The wobbly backed slowly from the irregular line where the first rocket sparked invisibly. It was no more than a distinct gray shadow in the falling rain, but the queer bulk atop of its body moved suddenly. Like a searchlight, the power beam swept the earth before the wobbly, but nothing happened. The copter man turned on the vision set he had packed from the staff gyro car. Voices, crisp and anxious, came out of it. He caressed the set affectionately. Listen to him, Sergeant, he said hungrily. They're worried. The voices changed suddenly. 
There was a dozen musical buzzing in the set, as of two dozen splitting spark in as many tones all going at once. Letting the guys on the wobbly hear what they hear, said the copter man grimly. If God's good to us now, the voice has changed again. They stopped. The wobbly itself was still halted in its passage across a clear and rain-swept field by little sparking sounds which seemed to indicate the presence of something that had better be bombed for safety's sake. A thin whining noise came down from aloft. It rose to a piercing shriek, and there was a gigantic crater half a mile from the wobbly from which smoke rose lazily. The wobbly remained motionless. Another whining noise, which turned into a shrink. The explosion was terrific. It was a bit nearer the wobbly. We'll send them some more rockets, the copter man said. They went hissing invisibly through the rain. The wobbly backed cautiously away from the spot where they landed, because they were wholly invisible, and they made a sound which those in the wobbly could not understand. As always, to a savage, the unexplained is dangerous. Modern warfare has reached the same high peaks of wisdom. The wobbly drew off from the sparks because it could not know what made them, and because it had used its power beam and the bomber had dropped its bombs without stopping or destroying them. It was not inconceivable to anybody on either the wobbly or the bombers aloft that inexplicable things could be especially contrived to confront the wobblies, unless they were contrived to destroy it. They don't know what in the hell they're up against, said the copter man joyously. Now let's give them fits. The rockets went off in swift succession. To the blinded men in the bomber above the clouds, it seemed that an unexplained mechanisms were springing into action by dozens, all about the wobbly. They were mechanisms. They were electric mechanisms. They were obviously designed to have some effect on the wobbly and the Wobbly had no defense against the unguessed at effects of an unknown weapons, except bombs began to rain from the sky. The Wobbly crawled toward the last gap left in the ring of mysterious mechanisms that closed. Triumphant singing sparks sprang viciously in the amplifiers. Nothing was visible. Nothing. Perhaps that was the precipitated panic. The bombers rained down their deadly missiles, and somebody forgot the exact length of time it takes a bomb to drop eight miles. Sergeant Walpole and the copter man were flat on the ground with their hands to their ears. The ground bucked and smote them. The unthinkable violence of hexanite explosions tore at their nerves, even at their sanity. And then there was an explosion with a subtle difference in its sound. Sergeant Walpole looked up at his head throbbing, his eyes watering, dizzy and dazed and bleeding at the nose and ears. Then he bumped into the copter man, shuddering on the ground. He did it deliberately. There was a last crashing sound, and some of the blasted earth spattered upon them. But then the copter man looked where Sergeant Walpole pointed dizzily. The wobbly was careened crazily on one side. One of its tread was uncoiling slowly from its frame. Its stern was blown in. Someone had forgotten how long it takes a bomb to drop eight miles, and the wobbly had crawled under one. More from the racked open stern, the wobbly there was coming a roaring, sp spitting cloud of gas. The wobbly's storage tanks of gas had been set off. Inside it would be a shambles. Its crew would be dead, killed by the gas the wobbly itself had broadcast in its wake. Part 7 It is a point worth noting by any student of strategy that while the wobbly in working solely for the effectiveness in lowering civilian morale worked upon sound principles, yet the destruction of the wobbly by Sergeant Walpole and Flight Cadet Ryerson immediately repaired all the damage done. Had it worked towards a more direct military aims, its work would have survived it. It remains a 
pretty question for the student whether the enemy command with the information it possessed made the soundest strategic use of its unparalleled weapon. But on the whole, the raid of the Wobbly remains the most startling single strategic operations of the war, if only because of its tremendous effect upon civilian morale. Strategic Lessons of the War, 1941 to 1943. Yours, War College, pages 94 to 96. A major general climbed out of a staff gyro car and waded through the mud for a half a mile, after which he, in person, waked two sleeping men. They were sprawled out in the puddle of the rain, which had gathered in a war-torn tread from the wobbly. They waked with extreme reluctance and then yawned even in the act of saluting a military manner. Yes, sir, said Sergeant Walpole, yawning again. Yes, sir, the bomber's gone. We heard him trying to raise the wobbly for half an hour after she'd blown up. Then they cut off. I think they went home, sir. Most likely, sir, they think we used some new dinkus on the wobbly. And ain't likely they'll realize they blew it up themselves for us. The Major General gave crisp orders. Men began to explore the wobbly cautiously. He turned back to the two sleepy and disreputable men who had caused its destruction. His aspect was one of perplexity and admiration. What did you men do? he demanded warmly. What in the hell did you do? Sergeant Walpole grinned tiredly. The copter man spoke for him. I think, sir, said the helicopter man, that we affected the morale of the Wobblies and the bomber's crews. Morale, a story of the war of 1941 to 1943 by Murray Leinster, recorded by Ralph J. Martin. Spacemen Never Die by Morris Hirschman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stacy Dugan Wilcox. Spacemen Never Die by Morris Hirschman. Henry Weller stood facing a huge three dimensional picture on the wall of his dining room. Can't we get rid of it? he asked, turning to his wife. I mean, with all due respect, of course. No man enjoys coming into his dining room and having to sit at meals and look at a full-sized picture of his wife's first husband arriving on Venus. Fair's fair, but such a setup is ridiculous. No, Phoebe shook her blonde head. Don Manton loved me, and he was famous. I like to be reminded of the days when my picture was in all the telepapers and my face on so many telescreens. She might just as well have called him a tattered non-entity— though Henry was doing pretty well as a foreman in the local human droid factory. He was stopped from reminding her by Phoebe saying that she'd leave for a bit of shopping. She left abruptly. Henry watched her take off from the roof of their two-story fibroid house and went back to the dining room. Now, even his warmest admirers would give in that he had a streak of stubbornness in him a mile wide and six miles deep. Henry took the three-dimensional monstrosity off the wall, holding it hard by thumb and forefinger in its luminex frame, and prepared to say goodbye to the picture of Don Manton. A foreman at one of the human droid shops has to be able to consider alternatives, and Henry had done this. If he only hid the picture, there'd be a domestic crisis, and the picture would sooner or later be back on the wall. If he destroyed it, there'd also be a crisis, but one that would eventually blow over. Unluckily for him, these three-dimensional wall pictures were made out of glassine, and when he tried setting fire to it, he nearly burned down the house. Upon feeding it to the old-fashioned fireplace, nothing grew hot except his temper. Ripping the picture to shreds would have been the next step, but you can't rip glassine. For maybe the sixth millionth time, he cursed out Don Manton, the well-known explorer in the realm of outer space. Henry understood in a general way that Don Manton had been among the first to chart the cities of Mars and Venus, and had accidentally died on a planet named Immel, but Henry had no intention of living in Don Manton's shadow. 
The picture, which showed the late explorer talking with three Venusians, had been hung up again when Phoebe came through the ceiling door along the extension stairway which flicked up to meet her. You've been trying to get rid of Don's picture. He'd hung it crookedly, and a diagonal slash of white wallpaper had given him away. Just this one. You got cans of telefilm in the cellar, but them I don't mind. This, he flicked it with a thumbnail, I do mind. As long as I stay, Phoebe said quietly, my darling Don's picture stays. But what about your darling Henry? Am I just a human droid who looks and behaves and talks like a human being? Haven't I got feelings? Henry strode around the room, hitting the fibroid floor like a prehistoric monster on a sandpaper bridge. Either that picture goes, he said finally, definitely, or I go. Phoebe shook out her blonde hair, letting it fall about her shoulders. Too bad. Inside of an hour he had packed his suitcases. Phoebe cried bitterly, but wouldn't budge about the picture. Henry took the plane. He put up at his club went to the bar, and was gobbling down something called pressurized scotch when he heard a noise back of him. "'Get away from me,' said Henry, who was quite a few over the traditional eight by this time. "'I've had enough of Don Manton, let alone his helpers.' Speed Rocks, who had taken a couple of trips with Manton, was tall and thin as the bar stool, and with a spaceman's ability to think fast when he had to. Loudly, he ordered a Venus whiz, explaining to a disgusted Henry— after the barkeep mixes the drink, he melts the swizzle stick and pours that in, too. He gulped the stuff down gratefully and then said, Tell me your troubles, Hank. Henry did. Speed Roggs looked disgusted. Are you serious? he asked, and when Henry swore to cut Speed's throat on asking that again, went on, Women are space mad. As Henry agreed, Roggs said, The one thing you don't understand about Don Manton is that he was maladjusted. He couldn't stay still. He always wanted what he couldn't have. That goes for his feelings for women, too. Henry looked up with bloodshot eyes nearly popping out of his head. Roggs kept going. Don and Phoebe never got along once they were married. It was Manton's fault. Like all explorers, he was unhappy over his lot and looked beyond the rainbow. In fact, he told me once that the only reason he went in for exploring space was to get away from his wife. Henry Weller suddenly rocked with laughter. He got to his feet, took rugs, and went to his room still laughing. He lay on the bed for half an hour. At the end of that time, he sat up. Tell the manager I won't be here for supper, he said to Speed. I've got a little trip to make. Where are you going? Home, to give the good tidings to my wife. Henry's fibroid house looked about the same. He parked the plane and let himself in by the roof door and down the extension staircase. He found Phoebe in the kitchen bent over a pot, and at the sound of him, she turned. A near smile flickered in her blue eyes. Phoebe? Henry? They laughed together. Henry wanted to tell her what he knew as bitterly and maliciously as possible, but he simply opened his mouth a few times. He couldn't say it. Everyone is entitled to an illusion, and this was Phoebe, his blonde wench, his wife, his woman. He looked a bit sick. She smiled. Come into the dining room. The three-dimensional picture had been rolled up into the corner. Henry promised to put it away in the cellar and clean up the cellar as soon as he could. Phoebe said that her first husband had never liked to stay home. He'd always been afraid to live normally. I was wrong about the picture, she told him, and I didn't know till I saw you leave the house. It goes without saying that Henry and his Phoebe lived happily ever after, but it is perhaps not so well known that Phoebe was left with a little disposal problem, too. She had a rough time finding a buyer, in secret, of course, for her brand-new human droid, who looked and behaved and talked so exactly like that well-known flyer, Speed Rogs. End of Spacemen Never Die by Morris Hirschman Recording by Stacy Dugan Wilcox. To Be or Not to Be by Kurt Vonnegut. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. To Be or Not to Be 
by Kurt Vonnegut. Everything was perfectly swell. There were no prisons, no slums, no insane asylums, no cripples, no poverty, no wars. All diseases were conquered, so was old age. Death, barring accidents, was an adventure for volunteers. The population of the United States was stabilized at 40 million souls. One bright morning in the Chicago Lying in Hospital, a man named Edward K. Welling, Jr. waited for his wife to give birth. He was the only man waiting. Not many people were born a day anymore. Welling was 56, a mere stripling in a population whose average age was 129. X-rays had revealed that his wife was going to have triplets. The children would be his first. Young Welling was hunched in his chair, his head in his hand. He was so rumpled, so still and colorless as to be virtually invisible. His camouflage was perfect, since the waiting room had a disorderly and demoralized air, too. Chairs and ashtrays had been moved away from the walls. The floor was paved with spattered drop cloths. The room was being redecorated. It was being redecorated as a memorial to the man who had volunteered to die. A sardonic old man, about 200 years old, sat on a stepladder, painting a mural he did not like. Back in the days when people aged visibly, his age would have been guessed at 35 or so. Aging had touched him that much before the cure for aging was found. The mural he was working on depicted a very neat garden. Men and women in white, doctors and nurses, turned the soil, planted seedlings, sprayed bugs, spread fertilizer. Men and women in purple uniforms pulled up weeds, cut down plants that were old and sickly, raked leaves, carried refuse to trash burners. Never, 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 not even in medieval Holland or nor old Japan, had a garden been more formal, been better tended. Every plant had all the loam, light, water, air, and nourishment it could use. A hospital orderly came down the corridor, singing under his breath a popular song. If you don't like my kisses, honey, here's what I will do. I'll go see a girl in purple, kiss this sad world to the loo. If you don't want my loving, why should I take up all this space? I'll get off this old planet, let some sweet baby have my place. The orderly looked in at the mural and the muralist. Looks so real, he said. I can practically imagine I'm standing in the middle of it. What makes you think you're not in it? said the painter. He gave a satiric smile. It's called the happy garden of life, you know. That's good of Dr. Hitz, said the orderly. He was referring to one of the male figures in white, whose head was a portrait of Dr. Benjamin Hitz, the hospital's chief obstetrician. Hitz was a blindingly handsome man. A lot of faces still to fill in, said the orderly. He meant that the faces of many of the figures in the mural were still blank. All blanks were to be filled with portraits of important people, on either the hospital staff or from the Chicago office of the Federal Bureau of Termination. Must be nice to be able to make pictures that look like something, said the orderly. The painter's face curdled with scorn. I think I'm proud of this job, he said. I think this is my idea of what life really looks like. What's your idea of what life looks like? said the orderly. The painter gestured at a foul drop cloth. There's a good picture of it, he said. Frame that, and you'll have a picture a damn sight more honest than this one. You're a gloomy old duck, aren't you? said the orderly. Is that a crime? said the painter. The orderly shrugged. If you don't like it here, Grandpa, he said, and he finished the thought with the trick telephone number that people who didn't want to live anymore were supposed to call. The zero in the telephone number, he pronounced, not. The number was 2BR, not 2B. 
It was the telephone number of an institution whose fanciful sobriquets included Automat, Birdland, Cannery, Catbox, D Louser, Easy Go, Goodbye Mother, Happy Hooligan, Kiss Me Quick, Lucky Pierre, Sheep Dip, Warren Blender, Weep No More, and Why Worry? To be or not to be was the telephone number of the municipal gas chambers of the Federal Bureau of Termination. The painter thumped his nose at the orderly. When I decide it's time to go, he said, we won't be at the sheep dip. A do your yourself eh? said the orderly. Messy business, Grandpa. Why don't you have a little consideration for the people who have to clean up after you? The painter expressed with an obscenity his lack of concern for the tribulation of his survivors. The world could do with a good deal more mess if you ask me, he said. The orderly laughed and moved on. Welling, the waiting father, mumbled something without raising his head, and then he fell silent again. A coarse, formidable woman strode into the waiting room on spike heels. Her shoes, stockings, trench coat, bag, and overseas cap were all purple, the purple the painter called the color of grapes on Judgment Day. The medallion on her purple musette bag was the seal of the service division of the Federal Bureau of Termination, an eagle perched on a turnstile. The woman had a lot of facial hair, an unmistakable mustache, in fact. A curious thing about gas chamber hostesses was that, no matter how lovely and feminine they were when recruited, they all sprouted mustaches within five years or so. Is this where I'm supposed to come? she said to the painter. A lot would depend on what your business was, he said. You aren't about to have a baby, are you? They told me I was supposed to pose for some picture, she said. My name is Leora Duncan. She waited. And you dunk people, he said. What? She said. Skip it, he said. That sure is a beautiful picture, she said. Looks just like heaven or something. Or something, said the painter. He took a list of names from his smock pocket. Duncan, 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 he said, scanning the list. Yes, here you are. You're entitled to be immortalized. See any faceless body here you'd like me to stick your head on? We've got a few choice ones left. She studied the mural bleakly. Gee, she said, they're all the same to me. I don't know anything about art. A body's a body, eh? He said. All righty. As a master of fine art, I recommend this body here. He indicated a faceless figure of a woman who was carrying dried stalks to a trash burner. Well, said Leora Duncan, that's more the disposal people, isn't it? I mean, I'm in service. I don't do any disposing. The painter clapped his hands in mock delight. You say you don't know anything about art, and then you prove in the next breath that you know more about it than I do. Of course the sheave carrier is wrong for a hostess. A snipper, a pruner, that's more your line. He pointed to a figure in purple who was sawing a dead branch from an apple tree. How about her? He said. You like her at all? Gosh, she said, and she blushed and became humble. That... That puts me right next to Dr. Hitz. That upsets you, he said. Good gravy, no, she said. It's it's just such an honor. Ah, you... you admire him, eh? He said. Who doesn't admire him, she said, worshipping the portrait of Hitz. It was the portrait of a tanned, white-haired, omnipotent Zeus. 240 years old. Who doesn't admire him? She said again. He was responsible for setting up the very first gas chamber in Chicago. Nothing would please me more, said the painter, than to put you next to him for all time, sawing off a limb. That strikes you as appropriate? That is kind of like what I do, she said. She was demure about what she did. 
What she did was make people comfortable while she killed them. And while Leora Duncan was posing for her portrait, into the waiting room bounded Dr. Hitz himself. He was seven feet tall, and he boomed with importance, accomplishments, and the joy of living. Well, Miss Duncan, Miss Duncan, he said, and he made a joke. What are you doing here? He said. This isn't where the people leave, this is where they come in. We're going to be in the same picture together, she said shyly. Good, said Dr. Hitz heartily. And say, isn't that some picture? I sure am honored to be in it with you, she said. Let me tell you, he said. I'm honored to be in it with you. Without women like you, this wonderful world we've got wouldn't be possible. He saluted her and moved toward the door that led to the delivery rooms. Guess what was just born, he said. I can't, she said. Triplets, he said. Triplets, she said. She was exclaiming over the legal implications of triplets. The law said that no newborn child could survive unless the parents of the child could find someone who would volunteer to die. Triplets, if they were all to live, called for three volunteers. Do the parents have three volunteers? said Leora Duncan. Last I heard, said Dr. Hitz, they had one, and were trying to scrape another two up. I don't think they made it, she said. Nobody made three appointments with us. Nothing but singles going through today. Unless somebody called in after I left. What's his name? Welling, said the waiting father, sitting up, red-eyed and frowsy. Edward K. Welling Jr. is the name of the happy father to be. He raised his right hand, looked at a spot on the wall, gave a hoarsely wretched chuckle. Present he said. Oh, Mr. Welling, said Dr. Hitz. I didn't see you. The invisible man, said Welling. They just phoned me that your triplets have been born, said Dr. Hitz. They're all fine, and so is the mother. I'm on my way to see them now. Hooray, said Welling emptily. You don't sound very happy, said Dr. Hitz. What man in my shoes wouldn't be happy, said Welling. He gestured with his hands to symbolize carefree simplicity. All I have to do is pick out which one of the triplets is gonna live, then deliver my maternal grandfather to the happy hooligan and come back here with a receipt. Dr. Hitz became rather severe with Welling, towered over him. You don't believe in population control, Mr. Welling, he said. I think it's perfectly keen, said Welling tautly. Would you like to go back to the good old days when the population of the earth was 20 billion, about to become 40 billion, then 80 billion, then 160 billion? Do you know what a druplet is, Mr. Welling? said Hitz. No, said Welling sulkily. A druplet, Mr. Welling, is one of the little knobs, one of the little pulpy grains of a blackberry, said Dr. Hitz. Without population control, human beings would now be packed on the surface of this old planet like druplets on a blackberry. Think of it! Welling continued to stare at the same spot on the wall. In the year 2000, said Dr. Hitz, before scientists stepped in and laid down the law, there wasn't even enough drinking water to go around, nothing to eat but seaweed, and still, people insisted on their right to reproduce like jackrabbits, and their right, if possible, to live forever. I want those kids, said Welling quietly. I want all three of them. Of course you do, said Dr. Hitz. That's only human. I don't want my grandfather to die either, said Welling. Nobody's really happy about taking a close relative to the cat box, said Dr. Hitz gently, sympathetically. I wish people wouldn't call it that, said Leora Duncan. What? said Dr. Hitz. I wish people wouldn't call it a cat box and things like that, she said. 
gives people the wrong impression. You're absolutely right, said Dr. Hitz. Forgive me, he corrected himself, gave the municipal gas chambers their official title, a title no one ever used in conversation. I should have said Ethical Suicide Studios, he said. That sounds so much better, said Leora Duncan. This child of yours, whichever one you decide to keep, Mr. Welling, said Dr. Hitz, he or she is going to live on a happy, roomy, clean, rich planet thanks to population control, in a garden like that mural there. He shook his head. Two centuries ago, when I was a young man, it was a hell that nobody thought could last another twenty years. Now centuries and peace and plenty stretch before us as far as the imagination cares to travel. He smiled luminously. The smile faded as he saw that Welling had just drawn a revolver. Welling shot Dr. Hitz dead. There's room for one, a great big one, he said. And then he shot Leora Duncan. It's only death, he said to her as she fell. There, room for two. And then he shot himself, making room for all three of his children. Nobody came running. Nobody, seemingly, heard the shots. The painter sat on top of his stepladder, looking down reflectively on the sorry scene. The painter pondered the mournful puzzle of life demanding to be born and, once born, demanding to be fruitful, to multiply and to live as long as possible, to do all that on a very small planet that would have to last forever. All the answers that the painter could think of were grim. Even grimmer, surely, than a cat box, a happy hooligan, an easy go. He thought of war, he thought of plague, he thought of starvation. He knew that he would never paint again. He let his paintbrush fall to the drop cots below. And then he decided he had had about enough of life in the happy garden of life, too. And he came slowly down from the ladder. He took Welling's pistol, really intending to shoot himself. But he didn't have the nerve. And then he saw the telephone booth in the corner of the room. He went to it, dialed the well-remembered number. Two... B. R. Not. To. B. Federal Bureau of Termination, said the very warm voice of a hostess. How soon could I get an appointment? He asked, speaking very carefully. We could probably fit you in late this afternoon, sir, she said. It might even be earlier if we get a cancellation. All right, said the painter. Fit me in, if you please. He gave her his name, spelling it out. Thank you, sir, said the hostess. Your city thanks you, your country thanks you, your planet thanks you. But the deepest thanks of all is from future generations. End of To Be or Not To Be by Kurt Vonnegut The Hunters by William Morrison. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Ralph J. Martin. The Hunters by William Morrison. To all that didn't know him, Kurt George was a mighty hunter and actor but this time he was up against others who could really act and whose business was the hunting of whole worlds. There were 30 or more of the little girls, their ages ranging apparently from 9 to 11, all of them chirping away like a flock of chicks as they followed the old mother hen past the line of cages. Now, now, girls, called Miss Burton cheerily, don't scatter. I can't keep my eye on you if you get too far away from me. You, Hilda, give me that water pistol. No, don't fill it up first at that fountain. And Francis, stop bouncing your ball. You'll lose it through the bars and a polar bear may get it and not want to give it back. Francis giggled. 
Oh, Miss Burton, do you think the polar bear would want to play catch? The two men who were looking on wore pleased smiles. Charming, said Monto, but somewhat unpredictable despite all of our experiences. Muy amigo? No attempts at Spanish, Monto, not here. It calls attention to us. And you are not sure of the grammar anyways. You may find yourself saying things you do not intend. Sorry, Pallet. It wasn't an attempt to show my skill, I assure you. It's that by now I have a tendency to confuse one language with another. I know, you were never a linguist. But about these interesting creatures, I suggest that they could stand investigation. It would be good to know how they think. Whatever you say, Monto, if you wish, we shall join the little ladies. But we must have our story prepared first. Pallet nodded, and the two men stepped under the shade of a tree whose long, drooping, leaf-covered branches formed a convenient screen. For a moment, the tree hid silence. Then there came from beneath the branches the chatter of girlish voices, and two little girls skipped merrily away. Miss Burton at first did not notice that now she had additional two children in her charge. Do you think you will be able to keep your English straight? asked one of the new little girls. The other one smiled with amusement at first and did not answer. Then she began to skip around her companion chant, I know a secret, I know a secret. There was no better way to make herself inconspicuous. For some time, Miss Burton did not notice her. The polar bears, the grizzlies, the penguins, the reptiles were all left behind. At times the children scattered, but Miss Burton knew how to get them together again, and not one was lost. Here, children, is the building where the kangaroos live. Who knows where kangaroos come from? Australia, clanged the shrill chorus. That's right, and what other animals come from Australia? I know, Miss Burton, cried Frances, a dark-haired nine-year-old with a pair of glittering eyes that stared like a pair of critics from a small heart-shaped face. I've been here before. Wallabies and wombats. Very good, Frances. Frances smirked at the approbation. I've been to the zoo a lot of times, she said to the girl next to her. My father takes me. I wish my father would take me too, replied the other little girl with an air of wistfulness. Why don't you ask him to, before the other little girl could answer, Frances paused, cocked her head slightly, and demanded, Who are you? You aren't in our class. I'm in Miss Hassel's class. Miss Hassel? Who is she? Is she in our school? I don't know, said the other little girl, uncertainly. I go to PS 77. Oh, Miss Burton, screamed Frances. Here's a girl who isn't in our class. She got lost from her own class. Really? Miss Burton seemed rather pleased at the idea that some other teacher had been so careless as to lose one of her charges. What's your name, child? I'm Carolyn. Carolyn what? Carolyn Monto. Please, Miss Burton, I had to go to the bathroom. And then when I came out, yes, yes, I know. A shrill cry came from another second of her class. Oh, Miss Burton, here's another one who's lost. The other little girl pushed forward. Now, who are you, Miss Burton asked. I'm Doris Pallet. I went with Carolyn to the bathroom. Miss Burton made a sound of annoyance. Imagine losing two children and not noticing it right away. The other teacher must be frantic by now and serve her right for being so careless. All right, you may stay with us until we find a policeman. She interrupted herself. Francis... What are you giggling at now? It's Carolyn. She's making faces just like you. Really, Carolyn, that isn't at all nice. Carolyn's face altered itself in a hurry so as to lose any resemblance to Miss Burton's. I'm sorry, Miss Burton. I really didn't mean to do anything wrong. Well, I'd like to know how you were brought up. If you don't know that it's wrong to mimic people to their faces, a big girl like you, too. How old are you, Carolyn? Carolyn shrank. She hoped imperceptibly by an inch. I am too... An outburst of shrill laughter. She's two years old. She's two years old. I was going to say I'm too twelve. Almost, anyways. 
11 years old, said Miss Burton, old enough to know better. I'm sorry, Miss Burton, and honest, Miss Burton, I didn't mean anything, but I was studying to be an actress, and I imitate people, like actors you see on television. Oh, Miss Burton, please don't make her go home with a policeman. If she's going to be an actress, I bet she'd love to see Kurt George. Well, after the way she's behaved, I don't know whether I should let her. I really don't. Please, Miss Burton, it was an accident. I won't do it again. All right, if you're good and cause no trouble, but we still have plenty of time before seeing Mr. George. It's only two now, and we're not supposed to go to the lecture hall until four. Miss Burton called Barbara Wilman. Do you think he'd give us his autograph? Now, children, I've warned you about that. You mustn't annoy him. Mr. George is a famous movie actor, and his time is valuable. It's very kind of him to offer to speak to us, especially when so many grown-up people are anxious to hear him. But we mustn't take advantage of his kindness. But he likes children, Miss Burton. My big sister read in a movie magazine where he said he's just crazy about them. I know, but he's not in good health, children. They say he got jungle fever in Africa, where he was shooting all those lions and rhinoceros and elephants for his new picture. That's why you mustn't bother him too much. But he looks so big and strong, Miss Burton. It wouldn't hurt him to sign an autograph. Oh, yes, it would, asserted one little girl. He shakes, and when he has an attack of fever, his hand shakes. Yes, Africa is a dangerous continent, and one never knows how the dangers will strike one, said Miss Burton complacently. So we must all remember how bravely Mr. George is fighting his misfortune and do our best not to tire him out. In the bright light that flooded the afternoon breakfast table, Kurt George's handsome, manly face wore an expression of distress. He groaned dismally and muttered, What a head I've got, what a head. How do you expect me to face that gang of kids without a drink to pick me up? You've had your drink, said Carol. She was slim, attractive, and efficient. At the moment, she was being more efficient than attractive, and she could sense his resentment. That's all you get. Now lay off and try to be reasonably sober for a change. But those kids still squeal and giggle. They're about the only audience in the world that won't spot you as a drunk. God knows where I could find anyone else who'd believe that your handshakes because of fever. I know that you're looking out for my best interest, Carol, but one more drink wouldn't hurt me. She said wearily but firmly. I don't argue with drunks, Kurt. I just go ahead and protect them from themselves. No drinks. Afterwards... I can't watch you the way a mother watches a child. The contemptuous reply sent his mind off on a new tack. You could if we were married. I've never believed in marrying weak characters to reform them. But if I prove to you that I could change, prove it first and I'll consider your proposal afterwards. You certainly are a cold-blooded creature, Carol, but I suppose that in your profession you have to be. Cold, suspicious, nasty, and reliable. It's inevitable when I must deal with such warm-hearted, trusting, and unreliable clients. He watched her move about the room, clearing away dishes from his meager breakfast. What are you humming, Carol? Was I humming? I thought I recognized it. All of me. Why not take all of me? That's it. Your subconscious gives you away. You really want to marry me. A mistake, she said coolly. My subconscious doesn't know what it's talking about. All I want of you is the usual 10%. Can't you forget for a moment that you're an agent and remember that you're a woman too? No, not unless you forget that you're a drunk and remember that you're a man. Not unless you make me forget that you drank your way through Africa because you weren't there with me with hardly enough energy energy to let them dress you in that hunter's outfit and photograph you as if you were shooting lions. You're so unforgiving, Carol. You don't have much use for me, do you? Consciously, that is. Frankly, Kurt, no. I don't have much use for useless people. I'm not entirely useless. I earn you that 10%. percent i gladly forego that to see you sober. 
but it's your contempt for me that drives me to drink. When I think of having to face those dear little kitties with nothing inside me, there should be happiness inside of you at the thought of your doing a good deed. Not a drop, George, not a drop. The two little girls drew apart from the others and began to whisper in each other's ears. The whispers were punctuated by giggles, which made the entire childish conversation seem quite normal. But Pallet was in no laughing mood. He said in his own language, You're getting careless, Monto. You had no business imitating her expression. I'm sorry, Pallet, but it was so suggestive. And I'm a very suggestible person. So am I, but I control myself. Still, if the temptation were great enough, I don't think you'd be able to resist either. The issues are important enough to make me resist. Still, I thought I saw your own face taking on a bit of her expression, too. You are an imagining thing, Monto. Another thing, that mistake in starting to say that you were 200 years old, they would have thought it a joke, and I think I got out of that rather neatly. You like to skate on thin ice, don't you, Monto? Just as you did when you changed your height. You had no business shrinking right out in public like that. I did it skillfully. Not a single person noticed. I noticed. Don't quibble. I don't intend to. Some of these children have very sharp eyes. You'd be surprised at what they see. Mato said tolerantly, You're getting jittery, Pallet. We've been away from home too long. I am not jittery in the least, but I believe in taking due care. What could possibly happen to us? Even if we were announced to the children and to the teacher and everyone in the zoo, for that matter, exactly who and what we were, they wouldn't believe us. And even if they did, they wouldn't be able to act rapidly enough to harm us. You can never tell about such things. Wise people simply don't take unnecessary chances. I'll grant that you're my superior in such wisdom. You needn't be sarcastic, Monto. I know I'm superior. I realize what a godsend this planet is. You don't. It has the right gravity, a suitable atmosphere, the proper chemical composition, everything, including a population that will be helpless before us. And you would take chances of losing all of this. Don't be silly, Pallet. What chances am I taking? The chance of being discovered. Here we stumble upon this place quite by accident. No one at home knows about it. No one so much as suspects that it exists. We must get back and report. And you do all sorts of silly things which may reveal what we are and lead these people to suspect their danger. This time, Monto's giggle was no longer mere camouflage, but expressed to a certain degree of how we felt. They cannot possibly suspect we have been all over the world. We have taken many forms and adapted ourselves to many customs, and no one has suspected. And even if danger were really threatened, it would be easy to escape. I could take the form of a school teacher herself, of a policeman, or anyone in authority. However, at present, there is not the slightest shadow of danger. So, Pallet, you better stop being fearful. Pallet said firmly, be careful, and I won't be fearful. That's all there is to it. I'll be careful. After all, I shouldn't want us to lose these children. They're so exactly the kind we need. Look how inquiring they are. How unafraid. How quick to adapt to any circumstances. Mrs. Burton's voice said, Good gracious, children. What language are you using? Greek? They had been speaking too loud. They had been overheard. Pallet and Monto stared at each other and giggled coyly. Then after a second to think, Pallet said, On the iste una bay. What? Francis shrilled triumphantly. It isn't Greek, Miss Burton. It's Latin. Pig Latin. She said, No, Miss Burton. Good heavens, what is pig Latin? It's a kind of way of talking where you talk kind of backwards. Like you don't say me, you say ime. You don't say yes, you say essay. 
at it, another little girl. You don't say you, you say ue. You don't say all right, all right. I get the idea. You don't say that'll do, said Miss Burton firmly. Now let's get along to the lion house. And please, children, do not make faces at the lions. How would you like to be in a cage and have people make faces at you? Always remember to be considerate to others. Even lions, Miss Burton? Even lions. But Mr. George shot lots of lions. Was he considerate of them, too? There is no time for silly questions, said Miss Burton with the same firmness. Come along. They all trooped after her, Pallet and Monto bringing up the rear. Monto giggled and whispered with amusement. That pig Latin business was quick thinking, Pallet but in fact quite unnecessary, the things you do to avoid being suspected. It never hurts to take precautions, and I think now it is time to leave. No, not yet. You are always anxious to learn details before reporting. Why not learn a few details now? Because they are not necessary. We already have a good understanding of human customs and psychology. But not the psychology of children. And they, if you remember, are the ones who will have to adapt. We shall be asked about them. It would be nice if we could report that they are fit for all-purpose service on a wide range of planets. Let us stay a while longer. All right, conceded Pallet grudgingly. So they stayed, and out of some twigs and leaves they shaped the necessary coins with which to buy peanuts and popcorn and ice cream and other delicacies favored by the young. Monto wanted to win easy popularity by treating a few of the other children. But Pallet put his girlish foot down. No use arousing suspicion, even as it was. Gee, your father gives you an awful lot of spending money, said Francis. Obviously, is he rich? We get as much as we want, replied Monto carelessly. Gosh, I wish I did. Miss Burton collected her brood. Come together, children. I have something to say to you. Soon it will be time to go in and hear Mr. George. Now, if Mr. George is so kind as to entertain us, don't you think it's proper for us to entertain him? We could put in our class play, yelled Barbara. Barbara's a fine one to talk, said Frances. She doesn't even remember her lines. No, children, we mustn't do anything we can't do well. That wouldn't make a good impression. And besides, there is no time for a play. Perhaps Barbara will sing? I can sing a thank you song, interrupted Frances. That would be nice. I can recite, added another little girl. Fine. How about you, Carolyn? You and your little friend Doris, can she act too? Carolyn giggled. Oh, yes, yeah, she can act very well. I can act like people. She can act like animals. The laughing girlish eyes evaded a dirty look from the little friend. She can act like any kind of animal. She's certainly a talented child, but she seems so shy. Oh no, said Carolyn. She likes to be coaxed. She shouldn't be like that. Perhaps, Carolyn, you and Doris can do something together. And perhaps, too, Mr. George will be pleased to see that your teacher also has talent. You, Miss Burton? Miss Burton coughed modestly. Yes, children, I never told you, but I was once ambitious to be an actress, too. I studied dramatics, and really, I was quite good at it. I was told that if I persevered, I might actually be famous. Just think, your teacher might actually have been a famous actress. However, in my day, there were many coarse people on the stage, and the life of the theater was not attractive. But perhaps we'd better not speak of that. At any rate, I know the principles of the dramatic art very well. God knows what I'll have to go through, said Kurt, and I don't see how I can make it sober. I don't see how they can take you drunk, replied Carol. Why go through with it at all? Why not call the whole thing quits? Because people are depending on you. You always want to call it quits whenever you run into something you don't like. You may as well call quits to your contract if that's the way you feel. And to your 10%, darling. You think I'd mind that? I work for my 10%, Kurt, sweetheart. 
I worked too damn hard for that 10%. You can mirror me and take it easy. Honest, Carol, if you treated me better, if you showed me I meant something to you, I'd give up drinking. She made a face. Don't talk nonsense. Take your outfit and let's get ready to go. Unless you want to change here and walk around dressed as a lion hunter. Why not? I've walked around dressed as worse, a drunk. Drunks don't attract attention. They're too ordinary. But a drunken lion hunter? That's something special. He went into the next room and began to change. Carol, he called. Do you like me? At times. Would you say you like me very much? When you're sober, rarely. Love me? Once on a blue moon. What would I have to do for you to want to marry me? Amount to something. I like that. Don't you think I amount to something now? Women swoon at the sight of my face on the screen and come to life again at the sound of my voice. The women who swoon at you will swoon at anybody. Besides, I don't consider that making nitwit swoon a useful occupation for a real man. How can I be useful, Carol? No one ever taught me how. Some people manage it without being taught. I suppose I could think how if I had a drink inside me. Then you'll have to do without thinking. He came into the room again, powerful, manly, determined looking. There was an expression in his eye which indicated courage without end, a courage that would enable him to brave the wrath of man, beast, or devil. How do I look? Your noble self, of course, a poor woman's edition of Rudolph Valentino. I feel terrified. I don't know how I'm going to face those kids. If they were boys, it wouldn't be so bad. But a bunch of little girls? They'll grow up to be your fans if you're alive five years from now. Meanwhile, into each life some rain must fall. You talk of water when you know how I feel. Sorry, come on, let's go. The lecture hall resounded with giggles, and beneath the giggles was a steady undercurrent of whispers, of girlish confidences exchange, of girlish hopes that would now be fulfilled. Miss Burton's class was not the only one which had come to hear the famous actor Hunter describe his brave exploit. There were at least five others like it, and by some mistake, a class of boys who also whispered to each other and a manly superior and pretended to find amusement in the presence of so many of the fairer sex. In this atmosphere of giggles and whispers, Manto and Pallet could exchange confidences without being noticed. Pallet said savagely, Why did you tell her I could act too? Why? Because it's the truth. You're a very good animal performer. You make a wonderful dragon, for instance. Go on, Pallet. Show her what a fine dragon you can... Stop it, you fool, before you cause trouble. Very well, Pallet. Did I tempt you? Did you tempt me? You and your sense of humor. You and your lack of it. But let's not argue now, Pallet. Here, I think, comes the lion hunter. Let's scream and be properly excited as everyone else is. My God, he thought. How can they keep their voices so high for so long? My eardrums hurt already. How do they stand a lifetime of it? Even an hour. Go ahead, whispered Carol. You've seen the script. Go into your act. Tell them what a hero you are. You have the odds in your favor to start with. My lovely looks, he said with some bitterness. Lovely is the word for you, but forget that. If you're good, you'll get a drink afterwards. Will it be one of those occasions when you love me? If the moon turns blue... He strode to the front of the platform, an elephant gun swinging easily at his side, an easy grin radiating from his confident, rugged face. The cheers rose to a shrill fortissimo, but the grin did not vanish. What a great actor he really was, he told himself, to be able to pretend he liked this. An assistant curator of some collection in the zoo, a flustered old woman was introducing him. There were a few laudatory references to his great talent as an actor, and he managed to look properly modest as he listened. The remarks about his knowledge of wild and ferocious beasts were a little harder to take, but he took them. 
Then the old woman stepped back, and he was facing his fate alone. Children, he began. A pause, a bashful grin. Perhaps I should rather say, my friends. I'm not one to think of you as children. Some people think of me as a child myself because I like to hunt and have adventures. They think that such things are childish, but if they are, I'm glad to be a child. I'm glad to be one of you. Yes, I think I will call you my friends. Perhaps you regard me, my friends, as a very lucky person. But when I recall some of the narrow escapes I had, I don't agree with you. I remember once when we were on the trail of a rogue elephant. He told the story of a rogue elephant, modestly granting a co-hero's role to his guide. Then another story illustrating the strange ways of lions. The elephant gun figured in still another tale, this time of a vicious rhinoceros. His audience was quiet now, breathless with interest, and he welcomed the respite from shrillness he had won for his ears. And now, my friends, it is time to say farewell. He actually looks sad and regretful, but it is my hope that I shall be able to see you again. Scream of exultation, shrill as ever, small hands beating enthusiastically to indicate joy. Thank God that's over with, he thought. Now for those drinks. And he didn't mean drink, singular. Talk of being useful. He's certainly been useful now. He'd made those kids happy. What more can any reasonable person want? But it wasn't over with. Another old lady had stepped up on the platform. Mr. George, she said in a strangely affected voice, like that of the first dramatic teacher he had ever had, the one who had almost ruined his acting career. Mr. George, I can't tell you how happy you have made us all, young and old. Hasn't Mr. George made us happy, children? Yes, Miss Burton, came the shrill scream. And we feel it would be no more than fair to repay you in some small measure for the pleasure you have given us. First, a thank you song by Francis Heller. He hadn't expected this, and he repressed a groan. Mercifully, the first song was short. He grinned the thanks he didn't feel. To think that he could take this while sober as a judge. What strength of character. What willpower. Next, Miss Burton introduced another kid who recited. Then Miss Burton stood upright and recited herself. That was the worst of all. He winced once, then bore up. You can get used even to torture, he told himself. An adult making a fool of herself is always more painful than a kid. And that affected an electrocutionist voice that gave him horrors. But he thanked her, too. His good deed for the day. Baby Carol would have him now, he thought. A voice shrilled, Miss Burton! Yes, dear. Aren't you going to call on Carolyn to act? Oh, yes, I was forgetting. Come up here, Carolyn. Come up here, Doris. Carolyn and Doris, Mr. George, are studying how to act. They act peoples and animals. Who knows? Someday they, too, may be in the movies, just like you are, Mr. George. Wouldn't that be nice, children? What the devil do you do in a case like that? You grin, of course. But what do you say without handing over your soul to the devil? Agree how nice it would be to have those sly little brats with faces magnified on every screen all over the country? Like hell you do. Now what are we going to act, children? Please, Miss Burton, said Doris. I don't know how to act. I can't even imitate a puppy. I really can't, Miss Burton. Come, come. You mustn't be shy. Your friend says you act very nicely indeed. You can't want to go on stage and still be shy. Now, do you know any movie scenes? Shirley Temple used to be a good little actress, I remember. Can you do any scenes that she does? The silence was getting embarrassing. And Carol said he didn't amount to anything. He never did anything useful. Why, if thanks to his being here this afternoon, those kids lost the ambition to go on stage, the whole human race would have cause to be grateful to him to him and to Miss Burton. She'd kill ambition in anybody. 
Miss Burton had an idea. I know what to do, children. If you can act like animals, Mr. George has shown you what the hunter does. You show him what the lions do. Yes, Carolyn and Doris, you're going to be lions. You are waiting in your lairs, ready to pounce on the unweary hunter. Crouch now behind that chair. Closer and closer he comes. You act it out, Mr. George, please. That's the way. Ever closer. Now your muscles tighten for the spring, and you open your great wide red mouth in a great big roar, a deep and tremendous roar as of thunder crashed through the auditorium. A roar, then from the audience, an outburst of terrified screaming such as he had never heard. The bristles rose at the back of his neck. His heart froze. Facing him across the platform were two lions, tense as if to leap. Where they had come from, he didn't know, but there they were, eyes glaring, manes ruffled, more terrifying than any he had seen in Africa. There they were, with the threat of death and destruction in their fierce eyes. And here he was, terror and helpless on his handsome, manly, and bloodless face, heart unfrozen now and pounding fiercely, knees melting hands, hands clutching an elephant gun. The thought was like a director's command. With calm efficiency, with all the precision of an actor playing a scene rehearsed a thousand times, the gun leaped to his shoulder, and now its own roar thundered out a challenge to the roaring of the wild beasts, shouted out them in its own accent of barking thunder. The shrill screaming continued long after the echoes of the gun's speech had died away. Across the platform from him were two great bodies, the bodies of lions, and yet curiously unlike the beasts in some ways now that they were dead and dissolving as if corroded by some invisible acid. Carolyn's hand was on his arm. Carol's thin and breathless voice shook as she said, A drink? All the drinks you want. One will do. And you. And me. I guess you're kind of... kind of useful after all. End of The Hunted by William Morrison Recorded by Ralph J. Martin. Death Star by Tom Pace. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Death Star by Tom Pace. Starrett Blade crouched in the rocks by the tiny Centaurian lake. It was only about two or three hundred feet across, but probably thousands of feet deep. This lake, and hundreds of others like it, were the only things to break the monotony of the flat, rocky surface of Alpha Centauri III, called the most barren planet in space. Ten minutes ago, Star Blade's ship had spun into the stagnant waters before him. An emergency release had flung the airlock doors open, and the air pressure had flung Star out, and now he was waiting for Devil Garrett to come down to the water's edge to search for him. For eight years, Devil Garrett had been the top space pirate in the void. For a year, Star himself had personally been hunting him, and on a tour over Alpha 3, a Barden energy beam had stabbed up at Blade's ship, and Star Blade had crashed into the lake. That Barden beam had Star worried and puzzled. It took a million volts of power for its split-second flash of the beam. Garrett didn't have an atomics plant on Alpha-3. If he had, escaping rays would point it out, no matter how well it was camouflaged. There was no water power, for there was no running water. There were only the lakes, and tidal power was out, for Alpha-3 had no moon. However, that could wait. Star slid the electron knife from his waterproof sheath, gripped it firmly. He could hear quick footsteps as a man came down the trail that led directly past his hiding place. It wasn't Garrett, which was disappointing, but it was one of his men, and he was heavily armed. That didn't worry Star. His fighting had earned Star at Blade the nickname of Death Star. The man walked to the water's edge and peered out over the pool. He saw the bubbles that were coming up from the sinking ship, and he nodded, grunted in satisfaction, and started to turn back. 
Star landed on him, knocking him sprawling on the rock. The pirate jerked up an arm holding the jet gun. The stabbing lance of blue fire cracked from the electron knife, dug into the man's heart. Star tossed the dead pirate's cloak over his shoulders and thrust both electron blade and jet gun into his belt. He straightened and saw the leveled gun from the corner of his eye. He got the jet in his right hand, the knife in his left, and went into a dive that flipped him behind a rock. The three actions took only a split second, and the blast from the jet gun flaked rock from where he had been standing. While a jet gun is the most deadly weapon known, you have to press a loading stud to slide another blast capsule into place. Death Star knew this very well, so he knew he was safe in coming up from behind the spur of stone to fire his own gun. If his reflexes hadn't been as quick as they were, he would have blasted the girl. He stopped and stood for a second, staring at the girl. She was something to invite stares, too. In the moment that lasted between her next move, he had time to register that she was about five feet tall, black-haired, the kind of black hair that looks like silken spun darkness, dark-eyed, and possessing both a face and a form that would make anyone stop and gulp. Then the moment of half awed survey was over, and she leveled the jet on him and said in a trembling voice, Drop those weapons or I'll blast you, pirate. Death Star said, That jet gun is empty. I can see the register on the magazine. And I'm not a pirate. I'm Star at Blade. The useless jet gun slid out of the girl's hand, and she gave a half gasp. Star at Blade? I... I don't believe... She broke off abruptly. So you're Death Star? A fine story for a hired killer, a pirate. Star reddened. Look, he snapped. I don't know who's been talking to you, but... He whirled, and his hand whipped the jet gun from his belt. As he did so, the girl jerked up the jet gun she had dropped and flung it with all her strength. The blow landed on his arm and side, and paralyzed him long enough for the man who had leaped out behind him to land a stunning blow against his head. As Star went down, he dizzily cursed himself for becoming interested in the argument with the girl, so that he did not heed his reflexes in time. And dimly, he wondered why it had seemed so important to convince the lovely dark-haired girl. Then, a bit of the cosmos seemed to fall on Star's head, and he was hurled into blackness. An eternity seemed to pass. Deep in the blackness, a light was born. It leaped toward him, a faraway comet rocketing along, coming from some far, unknown corner of the galaxy. It became a flaming sun in a gray-green space, and strangely, there seemed to be several odd planets circling about the sun. Some of them were vast pieces of queer electronic machinery. Some were vague, villainous-looking men. One was the dark-eyed girl, and there was lovely contempt in her dark star pools of eyes. Then, into the midst of this queer universe, there swam a new planet. It was the face of a man, and the man was Devil Garrett. That brought Star up out of his daze, onto his feet as though he had been doused with cold water. He stood there, not staring, just looking at Garrett. The most famous killer in the void was Big. He was six feet three and twice as strong as he looked. He wore a huge high-velocity jet gun and a set of electron knives, all of the finest workmanship. He was sitting on a laboratory chair of steel, and the chair bent slightly under his great weight. He smiled at Star, and there was a touch of hell in the smile. He said, Ah, Mr. Garrett. Star's jaw dropped. Garrett, what are you... He broke off. A glance at the girl told him what the purpose was. Look, Mr. Devil Garrett, said the pirate, still smiling softly. Miss Hinton is aware of your identity. There's no need to attempt to fool us. I've known it was you ever since I flashed that beam at your ship. And you needn't flatter yourself that the devil's luck is going to hold out as far as you are concerned. For in a very short while, I'm going to have you executed. Before a stellar vision screen connected with Section Void Headquarters, I wish the authorities to see Devil Garrett die so that I might collect the reward that's offered on you. Star stood quiet and looked straight into Garrett's eyes. After a minute of silence, Garrett's lips twisted into a smile, and he said mockingly, Well, pirate, what are you thinking of? Star said in a low, cold voice, 
I'm thinking of putting an electron fire blade into your face, Devil Garrett. Garrett laughed. Huge, rather evil, bluff laughter. The mirth of a person who is both powerful and dangerous. And then the girl leaped forward, shaking with rage. You beast, murderer, to accuse this man. You fool, you might have been able to complete any scheme of escape you had if you hadn't called yourself Starrett Blade. Mr. Blade, she gestured toward Garrett, who made a mocking, sardonic bow, has given me ample proof that he is who he says, and this long before you came. He's shown me papers giving a description and showing a tri-dimension picture of you. Fire leaped in Starr's eyes. Listen, he snapped furiously as he started to step forward. Then Garrett made a signal with his hand, and someone drove a fist against the base of Starr's skull. When Starr came to, he was in a cell of sorts. A man standing by the door told him that he was to be executed, after Mr. Blade and the lady have eaten. Starrett swore at him, and the man went out with a mocking, Goodbye, Mr. Garrett. Starr got up. His head spun, and he almost fell at first, but the daze left in his head from the two blows quickly cleared away. He felt for various weapons which he had hidden about him, and found them gone. Garrett's men had searched carefully. Starr sat down, his head spinning more now from mystery than from physical pain. He had to keep himself in a whole skin, of course. That was most important right now. But other things were bothering him, tugging at his mind like waves slapping around a swamped ship, each trying to shove it in a different direction. There was the girl. Starr wondered why she always leaped into his mind first. And there was the way Garrett was trying to leave the impression that he was Blade, so that he could kill Blade as Garrett. Obviously, the reason for that was the girl. Miss Hinton, Garrett had called her. She had been shown faked papers by Garrett, papers proving that the two were, were whatever Garrett had twisted the story into. Starr clutched at his head. He was in a mess. He was going to be killed, and he was going to die without knowing the score and he didn't like that. Nor did he like dying as Star Blade shouldn't die, executed as a wolf's head pirate. The girl would be watching, and he felt as if that would make it far worse. His head came up, and he smiled flintily. He still had an ace card. One hand felt for it, and he shook his head slowly. It was a gamble, but all the others had been found. Blade looked up quickly as the door opened. Two men came into the cell carrying jet guns. They motioned Blade to his feet. Come on, Blade, one began, when the other hit him across the mouth. You fool, he hissed. You better not call him that. Suppose that girl was to hear it. Until the boss gets what he wants on Earth, that girl has to think that he's Blade. We're killing this guy as Devil Garrett. And a loudmouth fool like you, look out! Blade had landed on the bickering men and was grappling with the one who had called him by name. As the other leaped forward, swinging a clubbing blow with a jet gun, Starr tripped one man into the corner and ducked under the gun. He hit the man in the stomach, drove a shoulder up under his arms, and smashed the man's face in with a series of sharp blows. The man went reeling backward across the room, and Starr's hand leaped towards that ace card which he still held. Devil Garrett stepped in the door and made a mock out of a courteous bow. As he did so, Starr snarled in rage, but stood very still, for the electron knife in Garrett's hand did not waver. Garrett gestured silently toward the door, and Starr, equally silent, walked over and out at the point of the weapon. Star Blade stood before a transmitter and thought about death. He was very close to it. Garrett stood five yards away, a gun in his hand, and the muzzle trained on Blade's chest. The gun was the universally used weapon of execution, an old projectile-firing weapon. Starr did not doubt that Devil Garrett was an excellent shot with it. The girl, very round-eyed and nervous, sat by Garrett. He had explained to her that Garrett was the type of pirate that it is law to kill or have executed by anyone, which was very true. A man stepped away from the transmitter and nodded to Garrett. Starr felt a surge of hope as he saw that it was a two-way transmitter. If the image of an interstellar command headquarters was tuned in, Garrett would undoubtedly do it, if only to show the police that he had killed Starrett Blade, 
Then Garrett could not kill him and cut the beam in time to prevent one of the police from giving a cry that would echo over the subspace beam arriving almost instantly in this room and let the girl know that she had been tricked. And Garrett would not want that. Not that it would matter to Star at Blade. Then Starr saw what kind of a transmitter it was, and he groaned. It was not a Hennison subspace beamer. It was an old-style transmitter, which had different wave speeds because of the different space bridger units in it. The visual image would arrive many seconds before the sound did. Thus, the girl would not hear Garrett revealed, but would see only Blade's death. And then, whatever Garrett had planned, Blade wished heartily that he could have the chance to interfere. The beam was coming in. Star saw the mists swimming on the screen change, solidify into a figure. The figure of District Commander Waddell seated at a desk. He saw Waddell's eyebrows rise, saw his lips move. Then Garrett stepped over a pace, and Waddell saw him, saw the gun in his hand. The police officer yelled, silently, and came to his feet, an expression of shocked surprise on his face. Surprise, Blade thought desperately, that the girl might interpret as shock at seeing Devil Garrett, which was right in a way. Then, as Commander Waddell leapt to his feet, as Devil Garrett's finger tightened on the trigger, as the girl sucked in her breath involuntarily, Star Blade scooped up a bit of metal, a fork, and flung it at the vision transmitter. Not at the screen, but at the equipment behind the dial board at a certain small unit which was almost covered by wires and braces for the large tubes, and the fork struck it, bit deep, and caused result. Result in the form of a burned-out screen. If television equipment can curse, that set cursed them. Its spitting of sparks and blue electric flame mingled with a strange, high-pitched whine. It was the diversion that caused Garrett to miss Star, which gave him time to pull three or four of Garrett's men onto the floor with him. One of the men drove the butt of a jet gun into the side of Star's head, and for the third time, he went very limp. The last thing he saw was the girl. Somehow, the expression on her face was different from what it had been. He was searching for the difference when the blow struck him. Somewhere in the space that lies between consciousness and unconsciousness, he reflected bitterly that if he kept staring at the girl when he should be fighting, he might not recover some day. This was the third time that he had been knocked out that way. It was not getting monotonous. He still felt it a novelty. Star awoke in the same prison cell, facing the wall away from the door. He wondered if he were still alive, tried to move his head, and decided that he wasn't. He didn't even get up or look around when he dimly heard the door being opened. But when he heard the girl's voice, he came up and around very swiftly, despite his head. It was the girl, all right. Even through the tumbled mists of his brain, he could see that she was not a dream, and as he reeled and fell against the wall, she was beside him in a flash, her arm supporting him. At first, he tried to push himself erect, his head whirling with sick dizziness and bewilderment. Through a twisting haze, he peered up at the girl's face. It reflected a look that amazingly was one of, with no other phrase to do, compassion. Star half sighed and laid his head on the girl's breast and closed his eyes. In a minute or two, she said tensely, Are you all right? Star looked up at her. I guess so. Here, give me a hand while I get my balance. She held him as he tried a step or two, and then he straightened. I guess I'll be all right now, he smiled. My head feels like, Say, how come you're doing this? What made you change your mind? And who are you? She said quickly, breathlessly, I know your star blade now. That transmission set, I can read lips. I knew what that officer was saying. It was just as if I had heard him say that, that you were star at blade and that man out there is Devil Garrett. She made a choking sound. And I've been here alone for a month, for a month. A month, huh? Please, you... Star took a breath and started over. You, who are you? What are you doing here? She said, I'm Ann Hinton. My father is old John Hinton. Have you heard of him? Of course, said Star. He manufactures most of the equipment Blade Cosmian uses. Weapons, Hinnison subspacers, Star Traveler craft. The ship I was in when Garrett brought me down was a Hinton craft. I should have recognized the name. But go on, what? Garrett communicated with Dad secretly. 
he posed to stare at Blade as you and told Dad that he was developing certain new power processes. And he is. He is a new, or maybe it isn't so new, way of electrolyzing water to liberate hydrogen and oxygen. I think I understand, said Starr quickly. When the oxygen and hydrogen are allowed to combine and produce an explosion, which drive a turbine generator, then that could be hitched up to a cyclotron, and even the most barren of Alpha's lake rock planets could be... No, she shook her head puzzledly. It's just electric power. He says that atomics would release stray rays that would attract pirates. I know, Starr nodded abstractedly. I was thinking of another application of it. Hmm. But say, what was Garrett after? I know that he wouldn't do this just to get a secret process sold. He must have another plan behind it. Got any idea? Anne shook her head slowly. I don't know. I can't see... Perhaps I could help you, Devil Garrett asked smoothly from the door. Star whirled, thrust Anne behind him, but there was no way out. Garrett stood in the door, and there were men behind him. The jet in his hand could kill both of the two at one shot, and they had no weapons to resist with. Devil Garrett stepped them out of the room and down the corridor, through a large door Star had noticed at the end of the passage, and into a huge room. It must have been a thousand feet long, and half that wide. It was at least a hundred yards deep, and it was almost filled with gigantic machines. Between the machinery, the spaces were almost filled with steel ladders and catwalks. Crews of men swarmed over them. It was the largest mess of equipment Starrett had ever seen. His eyes began to pick out details. Those huge vat-like things down at the far end, with the large cables running into them and the mighty pumps connected to them. They were probably the electrolysis chambers. And those great pipes, they must carry the hydrogen and oxygen from the electro chambers to the large replicas of engines, which could be nothing else but the explosion chambers, where the gases were allowed to reunite and explode. And there, by the giant engines, those must be the turbines, which in turn connected with the vast-sized generators just under the platforms on which they stood. Starblade whistled softly through his teeth. A huge enterprise. It could be, but for a moment he had forgotten Devil Garrett. The girl standing by his side, Star turned toward Garrett. Garrett smiled his mocking grin. You grasp the principle, of course, but let me show you. You see those pipes that run from the turbines after the wheels? Yes, they carry the gases off. Where do they lead? Into giant subterranean caverns beneath the surface, Garrett said. Now, look over there, on the platforms across from us. Can you recognize a Barden energy beamer, Blade? Run by the power from my little plant here, which is run by water from a thousand lakes. Just imagine, if you can, hundreds of those plants all over Alpha 3, and each one with dozens of high-powered Barden beams to protect it and Hinton ray screens to protect us from radio-controlled rocket shells from space, or Barden rays, or any other weapon of offense, or to warn if anyone lands on this planet. Garrett leaned forward, his eyes aglow. Blade, I'll take over the few governing posts on this little planet, and I'll rule an entire world, a whole planet, to myself. It'll be the first time in history, and it won't be the last. With the Hinton secret patents, the plans of all John Hinton's inventions and processes. Star twisted and got his ace card out of his hiding place. It was a jet weapon, little more than a jet blast capsule for a jet gun. The sides were thicker and stronger, and there was a device fixed on it so that it could be fired. Altogether, it was somewhat smaller than an old-style fountain pen. He twisted up from the floor and moved faster than he had moved ever before. Star was famous for his speed and the quickness and alertness of his reflexes. He earned his fame a score of times over in that one instant. And Devil Garrett died. There was perhaps an eighth of a second between the staff of blue-white fire from the tiny jet in Star's hand and the huge broadsword of fire from Garrett's gun. But in the split second, Star's fire knifed into Garrett's vitals, and Garrett gave a convulsive jerk and fired even as his muscles started the jerking movement, and the flame went over Star's head, singeing his scalp. Of the four men with Garrett, one let go of the struggling Anne and swore as he snatched at an electron knife in his belt. 
Anne's hand had already whipped the knife out, and without bothering to press the electron stud, she buried the knife in his back. Two of the remaining men whirled and went for the door as though a devil was after them. The other tried to get a jet gun out. It was his final mistake. A blue lance from Anne's knife whipped close enough to him to make him dodge, and then Starr got his hand on Garrett's jet. The other two men had, in their flight, taken a door which led not into the large corridor, but into a small room at one side, a room filled with instruments and recording devices for the machinery in the room below. Starr leaped to the side of the door and called, Are you going to come out, or am I coming in to get you? There was a short silence, in which Anne heard one say hoarsely, He can't get us. We could get him if he came in the door. Oh, yeah, was the answer. Do you know who that guy is? He's the one they call Death Star. I'm not facing Star at Blade in a gunfight. You can do what you like, but I'm leaving. Then he lifted his voice. Hey, Blade, I'm coming out. Don't shoot. Okay, threw back Star, and the man appeared in the doorway, empty hands held high. After a second, the other joined him. Anne turned to Star. Now I know why they call you Death Star, Blade, she said, and gestured toward the men who had surrendered, and the two whom Starrett had shot down. He mused there for a minute. Then Anne broke the silence with, Star, what are we going to do now? Garrett's men will be up here in a little while. We can't get to a subspace beam. What are we going to do when they come up to investigate? Star at Blade laughed. Do? Well, we could turn them over to Commander Waddell. What? Grinning broadly, Star pointed with a flourish at the door. Anne spun about and found Commander Waddell grinning in the door from the corridor. Very simple, said Star across the lounge to Anne. When I smashed the vision set with that dinner fork, I broke a small unit which is included in all sets. You know, a direction finder doesn't work except in the liner beam principle in space because of the diffusing effect of unrestricted cosmic rays. Yes, I know that, said Anne, but how... Starrett grinned again. A type of beam has been found which is impossible for cosmics to disturb, but you can't send messages on it, so it's made in a little unit on every set. If that unit is broken, the set automatically releases a signal beam. This is a distress signal, and the location of the set that sent out the signal is recorded at the section headquarters. When Commander Waddell saw me throw something at the set and it went dead, he looked at the automatic record and found that a signal had been sent in from a location on Alpha Sen's third planet. Then he had a high-velocity cruiser brought out and dropped in, in time to pick up some pieces. He stopped and idly toyed with a sheaf of papers, then held them up. See these papers? Uh-huh. What are they, Star? They are the main plans of Devil Garrett's power plant, and they were the one good thing he's ever done. These plans are going to bring the barren, rocky Centauri planets to life. He got up and paced to the window and stood there, looking out and up through the plastic port. The planets of Centauri, he murmured softly, seven circling Alpha alone. And all seven are barren, rocky, level, except for the thousands of lakes. Lakes that are going to be the life of Centauri. He turned back to the window. And all because a pirate named Devil Garrett built a vast power plant to use to garner more power. You know, Anne, as a mockery and a warning, I think I'll propose that this planet be officially named Garrett. She looked up at him, and there was laughter bright in her eyes and tugging at her mouth. Yes, there ought to be a reason, she murmured. Star wavered. She was so darn close. After a minute, she turned her head and looked up at him. Star, how soon will there be those gardens and woods you described? I mean, how long before Garrett can be turned into that kind of world you described? Why, under pressure, we can do it in six months. Why? Not half quick enough, she murmured happily. But it'll have to do, Star. Laughing, she turned her face up to his. Have you ever thought that Planet Garrett would be wonderful for a honeymoon? End of Death Star by Tom Pace Recording by Colleen McMahon